Section 1 of The Poems of Jonathan Swift, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Poems of Jonathan Swift, Volume 2 by Jonathan Swift. Section 1. Cadenus and Vanessa, 1713. The shepherds and the nymphs were seen pleading before the Cyprian queen. The counsel for the fair began, accusing the false creature, man. The brief with weighty crimes was charged, on which the pleader much enlarged. That Cupid now has lost his art, or blunts the point of every dart. His altar now no longer smokes, his mother's aid no youth invokes. This tempts free thinkers to refine, and bring in doubt their powers divine. Now love is dwindled to intrigue, and marriage grown a money league. Which crimes aforesaid, with her leave, were, as he humbly did conceive, against our sovereign lady's peace, against the statute in that case, against her dignity and crown, then prayed an answer and sat down. The nymphs with scorn beheld their foes when the defendant's counsel rose, and what no lawyer ever lacked, with impudence owned all the fact. But what the gentlest heart would vex laid all the fault on t'other sex. That modern love is no such thing as what those ancient poets sing, a fire celestial chaste refined, conceived and kindled in the mind, which, having found an equal flame, unites and both become the same. In different breasts together burn, together both to ashes turn. But women now feel no such fire, and only know the gross desire. Their passions move in lower spheres, where ear caprice or folly steers, a dog, a parrot, or an ape, or some worse brute in human shape. Engross the fancies of the fair, the few soft moments they can spare, from visits to receive and pay, from scandal politics and play, from fans and flounces and brocades, from equipage and park parades, from all the thousand female toys, from every trifle that employs, the out or inside of their heads, between their toilets and their beds. In a dull stream, which, moving slow, you hardly see the current flow, if a small breeze obstruct the course, it whirls about for want of force, and in its narrow circle gathers nothing but chaff and straws and feathers. The current of a female mind stops thus and turns with every wind, thus whirling round together draws fools fops and rakes for chaff and straws. Hence we conclude no women's hearts are won by virtue, wit, and parts, nor are the men of sense to blame for breasts incapable of flame. The faults must on the nymphs be placed, grown so corrupted in their taste. The pleader, having spoke his best, had witness ready to attest, who fairly could on oath depose, when questions on the fact arose, that every article was true, nor further those deponents knew, therefore he humbly would insist the bill might be with costs dismissed. The cause appeared of so much weight that Venus, from her judgment sate, desired them not to talk so loud, else she must interpose a cloud. For if the heavenly folks should know these pleadings in the courts below, that mortals here disdain to love, she ne'er could show her face above. For gods their betters are too wise to value that which men despise. And then, said she, my son and I must stroll in air twixt land and sky, or else shut out from heaven and earth, fly to the sea, my place of birth. There live with daggled mermaids pent, and keep on fish perpetual lent. But since the case appeared so nice, she thought it best to take advice. The muses, by the king's permission, though foes to love, attend the session, and on the right hand took their places, in order on the left the graces, to whom she might her doubts propose on all emergencies that rose. The muses oft were seen to frown, the graces half ashamed looked down, and twas observed there were but few of either sex among the crew whom she or her assessors knew. The goddess soon began to see things were not ripe for a decree, 
And said she must consult her books, The lovers fled as Bracton's coax. First to a dapper clerk she beckoned, To turn to Ovid book the second. She then referred them to a place, In Virgil, vide Dido's case. As for Tibullus's reports, They never passed for law in courts. For Cowley's briefs and pleas of Waller, Still their authority was smaller. There was on both sides much to say, She'd hear the cause another day. And so she did, and then a third, She heard it, there she kept her word. But with rejoinders or replies, Long bills and answers stuffed with lies, Demure in parlance and disoin, The parties near could issue join. For sixteen years the cause was spun, And then stood where it first begun. Now, gentle Cleo, sing or say What Venus meant by this delay. The goddess, much perplexed in mind To see her empire thus declined, When first this grand debate arose, Above her wisdom to compose, Conceived a project in her head To work her ends, which, if it sped, Would show the merits of the cause Far better than consulting laws. In a glad hour Lucina's aid Produced on earth a wondrous maid, On whom the queen of love was bent To try a new experiment. She threw her law books on the shelf And thus debated with herself. Since men allege they ne'er can find Those beauties in a female mind, Which raise a flame that will endure For ever uncorrupt and pure, If tis with reason they complain, This infant shall restore my reign. I'll search where every virtue dwells, From courts inclusive down to cells. What preachers talk or sages write, These will I gather and unite, And represent them to mankind, Collected in that infant's mind. This said, she plucks in heaven's high bowers A sprig of amaranthine flowers. In nectar thrice infuses bays, Three times refined in titan's rays. Then calls the graces to her aid, And sprinkles thrice the newborn maid. From whence the tender skin assumes A sweetness above all perfumes, From whence a cleanliness remains, Incapable of outward stains, From whence that decency of mind, So lovely in the female kind, Where not one careless thought intrudes, Less modest than the speech of prudes, where never blush was called in aid that spurious virtue in a maid, a virtue but at second hand, they blush because they understand. The graces next would act their part, and show but little of their art. Their work was half already done, the child with native beauty shone. The outward form no help required, each breathing on her thrice inspired that gentle, soft, engaging air, which in old times adorned the fair, and said, Vanessa, be the name by which thou shalt be known to fame. Vanessa, by the gods enrolled, her name on earth shall not be told. But still the work was not complete when Venus thought on a deceit. Drawn by her doves, away she flies and finds out Pallas in the skies. Dear Pallas, I have been this morn to see a lovely infant born, a boy in yonder isle below, so like my own without his bow. My beauty could your heart be won, you'd swear it is Apollo's son. But it shall ne'er be said a child so hopeful has by me been spoiled. I have enough besides to spare, and give him wholly to your care. Wisdom's above suspecting wiles, the queen of learning gravely smiles. Down from Olympus comes with joy, mistakes Vanessa for a boy. Then sows within her tender mind, seeds long unknown to womankind. For manly bosoms chiefly fit the seeds of knowledge, judgment, wit. Her soul was suddenly endued with justice, truth, and fortitude with honour which no breath can stain, which malice must attack in vain, with open heart and bounteous hand. But Pallas here was at a stand. She knew in our degenerate days, bare virtue could not live on praise. That meat must be with money bought. She therefore, upon second thought, 
Infused yet, as it were by stealth, Some small regard for state and wealth; Of which, as she grew up, there stay'd A tincture in the prudent maid: She managed her estate with care, Yet liked three footmen to her chair; But, lest he should neglect his studies, Like a young heir, the thrifty goddess, For fear young master should be spoil'd, Would use him like a younger child; And, after long computing found, 'Twould come to just five thousand pound. The queen of love was pleased and proud To see Vanessa thus endow'd; She doubted not but such a dame Through every breast would dart a flame, That every rich and lordly swain With pride would drag about her chain; That scholars would forsake their books To study bright Vanessa's looks; As she advanced, that womankind Would by her model form their mind, And all their conduct would be tried By her as an unerring guide. Offending daughters oft would hear Vanessa's praise rung in their ear. Miss Betty, when she does a fault, Let's fall her knife, or spills the salt, Will thus be by her mother chid, "'Tis what Vanessa never did." Thus by the nymphs and swains adored, My power shall be again restored, And happy lovers bless my reign, So Venus hoped, but hoped in vain. For when in time the martial maid Found out the trick that Venus played, She shakes her helm, she knits her brows, And fired with indignation vows, Tomorrow, ere the setting sun, She'd all undo that she had done. But in the poets we may find A wholesome law, time out of mind, Had been confirmed by fate's decree, That gods of whatsoe'er degree Resume not what themselves have given, Or any brother god in heaven, Which keeps the peace among the gods, Or they must always be at odds. And Pallas, if she broke the laws, Must yield her foe the stronger cause. A shame to one so much adored For wisdom at Jove's council board. Besides, she feared the queen of love Would meet with better friends above. And though she must with grief reflect To see a mortal virgin decked With graces hitherto unknown To female breasts except her own, Yet she would act as best became A goddess of unspotted fame. She knew by augury divine Venus would fail in her design. She studied well the point and found Her foe's conclusions were not sound. From premises erroneous brought, And therefore the deductions not, And must have contrary effects To what her treacherous foe expects. In proper season Pallas meets The queen of love whom thus she greets, for gods, we are by Homer told, can in celestial language scold. Perfidious goddess, but in vain, you formed this project in your brain, a project for your talents fit, with much deceit and little wit. Thou hast, as thou shall quickly see, deceived thyself instead of me. For how can heavenly wisdom prove an instrument to earthly love? Know'st thou not yet that men commence thy votaries for want of sense? Nor shall Vanessa be the theme to manage thy abortive scheme. She'll prove the greatest of thy foes, and yet I scorn to interpose. But, using neither skill nor force, leave all things to their natural course. The goddess thus pronounced her doom, when, lo, Vanessa, in her bloom, advanced like Atalanta's star, but rarely seen, and seen from far. In a new world with caution slept, Watched all the company she kept, Well knowing from the books she read, What dangerous paths young virgins tread. Would seldom at the park appear, Nor saw the playhouse twice a year, Yet not incurious was inclined To know the converse of mankind. First issued from perfumers' shops A crowd of fashionable fops. They asked her how she liked the play. When told the tattle of the day, A duel fought last night at two About a lady you know who. Mentioned a new Italian come, Either from Moscovy or Rome, Gave hints of who and who's together, Then fell to talking of the weather. Last night was so extremely fine, The ladies walked till after nine. Then, 
In soft voice and speech absurd, With nonsense every second word, With fustian from exploded plays, They celebrate her beauty's praise, Run o'er their cant of stupid lies, And tell the murders of her eyes. With silent scorn Vanessa sat, Scarce listening to their idle chat, Farther than sometimes by a frown, When they grew pert to pull them down. At last she spitefully was bent, To try their wisdom's full extent, And said she valued nothing less Than titles, figure, shape, and dress, That merit should be chiefly placed In judgment, knowledge, wit, and taste. And these she offered to dispute, Alone distinguished man from brute that present times have no pretence to virtue in the noble sense, by Greeks and Romans understood to perish for our country's good. She named the ancient heroes round, explained for what they were renowned, then spoke with censure or applause of foreign customs, rights, and laws. Through nature and through art she ranged, and gracefully her subject changed. In vain, her hearers had no share, in all she spoke except to stare. Their judgment was, upon the whole, That lady is the dullest soul, Then tapped their forehead in a jeer, As who should say, she wants it here. She may be handsome, young, and rich, But none will burn her for a witch. A party next of glittering dames, From round the purlieus of St. James, Came early out of pure good will To see the girl in dishabille. Their clamour, lighting from their chairs, grew louder all the way upstairs, at entrance loudest where they found the room with volumes littered round. Vanessa held Montaigne and read, while Mrs. Susan combed her head. They called for tea and chocolate, and fell into their usual chat, discoursing with important face on ribbons, fans, and gloves, and lace. Showed patterns just from India brought, and gravely asked her what she thought, whether the red or green were best, and what they cost, Vanessa guessed, as came into her fancy first, named half the rates and liked the worst. To scandal next, what awkward thing was that last Sunday in the ring? I'm sorry Mopsa breaks so fast, I said her face would never last. Corinna, with that youthful air, is thirty and a bit to spare. Her fondness for a certain earl began when I was but a girl. Phyllis, who but a month ago was married to the Tunbridge beau, I saw coquetting t'other night in public with that odious knight. They rallied next Vanessa's dress. That gown was made for old Queen Bess. Dear madam, let me see your head. Don't you intend to put on red? A petticoat without a hoop? Sure you are not ashamed to stoop? With handsome garters at your knees, No matter what a fellow sees. Filled with disdain, with rage inflamed, Both of herself and sex ashamed, The nymph stood silent out of spite, Nor would vouchsafe to set them right. Away the fair detractors went, And gave by turns their censures vent. She's not so handsome in my eyes, for wit I wonder where it lies. She's fair and clean, but that's the most, But why proclaim her for a toast? A baby face, no life, no airs, But what she learned at country fairs. Scarce knows what difference is between Rich Flanders lace and Colbertine. I'll undertake my little Nancy, In flounces has a better fancy, with all her wit, I would not ask her judgment how to buy a mask. We begged her but to patch her face. She never hit one proper place, which every girl at five years old can do as soon as she is told. I own that out-of-fashion stuff becomes the creature well enough. The girl might pass if we could get her to know the world a little better. To know the world, a modern phrase for visits, ombre, balls, and plays. Thus to the world's perpetual shame, the queen of beauty lost her aim. Too late with grief she understood, Pallas had done more harm than good. For great examples are but vain, where ignorance begets disdain. Both sexes armed with guilt and spite, against Vanessa's power unite. To copy her few nymphs aspired, 
Her virtues fewer swains admired. So stars beyond a certain height Give mortals neither heat nor light. Yet some of either sex endowed With gifts superior to the crowd, With virtue, knowledge, taste, and wit, She condescended to admit. With pleasing arts she could reduce Men's talents to their proper use, And with address each genius held To that wherein it most excelled. Thus making others' wisdom known Could please them and improve her own. A modest youth said something new, She placed it in the strongest view. All humble worth she strove to raise, Would not be praised, yet loved to praise. The learned met with free approach, Although they came not in a coach. Some clergy too she would allow, Nor quarrelled at their awkward bow. But this was for Cadenus's sake, A gownman of a different make whom Pallas once, Vanessa's tutor, had fixed on for her co-adjutor. But Cupid, full of mischief, longs to vindicate his mother's wrongs. On Pallas all attempts are vain. One way he knows to give her pain, vows on Vanessa's heart to take due vengeance for her patron's sake. Those early seeds by Venus sown, in spite of Pallas, now were grown and Cupid hoped they would improve by time and ripen into love. The boy made use of all his craft, in vain discharging many a shaft. Pointed at colonels, lords, and bows, Cadenus warded off the blows, for placing still some book betwixt, the darts were in the cover fixed, or, often blunted and recoiled, on Plutarch's moral struck were spoiled. The queen of wisdom could foresee, but not prevent the fate's decree. And human caution tries in vain to break that adamantine chain. Vanessa, though by Pallas taught, by love invulnerable thought. Searching in books for wisdom's aid, was in the very search betrayed. Cupid, though all his darts were lost, yet still resolved to spare no cost. He could not answer to his fame the triumphs of that stubborn dame, a nymph so hard to be subdued, who neither was coquette nor prude. I find, said he, she wants a doctor, both to adore her and instruct her. I'll give her what she most admires among those venerable sires. Cadenus is a subject fit, grown old in politics and wit, caressed by ministers of state, of half mankind the dread and hate. Whate'er vexations love attend, she needs no rivals apprehend. Her sex with universal voice must laugh at her capricious choice. Cadenus many things had writ, Vanessa much esteemed his wit, and called for his poetic works. Meantime the boy in secret lurks. And while the book was in her hand, the urchin from his private stand took aim and shot with all his strength, a dart of such prodigious length, it pierced the feeble volume through, and deep transfixed her bosom too. Some lines more moving than the rest stuck to the point that pierced her breast, and borne directly to the heart, with pains unknown increased her smart. Vanessa, not in years a score, Dreams of a gown of forty-four, Imaginary charms can find In eyes with reading almost blind. Cadenus now no more appears, Declined in health, advanced in years. She fancies music in his tongue, Nor farther looks but thinks him young. What mariner is not afraid To venture in a ship decayed? What planter will attempt to yoke A sapling with a falling oak? As years increase, she brighter shines, Cadenus with each day declines. And he must fall a prey to time, While she continues in her prime. Cadenus common forms apart, In every scene had kept his heart, Had sighed and languished, vowed and writ, For pastime or to show his wit. But books and time and state affairs Had spoiled his fashionable airs, he now could praise, esteem, approve, but understood not what was love. His conduct might have made him styled a father, and the nymph his child. That innocent delight he took to see the virgin mind her book 
Was but the master's secret joy In school to hear the finest boy. Her knowledge with her fancy grew, She hourly pressed for something new. Ideas came into her mind, So fast his lessons lagged behind. She reasoned without plodding long, Nor ever gave her judgment wrong. But now a sudden change was wrought, She minds no longer what he taught. Cadenus was amazed to find Such marks of a distracted mind, For though she seemed to listen more To all he spoke than e'er before, He found her thoughts would absent range, Yet guessed not whence could spring the change. And first he modestly conjectures His pupil might be tired with lectures, Which helped to mortify his pride, Yet gave him not the heart to chide. But in a mild, dejected strain, at last he ventured to complain, said she should be no longer teased, might have her freedom when she pleased, was now convinced he acted wrong to hide her from the world so long, and in dull studies to engage one of her tender sex and age, that every nymph with envy owned how she might shine in the grand bond, and every shepherd was undone to see her cloistered like a nun, this was a visionary scheme, he waked and found it but a dream. A project far above his skill, for nature must be nature still. If he were bolder than became a scholar to a courtly dame, she might excuse a man of letters, thus tutors often treat their better. And since his talk offensive grew, he came to take his last adieu. Vanessa, filled with just disdain, would still her dignity maintain, instructed from her early years to scorn the art of female tears. Had he employed his time so long to teach her what was right and wrong, yet could such notions entertain that all his lectures were in vain? She owned the wandering of her thoughts, but he must answer for her faults. She well remembered to her cost that all his lessons were not lost. Two maxims she could still produce, and sad experience taught their use. That virtue pleased by being shown, knows nothing which it dares not own, can make us without fear disclose our inmost secrets to our foes. That common forms were not designed, directors to a noble mind. Now said the nymph to let you see, my actions with your rules agree that I can vulgar forms despise, and have no secrets to disguise. I knew by what you said and writ, how dangerous things were men of wit. You cautioned me against their charms, but never gave me equal arms. Your lessons found the weakest part, aimed at the head, but reached the heart. Cadenus felt within him rise, shame, disappointment, guilt, surprise. He knew not how to reconcile such language with her usual style. And yet her words were so expressed, he could not hope she spoke in jest. His thoughts had wholly been confined to form and cultivate her mind. He hardly knew, till he was told, whether the nymph were young or old, had met her in a public place without distinguishing her face, much less could his declining age Vanessa's earliest thoughts engage. And if her youth indifference met, his person must contempt beget or grant her passion be sincere, how shall his innocence be clear? Appearances were all so strong, the world must think him in the wrong, would say he made a treacherous use of wit to flatter and seduce. The town would swear he had betrayed by magic spells the harmless maid, and every beau would have his joke that scholars were like other folk, and when platonic flights were over, the tutor turned a mortal lover. So tender of the young and fair, it showed a true paternal care. Five thousand guineas in her purse, the doctor might have fancied worse. Hardly at length he silence broke, and faltered every word he spoke, interpreting her complaisance just as a man sans consequence. She rallied well, he always knew, her manner now was something new, and what she spoke was in an air as serious as a tragic player. But those who aim at ridicule should fix upon some certain rule, which fairly hints they are in jest, else he must enter his protest. 
For let a man be near so wise, He may be caught with sober lies. A science which he never taught, And to be free was dearly bought. For take it in its proper light, 'Tis just what coxcombs call a bite. But not to dwell on things minute, Vanessa finished the dispute. Brought weighty arguments to prove That reason was her guide in love. She thought he had himself described His doctrines when she first imbibed. What he had planted now was grown, His virtues she might call her own. As he approves, as he dislikes, Love or contempt her fancy strikes. Self-love in nature rooted fast, Attends us first and leaves us last. Why she likes him, admire not at her, She loves herself, and that's the matter. How was her tutor wont to praise The geniuses of ancient days, Those authors he so oft had named, For learning, wit, and wisdom famed, Was struck with love, esteem, and awe For persons whom he never saw. Suppose Cadenus florist then, He must adore such godlike men. If one short volume could comprise All that was witty, learned, and wise, how would it be esteemed and read, although the writer long were dead? If such an author were alive, how all would for his friendship strive, and come in crowds to see his face, and this she takes to be her case. Cadenus answers every end, the book, the author, and the friend. The utmost her desires will reach is but to learn what he can teach. His converse is a system fit, alone to fill up all her wit, while every passion of her mind in him is centred and confined. Love can with speech inspire a mute, and taught Vanessa to dispute. This topic, never touched before, displayed her eloquence the more. Her knowledge, with such pains acquired, by this new passion grew inspired. Through this she made all objects pass, which gave it tincture o'er the mass, as rivers, though they bend and twine, Still to the sea their course incline. Or as philosophers who find Some favorite system to their mind, In every point to make it fit, Will force all nature to submit. Cadenus, who could ne'er suspect His lessons would have such effect, Or be so artfully applied, Insensibly came on her side. It was an unforeseen event, Things took a turn he never meant. Whoe'er excels in what we prize, Appears a hero in our eyes. Each girl, when pleased with what is taught, Will have the teacher in her thought. When Miss delights in her spinet, A fiddler may a fortune get. A blockhead with melodious voice In boarding schools may have his choice. And oft the dancing master's art Climbs from the toe to touch the heart. In learning let a nymph delight, the pedant gets a mistress bite. Cadenus, to his grief and shame, could scarce oppose Vanessa's flame, and though her arguments were strong, at least could hardly wish them wrong. How ere it came he could not tell, but sure she never talked so well. His pride began to interpose, preferred before a crowd of bows. So bright a nymph to come unsought, such wonder by his merit wrought, tis merit must with her prevail, he never knew her judgment fail. She noted all she ever read, and had a most discerning head. Tis an old maxim in the schools that flattery is the food of fools. Yet now and then your men of wit will condescend to take a bit. So when Cadenus could not hide, he chose to justify his pride construing the passion she had shown much to her praise more to his own. Nature in him had merit placed, in her a most judicious taste. Love hitherto a transient guest, near held possession of his breast, so long attending at the gate, disdained to enter in so late. Love, why do we one passion call, when tis a compound of them all? Where hot and cold, where sharp and sweet, In all their equipages meet, Where pleasures mixed with pains appear, Sorrow with joy and hope with fear, Wherein his dignity and age Forbid Cadenus to engage. But friendship in its greatest height, A constant rational delight, 
On virtue's basis fixed to last, When love's allurements long are past, Which gently warms, but cannot burn, He gladly offers in return. His want of passion will redeem With gratitude, respect, esteem. With what devotion we bestow When goddesses appear below. While thus Cadenus entertains, Vanessa in exalted strains, The nymph in sober words entreats A truce with all sublime conceits. For why such raptures, flights, and fancies To her who durst not read romances, In lofty style to make replies Which he had taught her to despise? But when her tutor will affect Devotion, duty, and respect, he fairly abdicates the throne. The government is now her own. He has a forfeiture incurred. She vows to take him at his word, and hopes he will not think it strange if both should now their stations change. The nymph will have her turn to be the tutor and the pupil he. Though she already can discern, her scholar is not apt to learn, or wants capacity to reach the science she designs to teach. Wherein his genius was below the skill of every common beau, who, though he cannot spell, is wise enough to read a lady's eyes, and will each accidental glance interpret for a kind advance. But what success Vanessa met is to the world a secret yet. Whether the nymph, to please her swain, talks in a high romantic strain, or whether he at last descends, to act with less seraphic ends, or to compound the business whether they temper love and books together, must never to mankind be told, nor shall the conscious muse unfold. Meantime the mournful queen of love led but a weary life above. She ventures now to leave the skies, grown by Vanessa's conduct wise. For though by one perverse event Pallas had crossed her first intent, Though her design was not obtained, yet had she much experience gained, and by the project vainly tried, could better now the cause decide. She gave due notice that both parties, Coram Regina prox di Martis, should at their peril without fail come and appear and save their bail. All met in silence thrice proclaimed, one lawyer to each side was named. The judge discovered in her face resentments for her late disgrace, and full of anger, shame, and grief, directed them to mind their brief, nor spend their time to show their reading, she'd have a summary proceeding. She gathered under every head the sum of what each lawyer said, gave her own reasons last, and then decreed the cause against the men. But in a weighty case like this, to show she did not judge amiss, which evil tongues might else report, she made a speech in open court, wherein she grievously complains how she was cheated by the swains, on whose petition, humbly showing that women were not worth the wooing, and that unless the sex would mend, the race of lovers soon must end, she was at Lord knows what expense to form a nymph of wit and sense, a model for her sex designed, who never could one lover find. She saw her favour was misplaced, the fellows had a wretched taste. She needs must tell them to their face, they were a stupid, senseless race. And were she to begin again, she'd studied to reform the men, or add some grains of folly more to women than they had before, to put them on an equal foot, and this or nothing else would do't. This might their mutual fancy strike, since every being loves its like. But now, repenting what was done, she left all business to her son. She put the world in his possession, and let him use it at discretion. The crier was ordered to dismiss the court who made his last, oh yes. The goddess would no longer wait, but rising from her chair of state, left all below at six and seven, harnessed her doves, and flew to heaven. End of section one. Section 2 of The Poems of Jonathan Swift, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, 
please visit LibriVox.org. TO LOVE In all I wish, how happy should I be, Thou grand deluder, were it not for thee, So weak thou art, that fools thy power despise, And yet so strong thou triumph'st o'er the wise. Thy traps are laid with such peculiar art, They catch the cautious, let the rash depart. Most nets are filled by want of thought and care, But too much thinking brings us to thy snare, Where, held by thee, in slavery we stay, And throw the pleasing part of life away. But what does most my indignation move? Discretion thou wert near a friend to love. Thy chief delight is to defeat those arts By which he kindles mutual flames in hearts. While the blind loitering God is at his play, Thou stealst his golden pointed darts away. Those darts which never fail and in their stead Convaced malignant arrows tipped with lead. The heedless God, suspecting no deceits, Shoots on and thinks he has done wondrous feats. But the poor nymph who feels her vitals burn, And from her shepherd can find no return, Laments and rages at the power divine, When cursed discretion all the fault was thine. Cupid and Hymen, thou hast set at odds, And bred such feuds between those kindred gods, That Venus cannot reconcile her sons, When one appears, away the other runs. The former scales, wherein he used to poise, Love against love, and equal joys with joys, are now filled up with avarice and pride, where titles, power, and riches still subside. Then, gentle Venus, to thy father run, and tell him how thy children are undone. Prepare his bolts to give one fatal blow, and strike discretion to the shades below. End of section two. Section three of The Poems of Jonathan Swift, Volume Two. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Rebus by Vanessa. Cut the name of the man who his mistress denied and let the first of it be only applied to join with the prophet who david did chide then say what a horse is that runs very fast and that which deserves to be first put the last spell all then and put them together to find the name and the virtues of him i designed like the patriarch in egypt he's versed in the state like the prophet in jewelry, he's free with the great. Like a racer he flies, to succor with speed, when his friends want his aid, or desert is in need. The Dean's Answer The nymph who wrote this in an amorous fit, I cannot but envy the pride of her wit, which thus she will venture profusely to throw on so mean a design and a subject so low. For means her design, and her subject as mean, The first but a rebus, the last but a dean. A dean's but a parson, and what is a rebus? A thing never known to the muses or Phoebus. The corruption of verse, for when all is done, It is but a paraphrase made on a pun. But a genius like hers no subject can stifle, It shows and discovers itself through a trifle. By reading this trifle, I quickly began To find her a great wit, but the dean a small man. Rich ladies will furnish their garrets with stuff, Which others for mantuas would think fine enough. 
So the wit that is lavishly thrown away here, Might furnish a second rate poet a year. This much for the verse, we proceed to the next, Where the nymph has entirely forsaken her text. Her fine panegyrics are quite out of season, And what she describes to be merit is treason. The changes which faction has made in the state Have put the dean's politics quite out of date. Now no one regards what he utters with freedom, And should he write pamphlets, no great man would read him. And should want or desert stand in need of his aid, This racer would prove but a dull foundered jade. End of section 3、section、four of the Poems of Jonathan Swift, Volume Two. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Stella's Birthday, March thirteenth, seventeen eighteen nineteen. Stella this day is thirty four. We shan't dispute a year or more. However, Stella, be not troubled, although thy size and years are doubled. Since first I saw thee at sixteen, the brightest virgin on the green, so little is thy form declined, made up so largely in thy mind. Oh, would it please the gods to split thy beauty, size, and years, and wit? No age could furnish out a pair of nymphs so graceful, wise, and fair. With half the lustre of your eyes, with half your wit, your years and size. And then, before it grew too late, how should I beg of gentle fate that either nymph might have her swain to split my worship too in twain? Stella's Birthday, seventeen nineteen to twenty. All travellers at first incline, where'er they see the fairest sign, and if they find the chambers neat, And like the liquor and the meat, will call again and recommend the angel in to every friend. And though the painting grows decayed, the house will never lose its trade. Nay, though the treacherous tapster Thomas hangs a new angel two doors from us, as fine as dauber's hands can make it, in hopes that strangers may mistake it, we think it both a shame and sin to quit the true old angel in. Now this is Stella's case, in fact, an angel's face a little cracked. Could poets or could painters fix how angels look at thirty-six? This drew us in at first to find in such a form an angel's mind, and every virtue now supplies the fainting rays of Stella's eyes. See at her levy crowding swains whom Stella freely entertains with breeding humour, wit, and sense, and puts them to so small expense. Their mind so plentifully fills and makes such reasonable bills, so little gets for what she gives. We really wonder how she lives, and had her stock been less, no doubt she must have long ago run out. Then who can think will quit the place when doll hangs out a newer face? Nailed to her window, full in sight, all Christian people to invite, or stop in light at Chloe's head with scraps and leavings to be fed. Then Chloe still go on to prate of thirty-six and thirty-eight. Pursue your trade of scandal picking, your hints that Stella is no chicken, your innuendos when you tell us that Stella loves to talk with fellows. But let me warn you to believe a truth for which your soul should grieve. That should you live to see the day when Stella's locks must all be grey, when age must print a furrowed trace on every feature of her face, though you and all your senseless tribe could art or time or nature bribe to make you look like beauty's queen and hold for ever at fifteen, no bloom of youth can ever blind the cracks and wrinkles of your mind. All men of sense will pass your door. And crowd to Stella's at four score. End of section four. Section five of the Poems of Jonathan Swift, Volume Two. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. To Stella, who collected and transcribed his poems, seventeen twenty. 
As when a lofty pile is raised, we never hear the workmen praised, who bring the lime or place the stones, but all admire Inigo Jones. So if this pile of scattered rhymes should be approved in after times, if it both pleases and endures, the merit and the praise are yours. Thou, Stella, wert no longer young, when first for thee my harp was strung, without one word of Cupid's darts, of killing eyes or bleeding hearts, with friendship and esteem possessed, I ne'er admitted love a guest. In all the habitudes of life, the friend, the mistress, and the wife, variety we still pursue in pleasure seek for something new, or else, comparing with the rest, take comfort that our own is best. The best we value by the worst, as tradesmen show their trash at first. But his pursuits are at an end, whom Stella chooses for a friend. A poet starving in a garret, conning all topics like a parrot, invokes his mistress and his muse, and stays at home for want of shoes. Should but his muse descending drop, a slice of bread and mutton chop, or kindly, when his credit's out, surprise him with a pint of stout, or patch his broken stocking soles, or send him in a peck of coals. Exalted in his mighty mind, he flies and leaves the stars behind. Counts all his labors amply paid, adores her for the timely aid. Or should a porter make inquiries for Chloe, Sylvia, Phyllis, Iris, be told the lodging lane and sign, the bowers that hold those nymphs divine, fair Chloe would perhaps be found with footmen tippling underground. The charming Sylvia beating flax, her shoulders marked with bloody tracks, bright Phyllis mending ragged smocks, and radiant Iris in the pox. These are the goddesses enrolled in Curl's collection, new and old, whose scoundrel fathers would not know him if they should meet them in a poem. True poets can depress and raise, are lords of infamy and praise. They are not scurrilous in satyr, nor will in panegyric flatter. Unjustly poets we asperse, truth shines the brighter, clad in verse. And all the fictions they pursue do but insinuate what is true. Now should my praises owe their truth to beauty, dress, or paint, or youth, what Stoics call without our power, they could not be insured an hour. T'were grafting on an annual stock, that must our expectation mock, and making one luxuriant shoot die thee next year for want of root. Before I could my verses bring, perhaps you're quite another thing. So Mavius, when he drained his skull, to celebrate some suburb troll, his similes in order set, and every crambo he could get, had gone through all the common places, worn out by wits who rhyme on faces, before he could his poem close, the lovely nymph had lost her nose. Your virtues safely I commend, they on no accidents depend. Let malice look with all her eyes, she dares not say the poet lies. Stella, when you these lines transcribe, lest you should take them for a bribe, resolved to mortify your pride, I'll here expose your weaker side. Your spirits kindled to a flame, moved by the lightest touch of blame. And when a friend in kindness tries to show you where your error lies, conviction does but more incense. Perverseness is your whole defense. Truth, judgment, wit give place to spite, regardless both of wrong and right. Your virtues all suspended wait till time has opened reason's gate. And what is worse, your passion bends its force against your nearest friends, which manners, decency, and pride have taught you from the world to hide. In vain, for see, your friend has brought to public light your only fault, and yet a fault we often find mixed in a noble, generous mind, and may compare to Etna's fire, which, though with trembling, all admire. The heat that makes the summit glow, enriching all the vales below. Those who in warmer climes complain, from Phoebus's rays they suffer pain, must own that pain is largely paid 
by generous wines beneath a shade. Yet when I find your passions rise, and anger sparkling in your eyes, I grieve those spirits should be spent, for nobler ends by nature meant. One passion with a different turn, makes wit in flame, or anger burn. So the sun's heat with different powers, ripens the grape, the liquor sours. Thus Ajax, when with rage possessed, by Pallas breathed into his breast, his valour would no more employ, which might alone have conquered Troy. But blinded by resentment seeks, for vengeance on his friends, the Greeks. You think this turbulence of blood from stagnating preserves the flood, which thus fermenting by degrees exalts the spirits, sinks the lees. Stella, for once you reason wrong, for should this ferment last too long, by time subsiding you may find nothing but acid left behind. From passion you may then be freed, when peevishness and spleen succeed. Say, Stella, when you copy next, will you keep strictly to the text? Dare you let these reproaches stand, and to your failings set your hand? Or if these lines your anger fire, shall they in baser flames expire? When e'er they burn, if burn they must, they'll prove my accusation just. End of section 5section six of the poems of jonathan swift volume two this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org to stella visiting me in my sickness 1720 pallas observing stella's wit was more than for her sex was fit and that her beauty soon or late might breed confusion in the state in high concern for human kind, fixed honour in her infant mind. But not in wrangling to engage with such a stupid vicious age, if honour I would here define, it answers faith in things divine. As natural life the body warms, and scholars teach the soul informs, so honour animates the whole, and is the spirit of the soul. Those numerous virtues which the tribe of tedious moralists describe, and by such various titles call, true honour comprehends them all. Let melancholy rule supreme, colour preside or blood or flame, it makes no difference in the case, nor is complexion honour's place. But lest we should for honour take the drunken quarrels of a rake, or think it seated in a scar, or on a proud triumphal car, or in the payment of a debt we lose with sharpers at piquette, or when a whore in her vocation keeps punctual to an assignation, or that on which his lordship swears when vulgar knaves would lose their heirs, let Stella's fair example preach a lesson she alone can teach. In points of honour to be tried, all passions must be laid aside. Ask no advice, but think alone, suppose the question not your own. How shall I act is not the case, but how would Brutus in my place? In such a case would Cato bleed, and how would Socrates proceed? Drive all objections from your mind, else you relapse to humankind. Ambition, avarice, and lust, a factious rage and breach of trust, and flattery tipped with nauseous fleer, and guilty shame and servile fear, and thee and cruelty and pride will in your tainted heart preside. Heroes and heroines of old by honour only were enrolled, among their brethren in the skies, to which, though late, shall Stella rise. Ten thousand oaths upon record are not so sacred as her word. The world shall in its atoms end, ere Stella can deceive a friend. By honour seated in her breast, she still determines what is best. What indignation in her mind against enslavers of mankind! 
base kings and ministers of state, Eternal objects of her hate! She thinks that nature ne'er design'd Courage to man alone confined. Can cowardice her sex adorn, Which most exposes ours to scorn? She wonders where the charm appears In Florimel's affected fears. For Stella never learned the art At proper times to scream and start nor calls up all the house at night, and swears she saw a thing in white. Doll never flies to cut her lace, or throw cold water in her face, because she heard a sudden drum, or found an earwig in a plum. Her hearers are amazed from whence proceeds that fund of wit and sense, which, though her modesty would shroud, breaks like the sun behind a cloud. While gracefulness its art conceals, and yet through every motion steals. Say, Stella, was Prometheus blind, and forming you mistook your kind? No, t'was for you alone he stole the fire that forms a manly soul. Then to complete it every way, he moulded it with female clay. To that you owe the nobler flame, to this the beauty of your frame. How would ingratitude delight, and how would censure glut her spite, if I should Stella's kindness hide, in silence or forget with pride? When on my sickly couch I lay, impatient both of night and day, lamenting in unmanly strains, called every power to ease my pains, then Stella ran to my relief, with cheerful face and inward grief. And though by heaven's severe decree she suffers hourly more than me, no cruel master could require from slaves employed for daily hire what Stella by her friendship warmed, with vigor and delight performed. My sinking spirits now supplies with cordials in her hands and eyes. Now with a soft and silent tread, unheard she moves about my bed. I see her taste each nauseous draught, and so obligingly am caught. I bless the hand from whence they came, nor dare distort my face for shame. Best pattern of true friends, beware, you pay too dearly for your care. If while your tenderness secures my life it must endanger yours, for such a fool was never found who pulled a palace to the ground, only to have the ruins made, materials for a house decayed. End of section 6section 7 of the poems of jonathan swift volume 2 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org to stella on her birthday 1721 2 while stella to your lasting praise the muse her annual tribute pays while i assign myself a task which you expect but scorn to ask if I perform this task with pain, let me of partial fate complain. You every year the debt enlarge, I grow less equal to the charge. In you each virtue brighter shines, but my poetic vein declines. My harp will soon in vain be strung, and all your virtues left unsung. For none among the upstart race of poets dare assume my place. Your worth will be to them unknown. They must have Stellas of their own. And thus my stock of wit decayed, I dying leave the debt unpaid. Unless Delaney, as my heir, will answer for the whole arrear. Stella's birthday, a great bottle of wine, long buried, being that day dug up. 1722-3 Resolved my annual verse to pay, my duty bound on Stella's day. Furnished with paper, pens, and ink, I gravely sat me down to think. I bit my nails and scratched my head, but found my wit and fancy fled. Or, if with more than usual pain, a thought came slowly from my brain. 
It cost me Lord knows how much time To shape it into sense and rhyme; And what was yet a greater curse, Long thinking made my fancy worse. Forsaken by th' inspiring Nine, I waited at Apollo's shrine; I told him what the world would say, If Stella were unsung to day; How I should hide my head for shame, When both the Jacks and Robin came; How Ford would frown, how Jim would leer, How Sheridan the rogue would sneer, And swear it does not always follow That Semelin Anno ridet Apollo. I have assured them twenty times That Phoebus helped me in my rhymes; Phoebus inspired me from above, And he and I were hand and glove; But finding me so dull and dry since, They call it all poetic license. And when I brag of aid divine, Think Usedon's right as good as mine. Nor do I ask for Stella's sake, 'Tis my own credit lies at stake. And Stella will be sung, while I Can only be a stander by. Apollo, having thought a little, Returned this answer to a tittle. Though you should live like old Methuselah, I furnish hints, and you shall use all em. You yearly sing as she grows old, You'd leave her virtues half untold. But to say truth, such dullness reigns Through the whole set of Irish Danes. I'm daily stunned with such a medley, Dean White, Dean Daniel, and Dean Smedley, That, let what Dean soever come, My orders are, I'm not at home. And if your voice had not been loud, You must have passed among the crowd. But now your danger to prevent, You must apply to Mrs. Brent. For she, as priestess, knows the rites, Wherein the God of Earth delights. First nine ways looking, let her stand, With an old poker in her hand. Let her describe a circle round, In Saunders' cellar on the ground. A spade let prudent Archie hold, And with discretion dig the mould. Let Stella look with watchful eye, Rebecca Ford and Grattan's by. Behold the bottle where it lies, with neck elated toward the skies. The god of winds and god of fire did to its wondrous birth conspire, and Bacchus for the poet's use poured in a strong inspiring juice. See, as you raise it from its tomb, it drags behind a spacious womb, and in the spacious womb contains a sovereign medicine for the brains. You'll find it soon, if fate consents, if not a thousand Mrs. Brents. Ten thousand archies armed with spades may dig in vain to Pluto's shades. From thence a plenteous draught infuse, and boldly then invoke the muse. But first let Robert on his knees with caution drain it from the lees. The muse will at your call appear, with Stella's praise to crown the year. End of section 7《》section eight of the poems of jonathan swift volume two this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org stella at wood park a house of charles ford esq near dublin 1723 don carlos in a merry spite did stella to his house invite he entertained her half a year with generous wines and costly cheer. Don Carlos made her chief director, that she might o'er the servants hector. In half a week the dame grew nice, got all things at the highest price. Now at the table head she sits, presented with the nicest bits. She looked on partridges with scorn, except they tasted of the corn. A haunch of venison made her sweat, unless it had the right fumet. Don Carlos earnestly would beg, Dear madam, try this pigeon's leg. Was happy when he could prevail To make her only touch a quail. Through candlelight she viewed the wine To see that every glass was fine. At last grown prouder than the devil With feeding high and treatment civil, Don Carlos now began to find His malice work as he designed. The winter sky began to frown, Poor Stella must pack off to town, From purling streams and fountains bubbling To Liffey's stinking tide in Dublin, From wholesome exercise and air To saucing in an easy chair, From stomach sharp and hearty feeding 
to piddle like a lady breeding, From ruling there the household singly, To be directed here by Dingley. From every day a lordly banquet, To half a joint, and God be thank it. From every meal pontac in plenty, To half a pint one day in twenty. From Ford attending at her call, To visits of Archdeacon Wall. From Ford who thinks of nothing mean, to the poor doings of the dean. From growing richer with good cheer, to running out by starving here. But now arrives the dismal day, she must return to Ormond Quay. The coachman stopped, she looked and swore, the rascal had mistook the door. At coming in you saw her stoop, the entry brushed against her hoop. Each moment rising in her airs, she cursed the narrow winding stairs, began a thousand faults to spy, the ceiling hardly six feet high, the smutty wainscot full of cracks, and half the chairs with broken backs. Her quarters out at Lady Day, she vows she will no longer stay, in lodgings like a poor grisette, while there are houses to be let. Howe'er to keep her spirits up, she sent for company to sup, when all the while you might remark, she strove in vain to ape Wood Park. Two bottles called for, half her store, the cupboard could contain but four, a supper worthy of herself, five nothings in five plates of delf. Thus for a week the farce went on, when all her country savings gone, she fell into her former scene, small beer, a herring, and the dean. Thus far in jest, though now I fear, you think my jesting too severe. But poets, when a hint is new, Regard not whether false or true, yet raillery gives no offence where truth has not the least pretence, nor can be more securely placed than on a nymph of Stella's taste. I must confess your wine and victual I was too hard upon a little, your table neat, your linen fine, and though in miniature you shine, yet when you sigh to leave Wood Park, the scene, the welcome, and the spark, to languish in this odious town, and pull your haughty stomach down, we think you quite mistake the case, the virtue lies not in the place, for though my raillery were true, a cottage is Wood Park with you. End of section 8《Section 9 of The Poems of Jonathan Swift, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A New Year's Gift for Beck, 1723-4 Returning Janice now prepares for Beck a new supply of cares, sent in a bag to Dr. Swift, who thus displays the New Year's Gift. First this large parcel brings you tidings of our good dean's eternal chidings, of Nelly's pertness, Robin's leasings, and Sheridan's perpetual teasings. This box is crammed on every side with Stella's magisterial pride. Behold a cage with sparrows filled, first to be fondled, then be killed. Now to this hamper I invite you with six imagined cares to fright you. Here in this bundle Janice sends concerns by thousands for your friends. And here's a pair of leathern pokes to hold your cares for other folks. Here from this barrel you may broach a peck of troubles for a coach. This ball of wax your ears will darken, still to be curious never hearken. Lest you the town may have less trouble in, bring all your Quilka's cares to Dublin, for which he sends this empty sack and so take all upon your back. Dingley and Brent, a song, to the tune of Ye Commons and Peers. Dingley and Brent, wherever they went, near minded a word that was spoken. Whatever was said, they near troubled their head, but laughed at their own silly joking. Should Solomon wise in majesty rise, and show them his wit and his learning, they never would hear but turn the deaf ear as a matter they had no concern in. You tell a good jest and please all the rest, comes Dingley and asks you what is it? And curious to know, away she will go 
to seek an old rag in the closet. End of section 9《ポエムズ・ポエムズ・ポエムズ・ポエムズ・ポエムズ・ポエムズ・ポエムズ・ポエムズ・ポエムズ・ポエムズ・ポエムズ・ポエムズ・ポエムズ・ポエムズ・ポエムズ・ポエムズ・ポエムズ・ポエムズ・ポエムズ・ポエムズ・ポエムズ・ポエムズ・ポエムズ・ポエムズ・ポエムズ・ポエムズ・ポエムズ・ポエムズ・ポエムズ・ポエムズ・ポエムズ・ポエムズ・ポエムズ・ポエムズ・ポエムズ・ポエムズ・ポエムズ・ポエムズ・ポエムズ・ポエムズ・ポエムズ・ポエムズ・ポエ Time was when I could yearly pay my verse to Stella's native day, but now, unable grown to write, I grieve she ever saw the light. Ungrateful, since to her I owe that I these pains can undergo. She tends me like an humble slave, and when indecently I rave, when out my brutish passions break, with gall in every word I spake, she with soft speech my anguish cheers. Or melts my passions down with tears. Although 'tis easy to descry she wants assistance more than I, yet seems to feel my pains alone, and is a stoic in her own. When among scholars can we find so soft and yet so firm a mind? All accidents of life conspire to raise up Stella's virtue higher, or else to introduce the rest. Which had been latent in her breast. Her firmness, who could e'er have known, had she not evils of her own? Her kindness, who could ever guess, had not her friends been in distress? Whatever base returns you find, from me, dear Stella, still be kind. In your own heart you'll reap the fruit, though I continue still a brute. But when I once am out of pain, I promise to be good again. Meantime, your other juster friends shall for my follies make amends. So may we long continue thus, admiring you, you pitying us. End of section 10. Section 11 of The Poems of Jonathan Swift, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Receipt to Restore Stella's Youth, 1724 5. The Scottish hinds, too poor to house in frosty nights their starving cows, while not a blade of grass or hay appears from Michaelmas to May, must let their cattle range in vain for food along the barren plain. Meagre and lank with fasting grown, and nothing left but skin and bone. Exposed to want and wind and weather, they just keep life and soul together, till summer showers and evenings do again the verdant glebe renew. And as the vegetables rise, the famished cow her want supplies. Without an ounce of last year's flesh, what ear she gains is young and fresh. Grows plump and round and full of metal, as rising from Medea's kettle. With youth and beauty to enchant, Europa's counterfeit gallant. Why, Stella, should you knit your brow if I compare you to a cow? Tis just the case, for you have fasted so long till all your flesh is wasted, and must against the warmer days be sent to Quilca down to graze. Where mirth and exercise and air will soon your appetite repair. The nutriment will from within round all your body plump your skin, will agitate the lazy flood and fill your veins with sprightly blood. Nor flesh nor blood will be the same, nor aught of Stella but the name. For what was ever understood by humankind but flesh and blood? And if your flesh and blood be new, You'll be no more the former you, but for a blooming nymph will pass just fifteen coming summer's grass, your jetty locks with garlands crowned, while all the squires for nine miles round, attended by a brace of curs with jockey boots and silver spurs, no less than justices, o q u o r u m their cowboys bearing cloaks before em, shall leave deciding broken pates. 
to kiss your steps at Quilca's gates. But lest you should my skill disgrace, come back before you're out of case. For if to Michaelmas you stay, the newborn flesh will melt away. The squires in scorn will fly the house for better game and look for grouse. But here before the frost can merit, we'll make it firm with beef and claret. End of section 11. Section 12 of The Poems of Jonathan Swift, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Stella's Birthday, 1724-5 As when a beauteous nymph decays, we say she's past her dancing days. So poets lose their feet by time, and can no longer dance in rhyme. Your annual bard had rather chose to celebrate your birth in prose. Yet merry folks who want by chance a pair to make a country dance, call the old housekeeper and get her to fill a place for want of better. While Sheridan is off the hooks and friend Delaney at his books, that Stella may avoid disgrace once more the dean supplies their place. Beauty and wit, too sad a truth have always been confined to youth. The god of wit and beauty's queen, he twenty-one and she fifteen, no poet ever sweetly sung unless he were like Phoebus young. Nor ever nymph inspired to rhyme unless like Venus in her prime. At fifty-six, if this be true, am I a poet fit for you? Or at the age of forty-three, are you a subject fit for me? Adieu, bright wit and radiant eyes, you must be grave, and I be wise. Our fate in vain we would oppose, but I'll be still your friend in prose. Esteem and friendship to express will not require poetic dress, and if the muse deny her aid to have them sung, they may be said. But Stella, say, what evil tongue reports you are no longer young? that time sits with his scythe to mow, where erst sat Cupid with his bow, that half your locks are turned to grey? I'll ne'er believe a word they say. Tis true, but let it not be known, my eyes are somewhat dimish grown, for nature always in the right, to your decays adapts my sight, and wrinkles undistinguished pass, for I'm ashamed to use a glass. And till I see them with these eyes, whoever says you have them lies. No length of time can make you quit honour and virtue, sense and wit. Thus you may still be young to me, while I can better hear than see. O oh, near may fortune show her spite to make me deaf and mend my sight. Beck's birthday, November 8. 1726. This day, dear Beck, is thy nativity. Had fate a luckier one, she'd give it ye. She chose a thread of greatest length, and doubly twisted it for strength. Nor will be able with her shears to cut it off these forty years. Then who says care will kill a cat? Rebecca shows they're out in that. For she, though overrun with care, continues healthy, fat, and fair. As, if the gout should seize the head, doctors pronounce the patient dead. But if they can, by all their arts, eject it to the extremest parts, they give the sick man joy and praise, the gout that will prolong his days. Rebecca thus I gladly greet, who drives her cares to hands and feet. For though philosophers maintain the limbs are guided by the brain, quite contrary Rebecca's led, her hands and feet conduct her head. By arbitrary power convey her, she ne'er considers why or where. Her hands may meddle, feet may wander, her head is but a mere bystander, and all her bustling but supplies the part of wholesome exercise. Thus nature has resolved to pay her the cat's nine lives and eke the care, 
Long may she live and help her friends, Whene'er it suits her private ends. Domestic business never mind, Till coffee has her stomach lined. But when her breakfast gives her courage, Then think on Stella's chicken porridge. I mean when tiger has been served, Or else poor Stella may be starved. May Beck have many an evening nap, With tiger slabbering in her lap. But always take a special care, She does not overset the chair. Still be she curious, never hearken, To any speech but tiger's barking. And when she's in another scene, Stella long dead, but first the dean, May fortune and her coffee get her Companions that will please her better. Whole afternoons will sit beside her, Nor for neglects or blunders chide her. A goodly set, as can be found, Of hearty gossips prating round, Fresh from a wedding or a christening, To teach her ears the art of listening, And please her more to hear them tattle Than the Dean Storm or Stella rattle. Late be her death one gentle nod, When Hermes waiting with his rod, Shall to Elysian fields invite her, Where there will be no cares to fright her. On the Collar of Tiger Mrs. Dingley's Lapdog Pray steal me not, I Mrs. Dinglies, Whose heart in this four-footed thing lies. Stella's Birthday, March 13th, 1726, 7 This day, what e'er the fates decree, Shall still be kept with joy by me. This day, then let us not be told That you are sick and I grown old, Nor think on our approaching ills, And talk of spectacles and pills, Tomorrow will be time enough to hear such mortifying stuff. Yet since from reason may be brought a better and more pleasing thought, which can, in spite of all decays, support a few remaining days, from not the gravest of divines, except for once some serious lines. Although we now can form no more long schemes of life as heretofore, yet you, while time is running fast, can look with joy on what is past. Were future happiness and pain a mere contrivance of the brain, as atheists argue to entice and fit their proselytes for vice, the only comfort they propose to have companions in their woes? Grant this the case, yet sure it is hard, that virtue styled its own reward, and by all sages understood to be the chief of human good. Should acting die, nor leave behind Some lasting pleasure in the mind, Which, by remembrance, will assuage Grief, sickness, poverty, and age, And strongly shoot a radiant dart To shine through life's declining part. Say, Stella, feel you no content Reflecting on a life well spent? Your skilful hand employed to save Despairing wretches from the grave, and then supporting with your store those whom you dragged from death before? So providence on mortals waits, preserving what it first creates. Your generous boldness to defend an innocent and absent friend, that courage which can make you just to merit humbled in the dust. The detestation you express for vice in all its glittering dress, that patience under torturing pain, Where stubborn stoics would complain. Must these like empty shadows pass, Or forms reflected from a glass? Or mere chimeras in the mind, That fly and leave no marks behind? Does not the body thrive and grow By food of twenty years ago? And had it not been still supplied, It must a thousand times have died then who with reason can maintain that no effects of food remain? And is not virtue in mankind the nutriment that feeds the mind, upheld by each good action past, and still continued by the last? Then who with reason can pretend that all effects of virtue end? Believe me, Stella, when you show that true contempt for things below, nor prize your life for other ends, than merely to oblige your friends. Your former actions claim their part, and join to fortify your heart. For virtue in her daily race, like Janus, bears a double face. 
Looks back with joy where she has gone, And therefore goes with courage on. She at your sickly couch will wait, And guide you to a better state. O oh, then, whatever heaven intends, Take pity on your pitying friends, Nor let your ills affect your mind, To fancy they can be unkind. Me, surely me, you ought to spare, Who gladly would your suffering share, Or give my scrap of life to you, And think it far beneath your due. You to whose care so oft I owe, That I'm alive to tell you so. End of section 12《セクション13》of the poems of Jonathan Swift, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Death and Daphne, to an agreeable young lady, but extremely lean, 1730. Death went upon a solemn day at Pluto's hall, his court to pay. The phantom, having humbly kissed his grisly monarch's sooty fist, presented him the weekly bills of doctors, fevers, plagues, and pills. Pluto, observing since the peace, the burial article decrease, and vexed to see affairs miscarry, declared in council, death must marry. Vowed he no longer could support old bachelors about his court. The interest of his realm had need that death should get a numerous breed. Young deathlings who, by practice made, proficient in their father's trade, with colonies might stalk around his large dominions underground. A consult of coquettes below was called to rig him out a bow. From her own head Megira takes a periwig of twisted snakes which in the nicest fashion curled, like toupees of this upper world, with flour of sulphur powdered well that graceful on his shoulders fell. An adder of the sable kind in line direct hung down behind. The owl, the raven, and the bat clubbed for a feather to his hat. His coat, a usurer's velvet pall, bequeathed to Pluto corpse and all. But loath his person to expose, bare like a carcass picked by crows, a lawyer o'er his hands and face stuck artfully a parchment case. No new fluxed rake showed fairer skin, nor Phyllis after lying in. With snuff was filled his ebon box of shin bones rotted by the pox. Nine spirits of blaspheming fops with aconite anoint his chops, and give him words of dreadful soons. God damn his blood and blood and wounds. Thus furnished out, he sent his train to take a house in Warwick Lane. The faculty, his humble friends, a complimental message sends. Their president in scarlet gown harangued and welcomed him to town. But death had business to dispatch, his mind was running on his match. And hearing much of Daphne's fame, his majesty of terrors came, fine as a colonel of the guards, to visit where she sat at cards. She, as he came into the room, thought him Adonis in his bloom. And now her heart with pleasure jumps, She scarce remembers what is trumps. For such a shape of skin and bone Was never seen except her own. Charmed with his eyes and chin and snout, Her pocket-glass drew slyly out, And grew enamoured with her fizz As just the counterpart of his. She darted many a private glance, And freely made the first advance was of her beauty grown so vain she doubted not to win the swain nothing she thought could sooner gain him than with her wit to entertain him she asked about her friends below this meagre fop that battered beau whether some late departed toasts had got gallants among the ghosts if chloe were a sharper still as great as ever at quadrille the ladies there must needs be rooks for cards we know are pluto's books if Florimel had found her love, for whom she hanged herself above, how oft a week was kept a ball by Proserpine at Pluto's hall? She fancied those Elysian shades the sweetest place for masquerades. How pleasant on the banks of Styx to troll it in a coach and six! What pride a female heart inflames! How endless are ambition's aims! 
Cease, haughty nymph, the fate's decree, Death must not be a spouse for thee. For, when by chance the meagre shade Upon thy hand his finger laid, Thy hand as dry and cold as lead, His matrimonial spirit fled. He felt about his heart a damp That quite extinguished Cupid's lamp. Away the frighted spectre scuds, And leaves my lady in the suds. End of section 13section 14 of the poems of jonathan swift volume 2 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org daphne daphne knows with equal ease how to vex and how to please but the folly of her sex makes her sole delight to vex Never woman more devised, surer ways to be despised. Paradoxes weakly wielding, always conquered, never yielding. To dispute her chief delight, without one opinion right. Thicker arguments she lays on, and with cavils combats raisin. Answers in decisive way, never hears what you can say. Still her odd perverseness shows, chiefly where she nothing knows and where she is most familiar, always peevisher and sillier. All her spirits in a flame, when she knows she's most to blame. Send me hence ten thousand miles from a face that always smiles. None could ever act that part, but a fury in her heart. Ye who hate such inconsistence, to be easy keep your distance, or in folly still befriend her, but have no concern to mend her. Lose not time to contradict her, nor endeavour to convict her. Never take it in your thought that she'll own or cure a fault. Into contradiction warm her, then perhaps you may reform her. Only take this rule along, always to advise her wrong. And reprove her when she's right, she may then grow wise for spite. No, that scheme will ne'er succeed, she has better learnt her creed, She's too cunning and too skilful when to yield and when be willful. Nature holds her forth two mirrors, one for truth and one for errors. That looks hideous, fierce, and frightful. This is flattering and delightful. That she throws away as foul, sits by this to dress her soul. Thus you have the case in view, Daphne twixt the dean and you. Heaven forbid he should despise thee, but he'll never more advise thee. End of section 14. Section 15 of The Poems of Jonathan Swift, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Pathox the Great, 1723. From Venus born thy beauty shows. But who thy father, no man knows. Nor can the skilful herald trace The founder of thy ancient race. Whether thy temper, full of fire, Discovers Vulcan for thy sire, The god who made Scamander boil, And round his margin singed the soil. From whence philosophers agree, An equal power descends to thee. Whether from dreadful Mars you claim The high descent from whence you came, And as a proof show numerous scars, by fierce encounters made in wars, those honourable wounds you bore from head to foot and all before, and still the bloody field frequent, familiar in each leader's tent, or whether, as the learned contend, you from the neighbouring Gaul descend, or from Parthenope the proud, where numberless thy votaries crowd, whether thy great forefathers came from realms that bear Vespuccio's name, for so conjectures would obtrude, and from thy painted skin conclude, whether, as Epicurus shows, the world from justling seeds arose, which, mingling with prolific strife, and chaos kindled into life, so your production was the same, and from contending atoms came. Thy fair indulgent mother crowned thy head with sparkling rubies round. Beneath thy decent steps the road is all with precious jewels strode. The bird of Pallas knows his post, thee to attend, where'er thou goest. Byzantians boast that on the clod, where once their sultan's horse hath trod, grows neither grass nor shrub nor tree, 
The same thy subjects boast of thee. The greatest lord, when you appear, Will deign your livery to wear, In all the various colours seen, Of red and yellow, blue and green. With half a word, when you require, The man of business must retire. The haughty minister of state, With trembling must thy leisure wait. And while his fate is in thy hands, The business of the nation stands. Thou darest the greatest prince attack, Canst hourly set him on the rack, And as an instance of thy power, Enclose him in a wooden tower. With pungent pains on every side, So Regulus in torments died. From thee our youth all virtues learn, Dangers with prudence to discern, And well thy scholars are endued With temperance and with fortitude, With patience which all ills supports, And secrecy the art of courts. The glittering bow could hardly tell Without your aid to read or spell, But having long conversed with you Knows how to scroll a billet doux. With what delight, methinks I trace, Your blood in every noble race, In whom thy features, shape, and mien Are to the life distinctly seen. The Britons, once a savage kind, By you were brightened and refined, Descendants to the barbarous Huns, With limbs robust and voice that stuns. But you have moulded them afresh, Removed the tough superfluous flesh, Taught them to modulate their tongues, And speak without the help of lungs. Proteus on you bestowed the boon, To change your visage like the moon. You sometimes half a face produce, Keep t'other half for private use. How famed thy conduct in the fight, With Hermes, son of Pleias, bright! Outnumbered, half-encompassed round, You strove for every inch of ground, Then by a soldierly retreat Retired to your imperial seat. The victor, when your steps he traced, Found all the realms before him waste. You o'er the high triumphal arch, Pontific, made your glorious march. The wondrous arch behind you fell, And left a chasm profound as hell. You in your capital secured A siege as long as Troy endured. End of section 15section 16 of the poems of jonathan swift volume 2 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org on a pen 1724 in youth exalted high in air or bathing in the waters fair nature to form me took delight and clad my body all in white my person tall and slender waist, On either side with fringes graced, Till me that tyrant man espied, And dragged me from my mother's side. No wonder how I look so thin, The tyrant stripped me to the skin. My skin he flayed, my hair he cropped, At head and foot my body lopped, And then with heart more hard than stone, He picked my marrow from the bone. To vex me more, he took a freak, To slit my tongue and make me speak. But that which wonderful appears, I speak to eyes and not to ears. He oft employs me in disguise, And makes me tell a thousand lies. To me he chiefly gives in trust, To please his malice or his lust. From me no secret he can hide, I see his vanity and pride. And my delight is to expose his follies to his greatest foes. All languages I can command, yet not a word I understand. Without my aid, the best divine in learning would not know a line. The lawyer must forget his pleading, the scholar could not show his reading. Nay, man, my master is my slave, I give command to kill or save can grant ten thousand pounds a year, and make a beggar's brat appear. But while I thus my life relate, I only hasten on my fate. My tongue is black, my mouth is third, I hardly now can force a word. I die unpitied and forgot, and on some dunghill left to rot. End of section 16 
Section 17 of The Poems of Jonathan Swift, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. On Gold All ruling tyrant of the earth, to vilest slaves I owe my birth. How is the greatest monarch blessed, when in my gaudy livery dressed? No haughty nymph has power to run from me, or my embraces shun. Stabbed to the heart, condemned to flame, my constancy is still the same. The favourite messenger of Jove, and Lemnian god consulting strove, to make me glorious to the sight of mortals and the gods' delight. Soon would their altar's flame expire, if I refused to lend them fire. By fate exalted high in place, lo, here I stand with double face. Superior none on earth I find, but see below me all mankind. Yet as it oft attends the great, I almost sink with my own weight. At every motion undertook, the vulgar all consult my look. I sometimes give advice in writing, but never of my own indicting. I am a courtier in my way, for those who raised me I betray. And some give out that I entice to lust, to luxury, and dice. Who punishments on me inflict, because they find their pockets picked. By riding post I lose my health, and only to get others' wealth. End of section 17、18. Of the Poems of Jonathan Swift, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. On the Posteriors Because I am by nature blind, I wisely choose to walk behind. However, to avoid disgrace, I let no creature see my face. My words are few, but spoke with sense, and yet my speaking gives offence. Or, if to whisper I presume, the company will fly the room. By all the world I am oppressed, and my oppression gives them rest. Through me, though sore against my will, instructors every art instill. By thousands I am sold and bought, who neither get nor lose a groat. For none, alas, by me can gain, but those who give me greatest pain. Shall man presume to be my maester, who's but my caterer and taster? Yet though I always have my will, I'm but a mere depender still, an humble hanger-on at best, of whom all people make a jest. In me detractors seek to find two vices of a different kind. I'm too profuse, some censurers cry, and all I get I let it fly, while others give me many a curse, because too close I hold my purse. But this I know in either case, they dare not charge me to my face. Tis true indeed, sometimes I save, sometimes run out of all I have. But when the year is at an end, computing what I get and spend, my goings out and comings in, I cannot find I lose or win. And therefore all that know me say, I justly keep the middle way. I'm always by my betters led, and last get up and first a bed. Though if I rise before my time, the learned in sciences sublime, consult the stars and thence foretell good luck to those with whom I dwell. End of section 18. Section 19 of The Poems of Jonathan Swift, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. On a Horn The joy of man, the pride of brutes, domestic subject for disputes. Of plenty thou the emblem fair, adorned by nymphs with all their care. I saw thee raised to high renown, supporting half the British crown. And often have I seen thee grace the chaste Diana's infant face. And whensoe'er you please to shine, less useful is her light than thine. Thy numerous fingers know their way, and oft in Celia's tresses play. To place thee in another view, 
I'll show the world strange things, and true. What lords and dames of high degree May justly claim their birth from thee? The soul of man with spleen you vex, Of spleen you cure the female sex. Thee for a gift the courtier sends With pleasure to his special friends. He gives, and with a generous pride, Contrives all means the gift to hide. Nor oft can the receiver know Whether he has the gift or no. On airy wings you take your flight, And fly unseen both day and night. Conceal your form with various tricks, And few know how or where you fix. Yet some who near bestowed thee boast That they to others give thee most. Meantime the wise a question start, If thou a real being art, Or but a creature of the brain That gives imaginary pain? But the sly giver better knows thee, Who feels true joys when he bestows thee. End of section 19section 20 of the poems of jonathan swift volume 2 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org on a corkscrew though i alas a prisoner be my trade is prisoners to set free no slave his lord's commands obeys with such insinuating ways my genius piercing sharp and bright wherein the men of wit delight the clergy keep me for their ease and turn and wind me as they please a new and wondrous art i show of raising spirits from below in scarlet some and some in white they rise walk round yet never fright in at each mouth the spirits pass distinctly seen as through a glass or head and body make a rout and drive at last all secrets out and still the more i show my art the more they open every heart a greater chemist none than i who from materials hard and dry have taught men to extract with skill more precious juice than from a still although i'm often out of case i'm not ashamed to show my face though at the tables of the greet i near the sideboard take my seat Yet the plain squire, when dinner's done, Is never pleased till I make one. He kindly bids me near him stand, And often takes me by the hand. I twice a day a hunting go, Nor ever fail to seize my foe. And when I have him by the pole, I drag him upwards from his hole. Though some are of so stubborn kind, I'm forced to leave a limb behind. I hourly wait some fatal end, For I can break, but scorn to bend. End of section 20. Section 21 of The Poems of Jonathan Swift, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Gulf of All Human Possessions, 1724. Come hither and behold the fruits, vain man, of all thy vain pursuits. Take wise advice and look behind, bring all past actions to thy mind. Here you may see, as in a glass, how soon all human pleasures pass. How will it mortify thy pride, to turn the true impartial side? How will your eyes contain their tears, when all the sad reverse appears? This cave within its womb confines The last result of all designs. Here lie deposited the spoils Of busy mortals' endless toils. Here with an easy search we find The foul corruptions of mankind. The wretched purchase here behold Of traitors who their country sold. This gulf insatiate imbibes The lawyer's fees, the statesman's bribes. Here in their proper shape and mean, Fraud, perjury, and guilt are seen. Necessity, the tyrant's law, All human race must hither draw. All prompted by the same desire, The vigorous youth and aged sire. Behold the coward and the brave, The haughty prince, the humble slave, Physician, lawyer, and divine, All make oblations at this shrine. 
Some enter boldly, some by stealth, And leave behind their fruitless wealth. For while the bashful sylvan maid, As half ashamed and half afraid, Approaching finds it hard to part With that which dwelt so near her heart, The courtly dame, unmoved by fear, Profusely pours her offering here. A treasure here of learning lurks, Huge heaps of never-dying works, Labours of many an ancient sage, And millions of the present age. In at this gulf all offerings pass, And lie in undistinguished mass. Deucalion, to restore mankind, Was bid to throw the stones behind, So those who hear their gifts convey Are forced to look another way. For few, a chosen few, must know The mysteries that lie below. Sad charnel house, a dismal dome, For which all mortals leave their home. The young, the beautiful, and brave, Here buried in one common grave, Where each supply of dead renews Unwholesome damps, offensive dews. And lo, the writing on the walls Points out where each new victim falls. The food of worms and beasts obscene, Who round the vault luxuriant reign, See where those mangled corpses lie, Condemned by female hands to die. A comely dame, once clad in white, Lies there consigned to endless night. By cruel hands her blood was spilt, And yet her wealth was all her guilt. And here six virgins in a tomb, All beauteous offspring of one womb, Oft in the train of Venus seen, as fair and lovely as their queen. In royal garments each was dressed, each with a gold and purple vest. I saw them of their garments stripped, their throats were cut, their bellies ripped. Twice were they buried, twice were born, twice from their sepulchres were torn. But now dismembered here are cast, and find a resting place at last. Here oft the curious traveller finds The combat of opposing winds, And seeks to learn the secret cause Which alien seems from nature's laws. Why at this cave's tremendous mouth He feels at once both north and south, Whether the winds in caverns pent Through clefts a pugnant force a vent, Or whether opening all his stores Fierce Oleus in tempest roars. Yet from this mingled mass of things, In time a new creation springs. These crude materials once shall rise To fill the earth and air and skies. In various forms appear again Of vegetables, brutes, and men. So Jove pronounced among the gods, Olympus trembling as he nods. End of section 21《ポエムズ・ジョナサン・スウィフト》Swift, Volume 2 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Louisa to Strephon, 1724 Ah, Strephon, how can you despise Her who without thy pity dies? To Strephon I have still been true, and of as noble blood as you, fair issue of the genial bed, a virgin in thy bosom bred, embraced thee closer than a wife, when thee I leave, I leave my life. Why should my shepherd take amiss that oft I wake thee with a kiss? Yet you of every kiss complain, ah, uh, is not love a pleasing pain? A pain which every happy night you cure with ease and with delight, with pleasure, as the poet sings, too great for mortals less than kings. Chloe, when on thy breast I lie, observes me with revengeful eye. If Chloe or thy heart prevails, she'll tear me with her desperate nails, and with relentless hands destroy the tender pledges of our joy. Nor have I bred a spurious race 
they all were born from thy embrace. Consider, Strephon, what you do, for should I die for love of you, I'll haunt thy dreams a bloodless ghost, and all my kin a numerous host, who down direct our lineage bring, from victors o'er the Memphian king, renowned in sieges and campaigns, who never fled the bloody plains, who in tempestuous seas can sport, and scorn the pleasures of a court, from whom great Scylla found his doom, who scorched to death that scourge of Rome, shall on thee take a vengeance dire, thou like Alcides shalt expire, when his envenomed shirt he wore, and skin and flesh in pieces tore. Nor less that shirt my rival's gift, cut from the piece that made her shift, shall in thy dearest blood be dyed, and make thee tear thy tainted hide. End of section 22section 23 of the poems of jonathan swift volume 2 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org a maypole 1725 deprived of root and branch and rind yet flowers i bear of every kind and such is my prolific power they bloom in less than half an hour Yet standers by may plainly see they get no nourishment from me. My head with giddiness goes round, and yet I firmly stand my ground. All over naked I am seen, and painted like an Indian queen. No couple beggar in the land e'er joined such numbers hand in hand. I joined them fairly with a ring, nor can our parson blame the thing. And though no marriage words are spoke, they part not till the ring is broke. Yet hypocrite fanatics cry, I'm but an idol raised on high. And once a weaver in our town, a damned Cromwellian, knocked me down. I lay a prisoner twenty years, and then the jovial cavaliers, to their old post, restored all three, I mean the church, the king, and me. On the Moon I with borrowed silver shine, what you see is none of mine. First I show you but a quarter, like the bow that guards the tartar, then the half and then the whole, ever dancing round the pole. What will raise your admiration, I am not one of God's creation, but sprung, and I this truth maintain, like Pallas from my father's brain. And after all I chiefly owe, my beauty to the shades below. Most wondrous forms you see me wear, a man, a woman, lion, bear, a fish, a fowl, a cloud, a field, all figures heaven or earth can yield. Like Daphne, sometimes in a tree, yet am not one of all you see. On a Circle I'm up and down and round about, Yet all the world can't find me out. Though hundreds have employed their leisure, They never yet could find my measure. I'm found almost in every garden, Nay, in the compass of a farthing. There's neither chariot, coach, nor mill Can move an inch, except I will. On Ink I am jet black, as you may see, The sun of pitch and gloomy night, Yet all that know me will agree, I'm dead except I live in light. Sometimes in panegyric high, like lofty Pindar, I can soar, and raise a virgin to the sky, or sink her to a pocky whore. My blood this day is very sweet, tomorrow of a bitter juice, like milk tis cried about the street, and so applied to different use. Most wondrous is my magic power, for with one colour I can paint, I'll make the devil a saint this hour, next make a devil of a saint. Through distant regions I can fly, provide me but with paper wings, and fairly show a reason why there should be quarrels among kings. And after all, you'll think it odd, when learned doctors will dispute, that I should point the word of God, and show where they can best confute. 
Let lawyers bawl and strain their throats, Tis I that must the lands convey, And strip their clients to their coats, Nay, give their very souls away. End of section 23section 24 of the poems of jonathan swift volume 2 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org on the five senses all of us in one you'll find brethren of a wondrous kind yet among us all no brother knows one tittle of the other we in frequent councils are, and our marks of things declare, where, to us unknown, a clerk sits and takes them in the dark. He's the register of all, in our ken, both great and small. By us forms his laws and rules, he's our master, we his tools. Yet we can with greatest ease turn and wind him where we please. One of us alone can sleep, yet no watch the rest will keep. But the moment that he closes, every brother else reposes. If wine's brought or victuals dressed, one enjoys them for the rest. Pierce us all with wounding steel, one for all of us will feel. Though ten thousand cannons roar, add to them ten thousand more, yet but one of us is found who regards the dreadful sound. Do what is not fit to tell, there's but one of us can smell. End of section 24. Section 25 of The Poems of Jonathan Swift, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Fontanella to Florinda when on my bosom thy bright eyes, Florinda, dart their heavenly beams, I feel not the least love's surprise, Yet endless tears flow down in streams. There's naught so beautiful in thee, But you may find the same in me. The lilies of thy skin compare, In me you see them full as white. The roses of your cheeks, I dare, A firm can't glow to more delight. Then since I show as fine a face, Can you refuse a soft embrace? Ah, lovely nymph, thou'rt in thy prime, And so am I while thou art here, But soon will come the fatal time When all we see shall disappear. Tis mine to make a just reflection, And yours to follow my direction. Then catch admirers while you may, Treat not your lovers with disdain, for time with beauty flies away, And there is no return again. To you the sad account I bring, Life's autumn has no second spring. End of section 25 Section 26 Of The Poems of Jonathan Swift, Volume 2 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. An Echo Never sleeping, still awake, Pleasing most when most I spake, The delight of old and young, Though I speak without a tongue. Not but one thing can confound me, Many voices joining round me, Then I fret and rave and gabble Like the laborers of Babel. Now I am a dog or cow, I can bark or I can low, I can bleat or I can sing, Like the warblers of the spring. Let the lovesick bard complain, And I mourn the cruel pain. Let the happy swain rejoice, And I join my helping voice. Both are welcome, grief or joy, I with either sport and toy. Though a lady, I am stout, Drums and trumpets bring me out. Then I clash and roar and rattle, Join in all the din of battle. Jove with all his loudest thunder, When I'm vexed, can't keep me under. Yet so tender is my ear, That the lowest voice I fear. Much I dread the courtier's fate, 
when his merit's out of date. For I hate a silent breath, and a whisper is my death. On a Shadow in a Glass By something formed I nothing am, yet everything that you can name. In no place have I ever been, yet everywhere I may be seen. In all things false, yet always true, I'm still the same, but ever new. Lifeless life's perfect form I wear, Can show a nose, eye, tongue, or ear, Yet neither smell, see, taste, or hear. All shapes and features I can boast, No flesh, no bones, no blood, no ghost. All colors without paint put on, And change like the chameleon. Swiftly I come and enter there, Where not a chink lets in the air. Like thought I'm in a moment gone, Nor can I ever be alone. All things on earth I imitate, Faster than nature can create. Sometimes imperial robes I wear, Anon in beggar's rags appear. A giant now and straight an elf, I'm every one but near myself. Near sad I mourn, near glad rejoice, I move my lips but want a voice. I ne'er was born, nor ear can die, Then prithee tell me, what am I? Most things by me do rise and fall, And as I please they're great and small. Invading foes without resistance, With ease I make to keep their distance. Again, as I'm disposed, the foe Will come, though not a foot they go. Both mountains, woods, and hills, and rocks, And gamesome goats, and fleecy flocks, And lowing herds, and piping swains, Come dancing to me o'er the plains. The greatest whale that swims the sea Does instantly my power obey. In vain from me the sailor flies, the quickest ship I can surprise, And turn it as I have a mind, And move it against tide and wind. Nay, bring me here the tallest man, I'll squeeze him to a little span. Or bring a tender child and pliant, You'll see me stretch him to a giant. Nor shall they in the least complain, Because my magic gives no pain. On time. Ever eating, never cloying, all devouring, all destroying, never finding full repast till I eat the world at last. On the gallows. There is a gate we know full well that stands twixt heaven and earth and hell, where many for a passage venture, yet very few are fond to enter. Although tis open night and day, They for that reason shun this way. Both dukes and lords abhor its wood, They can't come near it for their blood. What other way they take to go, Another time I'll let you know. Yet commoners with greatest ease Can find an entrance when they please. The poorest hither march in state, Or they can never pass the gate. Like Roman generals triumphant, And then they take their turn and jump on't. If gravest parsons here advance, They cannot pass before they dance. There is not a soul that does resort here, But strips himself to pay the porter. On the Vowels We are little airy creatures, All of different voice and features. One of us in glass is set, One of us you'll find in jet. T'other you may see in tin, and the fourth a box within. If the fifth you should pursue, it can never fly from you. On Snow From heaven I fall, though from earth I begin. No lady alive can show such a skin. I'm bright as an angel and light as a feather, but heavy and dark when you squeeze me together. Though candor and truth in my aspect I bear, Yet many poor creatures I help to ensnare. Though so much of heaven appears in my make, The foulest impressions I easily take. 
My parent and I produce one another, the mother, the daughter, the daughter, the mother. On a Canon Begotten and born and dying with noise, the terror of woman and pleasure of boys, like the fiction of poets concerning the wind, I'm chiefly unruly when strongest confined. For silver and gold I don't trouble my head, but all I delight in is pieces of lead. Except when I trade with a ship or a town, why then I make pieces of iron go down. One property more I would have you remark, no lady was ever more fond of a spark. The moment I get one, my soul's all afire, and I roar out my joy, and in transport expire. On a pair of dice. We are little brethren twain, arbiters of loss and gain. Many to our counters run, some are made and some undone, but men find it to their cost, few are made but numbers lost. Though we play them tricks for ever, yet they always hope our favour. On a Candle to Lady Carteret Of all inhabitants on earth, to man alone I owe my birth, and yet the cow, the sheep, the bee, are all my parents more than he. I, a virtue strange and rare, make the fairest look more fair, and myself, which yet is rarer, growing old, grow still the fairer. Like sots alone I'm dull enough, when dosed with smoke and smeared with snuff. But in the midst of mirth and wine I with double lustre shine. Emblem of the fair am I, polished neck and radiant eye, in my eye my greatest grace, emblem of the cyclops race. Metals I like them subdue, slave like them to Vulcan too, emblem of a monarch old, wise and glorious to behold. Wasted he appears, and pale, watching for the public wail, emblem of the bashful dame, that in secret feeds her flame, often aiding to impart all the secrets of her heart. Various is my bulk and hue, big like Bess and small like Sue, now brown and burnished like a nut, at other times a very slut, often fair and soft and tender, taper tall and smooth and slender. Like Flora decked with various flowers, like Phoebus guardian of the hours. But whatever be my dress, greater be my size or less, swelling be my shape or small, like thyself I shine in all. Clouded if my face is seen, my complexion wan and green, languid like a love sick maid, still affords me present aid. Soon or late my date is done, as my thread of life is spun. Yet to cut the fatal thread oft revives my drooping head. Yet I perish in my prime, seldom by the death of time. Die like lovers as they gaze, die for those I live to place. Pine unpitied to my urn, nor warm the fair for whom I burn. Unpitied, unlamented too, die like all that look on you. End of section 26《Section 27 of The Poems of Jonathan Swift, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. To Lady Carteret by Dr. Delaney I reach all things near me and far off to boot, without stretching a finger or stirring a foot. I take them all in too, to add to your wonder though many and various and large and asunder. Without jostling or crowding, they pass side by side through a wonderful wicket not half an inch wide. Then I lodge them at ease in a very large store of no breadth or length with a thousand things more. All this I can do without witchcraft or charm, though sometimes they say I bewitch and do harm. Though cold I inflame and though quiet invade, and nothing can shield from my spell but a shade. A thief that has robbed you or done you disgrace, in magical mirror I'll show you his face. Nay, if you believe what the poets have said, they'll tell you I kill and can call back the dead. Like conjurers safe in my circle I dwell, I love to look black to, it heightens my spell. 
Though my magic is mighty in every hue, Who see all my power must see it in you. Answered by Dr. Swift With half an eye your riddle I spy, I observe your wicket hemmed in by a thicket, And whatever passes is strained through glasses. You say it is quiet, I flatly deny it, It wanders about without stirring out, No passion so weak but gives it a tweak. Love, joy, and devotion set it always in motion, And as for tri-tragic effects of its magic, which you say it can kill or revive at its will, the dead are all sound and they live above ground. After all you have writ, it cannot be wit, which plainly does follow since it flies from Apollo. Its cowardice such it cries at a touch. Tis a perfect milk sop grows drunk with a drop. Another great fault, it cannot bear salt, and a hare can disarm it of every charm. To Lady Carteret by Dr. Swift From India's burning clime I'm brought, With cooling gales like zephyrs fraught. Not Iris, when she paints the sky, Can show more different hues than I. Nor can she change her form so fast, I'm now a sail, and now a mast. I here am red, and there am green, A beggar there, and here a queen. I sometimes live in house of hair, And oft in hand of lady fair. I please the young, I grace the old, and am at once both hot and cold. Say what I am then, if you can, and find the rhyme, and you're the man. Answered by Dr. Sheridan Your house of hair and lady's hand at first did put me to a stand. I have it now, tis plain enough, your hairy business is a muff. Your engine fraught with cooling gales, at once so like your masts and sails. Your thing of various shape and hue, must be some painted toy I knew. And for the rhyme to your the man, what fits it better than a fan? A Riddle I'm wealthy and poor, I'm empty and full, I'm humble and proud, I'm witty and dull. I'm foul and yet fair, I'm old and yet young, I lie with mole care and toast Mrs. Long. Answer by Mr. F. R. In rigging he's rich, though in pocket he's poor, He cringes to courtiers and cocks to the kits, Like twenty he dresses but looks like three score, He's a wit to the fools and a fool to the wits. Of wisdom he's empty but full of consate, He paints and perfumes while he rots with the scab, Tis a beau you may swear by his sense and his gait. He boasts of a beauty and lies with a drab. End of section 27。section 28 of the poems of Jonathan Swift, volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. On Cutting Down the Thorn at Market Hill, 1727 At Market Hill, as well appears, by chronicle of ancient date, there stood for many hundred years a spacious thorn before the gate. Hither came every village maid, and on the boughs her garland hung, and here beneath the spreading shade, secure from satyrs, sat and sung. Sir Archibald, that valorous knight, the lord of all the fruitful plain, would come to listen with delight, for he was fond of rural strain. Sir Archibald, whose favourite name shall stand for ages on record, by Scottish bards of highest fame, wise Hawthorne Den and Stirling's lord. But time with iron teeth, I ween, has cankered all its branches round. No fruit or blossom to be seen, its head reclining toward the ground. This aged, sickly, sapless thorn, which must, alas, no longer stand, Behold the cruel dean in scorn, cuts down with sacrilegious hand. Dame Nature, when she saw the blow, astonished, gave a dreadful shriek, And Mother Tellus trembled so, she scarce recovered in a week. The sylvan powers, with fear perplexed, in prudence and compassion sent, For none could tell whose turn was next, Sad omens of the dire event. 
The magpie, lighting on the stalk, Stood chattering with incessant din, And with her beak gave many a knock, To rouse and warn the nymph within. The owl foresaw, in pensive mood, The ruin of her ancient seat, And fled in haste with all her brood, To seek a more secure retreat. Last trotted forth the gentle swine, To ease her itch against the stump, And dismally was heard to whine, all as she scrubbed her measly rump. The nymph who dwells in every tree, if all be true that poets chant, condemned by fate's supreme decree, must die with her expiring plant. Thus when the gentle spinifound, the thorn committed to her care, received its last and deadly wound, she fled and vanished into air. But from the root a dismal groan first issuing struck the murderer's ears, and in a shrill revengeful tone this prophecy he trembling hears. Thou chief contriver of my fall, relentless dean to mischief born, my kindred oft thine hide shall gall, thy gown and cassock oft be torn. And thy confederate dame who brags that she condemned me to the fire, shall rend her petticoats to rags, and wound her legs with every briar. Nor thou, Lord Arthur, shall escape, to thee I often called in vain, against that assassin in crape, yet thou couldst tamely see me slain. Nor when I felt the dreadful blow, or chid the dean, or pinched thy spouse, since you could see me treated so, an old retainer to your house. May that fell dean, by whose command was formed this Machiavellian plot, not leave a thistle on thy land, then who will own thee for a Scot? Pigs and fanatics, cows and teagues, through all my empire I foresee, to tear thy hedges, join in leagues, sworn to revenge my thorn and me. And thou, the wretch ordained by fate, Neil Gahan, Hiberian clown, with hatchet blunter than thy pate, to hack my hallowed timber down. When thou, suspended high in air, diest on a more ignoble tree, for thou shalt steal thy landlord's mare, then bloody caitiff, think on me. End of section 28。section 29 of The Poems of Jonathan Swift, volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Dean Swift at Sir Arthur Atchison's in the north of Ireland. The Dean would visit Market Hill. Our invitation was but slight. I said, why let him, if he will? And so I bade Sir Arthur write. His manners would not let him wait lest we should think ourselves neglected, and so we see him at our gate, three days before he was expected. After a week, a month, a quarter, and day succeeding after day, says not a word of his departure, though not a soul would have him stay. I've said enough to make him blush, methinks, or else the devil's int, but he cares not for it a rush, nor for my life will take the hint. But you, my dear, may let him know, in civil language, if he stays, how deep and foul the roads may grow, and that he may command the chaise. Or you may say, my wife intends, though I should be exceeding proud, this winter to invite some friends, and, sir, I know you hate a crowd. Or, Mr. Dean, I should, with joy, beg you would here continue still, but we must go to Agnicloy, or Mr. Moore will take it ill. The house accounts are daily rising, so much his stay doth swell the bills. My dearest life, it is surprising, how much he eats, how much he swills. His brace of puppies, how they stuff, and they must have three meals a day, yet never think they get enough, his horses too eat all our hay. Oh, if I could, how I would maul his tallow face and wainscot paws, his beetle brows and eyes of wall, and make him soon give up the cause. Must I be every moment chid with skinny bonia, snipe and lean? Oh, that I could but once be rid of this insulting tyrant, Dean.
End of section 29. Section 30 of The Poems of Jonathan Swift, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. On a Very Old Glass at Market Hill Frail glass, thou mortal, art as well as I, Though none can tell which of us first shall die. Answered extempore by Dr. Swift we both are mortal, but thou, frailer creature, mayst die like me, by chance, but not by nature. Epitaph in Berkeley Churchyard, Gloucestershire Here lies the Earl of Suffolk's fool, men called him Dicky Pierce. His folly served to make folks laugh when wit and mirth were scarce. Poor Dick, alas, is dead and gone. What signifies to cry? The keys enough are still behind to laugh at by and by. Buried June 18, 1728, aged 63. End of section 30. Section 31 of The Poems of Jonathan Swift, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. My Lady's Lamentation and Complaint Against the Dean July 28, 1728 Sure never did man see a wretch like poor Nancy, So teased day and night by a dean and a knight. To punish my sins, Sir Arthur begins, And gives me a wipe with skinny and snipe. His malice is plain, hallooing the Dane. The Dane never stops when he opens his chops. I'm quite overrun with rebus and pun. Before he came here to sponge for good cheer, I sat with delight from morning till night. With two bony thumbs could rub my old gums, or scratching my nose and jogging my toes. But at present, forsooth, I must not rub a tooth. When my elbows he sees, held up by my knees, my arms like two props, supporting my chops, and just as I handle em, moving all like a pendulum, he trips up my props, and down my chin drops, from my head to my heels, like a clock without wheels. I sink in the spleen, a useless machine. If he had his will, I should never sit still, he comes with his whims, I must move my limbs. I cannot be sweet without using my feet. To lengthen my breath, he tires me to death by the worst of all squires through bogs and through briars. Where a cow would be startled, I'm in spite of my heart led, and say what I will, halt up every hill, till daggled and tattered, my spirits quite shattered. I return home at night and fast out of spite. For I'd rather be dead than at ear should be said, I was better for him in stomach or limb. But now to my diet, no eating in quiet, he's still finding fault, too sour or too salt. The wing of a chick I hardly can pick, but trash without measure I swallow with pleasure. Next for his diversion he rails at my person. What court breeding this is, he takes me to pieces. From shoulder to flank I'm lean and I'm lank. My nose long and thin grows down to my chin. My chin will not stay, but meets it half way. My fingers prolix are ten crooked sticks. He swears by my elbows are two iron crows, or sharp pointed rocks and wear out my smocks. To scape them, Sir Arthur is forced to lie farther, or his sides they would gore like the tusks of a boar. Now changing the scene, but still to the dean, he loves to be bitter at a lady illiterate. If he sees her but once, he'll swear she's a dunce, can tell by her looks a hater of books. Through each line of her face her folly can trace, which spoils every feature bestowed her by nature. But sense gives a grace to the homeliest face. Wise books and reflection will mend the complexion, a civil divine, I suppose, meaning mine. 
No lady who wants them can ever be handsome. I guess well enough what he means by this stuff. He haws and he hums, at last out it comes. What, madam, no walking, no reading, nor talking? You're now in your prime, make use of your time. Consider before you come to three score how the hussies will fleer where'er you appear. That silly old puss would fain be like us. What a figure she made in her tarnished brocade. And then he grows mild. Come, be a good child. If you are inclined to polish your mind, be adored by the men till threescore and ten, and kill with the spleen the jades of sixteen. I'll show you the way. Read six hours a day. The wits will frequent ye and think you but twenty. To make you learn faster, I'll be your schoolmaster, and leave you to choose the books you peruse. Thus was I drawn in, forgive me my sin, at breakfast he'll ask an account of my task. Put a word out of joint, or miss but a point, he rages and frets, his manners forgets. And as I am serious, is very imperious. No book for delight must come in my sight, but instead of new plays, dull Bacon's essays, and pour every day on that nasty Pantheon. If I be not a drudge, let all the world judge. T'were better be blind than thus be confined, but while in an ill tone I murder poor Milton. The dean, you will swear, is at study or prayer. He's all the day sauntering with labourers bantering, among his colleagues a parcel of teagues whom he brings in among us and bribes with mundungus. He little believes how they laugh in their sleeves. Hail fellow well met, all dirty and wet, find out, if you can, who's master, who's man, who makes the best figure, the dean or the digger, and which is the best at cracking a jest. Now see how he sits, perplexing his wits, in search of a motto to fix on his grotto. How proudly he talks of zigzags and walks, and all the day raves of cradles and caves, and boasts of his feats, his grottos and seats, shows all his gewgaws and gapes for applause. A fine occupation for one in his station, a hole where a rabbit would scorn to inhabit, dug out in an hour he calls it a bower. But oh, how we laugh to see a wild calf come driven by heat and foul the green seat, or run helter-skelter to his arbour for shelter, where all goes to ruin the dean has been doing. The girls of the village come flocking for pillage, pull down the fine briars and thorns to make fires, but yet are so kind to leave something behind. No more need be said on't, I smell when I tread on't. Dear friend, Dr. Jinny, if I could but win ye, or Walmsley, or Whaley, to come hither daily, since fortune, my foe, will need have it so, that I'm, by her frowns, condemned to black gowns. No squire to be found, the neighbourhood round, for under the rose I would rather choose those. If your wives will permit ye, come here out of pity, to ease a poor lady, and beg her a play-day. So may you be seen no more in the spleen, may Walmsley give wine like a hearty divine, may Whaley disgrace dull Daniel's wayface, and may your three spouses let you lie at friends' houses. End of section 31section 32 of the poems of jonathan swift volume 2 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org a pastoral dialogue 1728 dermot sheila a nymph and swain sheila and dermot hight who want to weed the court of gosford knight while each with stubbed knife removed the roots, that raised between the stones their daily shoots, as at their work they sate in counter-view, with mutual beauty smit their passion grew. Sing, heavenly muse, in sweetly flowing strain, 
the soft endearments of the nymph and swain. Dermot My love to Sheila is more firmly fixed than strongest weeds that grow those stones betwixt. My spud these nettles from the stones can part, no knife so keen to weed thee from my heart. Sheila My love for gentle Dermot faster grows than yon tall dock that rises to thy nose. Cut down the dock, twill sprout again, but, oh, love rooted out, again will never grow. Dermot No more that briar thy tender leg shall rake. I spare the thistles for Sir Arthur's sake. Sharp are the stones, take thou this rushy mat. The hardest bum will bruise with sitting squat. Sheila Thy breeches torn behind stand gaping wide. This petticoat shall save thy dear backside. Nor need I blush, although you feel it wet. Dermot, I vow, tis nothing else but sweat. Dermot At an old stubborn root I chanced to tug, When the dean threw me this tobacco plug. A longer haporth never did I see. This, dearest Sheila, thou shalt share with me. Sheila In at the pantry door this morn I slipped, And from the shelf a charming crust I whipped. Dennis was out, and I got hither Seth, And thou, my dear, shall have the bigger hef. Dermot When you saw Tady at Long Bullet's play, you Satan loused him all a sunshine day. How could you, Sheila, listen to his tales, Or crack such lice as his between your nails? Sheila When you with Una stood behind a ditch, I peeped and saw you kiss the dirty bitch. Dermot, how could you touch these nasty sluts? I almost wished this spud were in your guts. Dermot If Una once I kissed, forbear to chide. Her aunt's my gossip by my father's side. But if I ever touch her lips again, May I be doomed for life to weed in rain. Sheila Dermot, I swear, though Tady's locks could hold, Ten thousand lice, and every louse was gold. Him on my lap you never more shall see, Or may I lose my weeding knife and thee. Dermot, oh, could I earn for thee, my lovely lass, A pair of brogues to bear thee dry to mass. But see where Nora with the sowins comes, Then let us rise and rest our weary bums. End of section 32. Section 33 of The Poems of Jonathan Swift, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Grand Question Debated Whether Hamilton's Bond Should Be Turned Into a Barrack or Malt House, 1729 Thus spoke to my lady the knight full of care, Let me have your advice in a weighty affair. This Hamilton's Bond, while it sticks in my hand, I lose by the house what I get by the land. But how to dispose of it to the best bidder, for a barrack or malt-house we now must consider. First let me suppose I make it a malt-house. Here I have computed the profit will fault us. There's nine hundred pounds for labour and grain. I increase it to twelve, so three hundred remain. A handsome addition for wine and good cheer. Three dishes a day and three hogsheads a year. With a dozen large vessels my vault shall be stored. No little scrub joint shall come on my board. And you and the dean no more shall combine 
to stint me at night to one bottle of wine. Nor shall I, for his humour, permit you to purloin a stone and a quarter of beef from my sirloin. If I make it a barrack, the crown is my tenant. My dear, I have pondered again and again on't. In poundage and drawbacks I lose half my rent. Whatever they give me, I must be content, or join with the court in every debate, and rather than that I would lose my estate. Thus ended the night, thus began his meek wife. It must and it shall be a barrack my life. I'm grown a mere mopus, no company comes, but a rabble of tenants and rusty dull rums. With parsons what lady can keep herself clean? I'm all over daubed when I sit by the dean. But if you will give us a barrack, my dear, the captain, I'm sure, will always come here. I then shall not value his deanship a straw, for the captain, I warrant, will keep him in awe. Or should he pretend to be brisk and alert, we'll tell him that chaplains should not be so pert, that men of his coat should be minding their prayers, and not among ladies to give themselves airs. Thus argued my lady, but argued in vain, the knight his opinion resolved to maintain. But Hannah, who listened to all that was past, and could not endure so vulgar a task, as soon as her ladyship called to be dressed, cried, Madam, why surely my master's possessed. Sir Arthur the Molster, how fine it will sound! I'd rather the bond were sunk underground. But, Madam, I guessed there would never come good when I saw him so often with Darby and Wood. And now my dream's out, for I was a-dreamed that I saw a huge rat. Oh, dear, how I screamed! And after, methought, I had lost my new shoes, and Molly, she said, I should hear some ill news. Dear madam, had you but the spirit to tease, you might have a barrack whenever you please, and madam, I always believed you so stout, that for twenty denials you would not give out. If I had a husband like him, I protest, till he gave me my will, I would give him no rest, and rather than come in the same pair of sheets, with such a cross man I would lie in the streets. But, madam, I beg you, contrive and invent, and worry him out till he gives his consent. Dear madam, when e'er of a barrack I think, and I were to be hanged, I can't sleep a wink. For if a new crotchet comes into my brain, I can't get it out, though I'd never so fain. I fancy already a barrack contrived, at Hamilton's bond, and the troop is arrived. Of this, to be sure, Sir Arthur has warning, and waits on the captain betimes the next morning. Now see when they meet how their honours behave. Noble captain, your servant, Sir Arthur, your slave. You honour me much, the honour is mine. T'was a sad rainy night, but the morning is fine. Pray out is my lady, my wife's at your service. I think I have seen her picture by Jervis. Good morrow, good captain, I'll wait on you down. You shan't stir a foot, you'll think me a clown. For all the world, captain, not half an inch farther, you must be obeyed, your servant, Sir Arthur. My humble respects to the lady unknown, I hope you will use my house as your own. Go bring me my smock, and leave off your prate. Thou hast certainly gotten a cup in thy pate. Pray, madam, be quiet. What was it, I said? You had like to have put it quite out of my head. Next day, to be sure, the captain will come, at the head of his troop, with trumpet and drum. Now, madam, observe how he marches in state. The man with the kettle drum enters the gate. Dub, dub, a dub, dub, the trumpeters follow, tantara, tantara, while all the boys holla. See, now comes the captain, all daubed with gold lace. Oh, la, the sweet gentleman, look in his face. And see how he rides like a lord of the land, with the fine flaming sword that he holds in his hand. And his horse, the dear cutter, it prances and rears, with ribbons in knots at its tails and its ears. At last comes the troop, by word of command, drawn up in our court, when the captain cries, Stand! 
Your ladyship lifts up the sash to be seen, For sure I dizen you out like a queen. The captain, to show he is proud of the favour, Looks up to your window and cocks up his beaver. His beaver is cocked, pray madam, mark that, For a captain of horse never takes off his hat, Because he has never a hand that is idle, For the right holds the sword and the left holds the bridle. Then flourishes thrice his sword in the air, As a compliment due to a lady so fair. How I tremble to think of the blood it is spilt, then he lowers down the point and kisses the hilt. Your ladyship smiles, and thus you begin. Pray, captain, be pleased to alight and walk in. The captain salutes you with congee profound, and your ladyship curtsies halfway to the ground. Kit, run to your master and bid him come to us. I'm sure he'll be proud of the honour you do us. And, Captain, you'll do us the favour to stay, And take a short dinner ere with us to-day. You're heartily welcome, but as for good cheer, You come in the very worst time of the year. If I had expected so worthy a guest, Lord, Madam, your ladyship sure is in jest. You banter me, Madam, the kingdom must grant. You officers, Captain, are so complacent. Hist, hussy, I think I hear somebody coming. No, madam, tis only Sir Arthur a humming. To shorten my tale, for I ate a long story, the captain at dinner appears in his glory. The dean and the doctor have humbled their pride, for the captain's entreated to sit by your side. And because he's their betters, you carve for him first. The parsons for envy are ready to burst. The servants, amazed, are scarce ever able to keep off their eyes as they wait at the table. And Molly and I have thrust in our nose to peep at the captain in all his fine clothes. Dear madam, be sure he's a fine-spoken man. Do but ear on the clergy how glib his tongue ran. And madam, says he, if such dinners you give, you'll ne'er want for parsons as long as you live. I ne'er knew a parson without a good nose, but the devil's as welcome wherever he goes. God damn me, they bid us reform and repent, but zounds by their looks they never keep lent. Mr. Curate, for all your grave looks, I'm afraid, you cast a sheep's eye on her ladyship's maid. I wish she would lend you her pretty white hand in mending your cassock and smoothing your band, for the dean was so shabby and looked like a ninny that the captain supposed he was curate to Ginny. Whenever you see a cassock and gown, a hundred to one, but it covers a clown. Observe how a parson comes into a room. God damn me, he obbles as bad as my groom. A scholard, when just from his college broke loose, can hardly tell how to cry boo to a goose. Your novits and blue turks and almers and stuff, by God, they don't signify this pinch of snuff. To give a young gentleman right education, the army's the only good school in the nation. My schoolmaster called me a dunce and a fool, but at cuffs I was always the cock of the school. I never could take to my book for the blood of me, and the puppy confessed he expected no good of me. He caught me one morning coquetting his wife, but he mauled me I ne'er was so mauled in my life. So I took to the road, and what's very odd, the first man I robbed was a parson, by God. Now, madam, you'll think it a strange thing to say, but the sight of a book makes me sick to this day. Never since I was born did I hear so much wit, and, madam, I laughed till I thought I should split. So then you looked scornful and sniffed at the Dane, as who should say, Now, am I skinny and lean? But he durst not so much as once open his lips, and the doctor was plaguily down in the hips. Thus merciless Hannah ran on in her talk, till she heard the dean call, Will your ladyship walk? Her ladyship answers, I'm just coming down. Then turning to Hannah and forcing a frown, although it was plain in her heart she was glad, cried, Hussy, why sure, the wench is gone mad. How could these chimeras get into your brains? Come hither, and take this old gown for your pains. But the dean, if this secret should come to his ears, will never have done with his jibes and his jeers. 
for your life not a word of the matter, I charge ye. Give me but a barrack, a fig for the clergy. End of section 33《Section 34 of The Poems of Jonathan Swift, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Drapier's Hill, 1730 We give the world to understand our thriving dean has purchased land, a purchase which will bring him clear above his rent four pounds a year. Provided to improve the ground, he will but add two hundred pound, and from his endless hoarded store to build a house five hundred more. Sir Arthur, too, shall have his will, and call the mansion Drapier's Hill. That, when a nation, long enslaved, forgets by whom it once was saved, when none the Drapier's praise shall sing, his signs aloft no longer swing, his medals and his prints forgotten, and all his handkerchiefs are rotten. His famous letters made waste paper, this hill may keep the name of Drapier. In spite of envy, flourish still, and Drapier's vie with Cooper's Hill. End of section 34《Section 35 of The Poems of Jonathan Swift, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Dean's Reasons for Not Building at Drapier's Hill I will not build on yonder mount, and should you call me to account, consulting with myself I find it was no levity of mind. What e'er I promised or intended, no fault of mine, the scheme is ended. Nor can you tax me as unsteady, I have a hundred causes ready. All risen since that flattering time, when Drapier's Hill appeared in rhyme. I am, as now too late I find, the greatest cully of mankind. The lowest boy in Martin's school may turn and wind me like a fool. How could I form so wild a vision to seek in deserts fields Elysian, to live in fear, suspicion, variance, with thieves, fanatics, and barbarians? But here my lady will object, your deanship ought to recollect, that near the knight of Gosford placed, whom you allow a man of taste, your intervals of time to spend with so conversable a friend, it would not signify a pin, whatever climate you were in. "'Tis true, but what advantage comes to me from all a usurer's plums, though I should see him twice a day, and am his neighbours cross the way, if all my rhetoric must fail to strike him for a pot of ale? Thus when the learned and the wise conceal their talents from our eyes, and from deserving friends withhold their gifts as misers do their gold, their knowledge to themselves confined is the same avarice of mind.' nor makes their conversation better than if they never knew a letter. Such is the fate of Gosford's knight, who keeps his wisdom out of sight, whose uncommunicative heart will scarce one precious word impart. Still wrapped in speculations deep, his outward senses fast asleep, who, while I talk, a song will hum, or with his fingers beat the drum. Beyond the skies transports his mind, and leaves a lifeless corpse behind. But as for me, who ne'er could clamber high to understand Melbranche or Cambrai, who send my mind as I believe less than others do on errands sleeveless, can listen to a tale humdrum and with attention read Tom Thumb, my spirits with my body progging, both hand in hand together jogging, sunk over heads and ears in matter, nor can of metaphysics smatter, am more diverted with a quibble than dream of words intelligible, and think all notions too abstracted are like the ravings of a cracked head. What intercourse of minds can be betwixt the night sublime and me, if, when I talk, as talk I must, it is but prating to a bust? Where friendship is by fate designed, it forms a union in the mind, 
And here I differ from the knight In every point, like black and white; For none can say that ever yet We both in one opinion met, Not in philosophy or ale, In state affairs, or planting kale; In rhetoric, or picking straws, In roasting larks, or making laws; In public schemes, or catching flies; In parliaments, or pudding pies. The neighbours wonder why the knight Should in a country life delight, who not one pleasure entertains to cheer the solitary scenes. His guests are few, his visits rare, nor uses time, nor time will spare, nor rides, nor walks, nor hunts, nor fowls, nor plays at cards, or dice, or bowls, but seated in an easy chair despises exercise and air. His rural walks he ne'er adorns, here poor Pomona sits on thorns and there neglected Flora settles her bum upon a bed of nettles. Those thankless and officious cares I used to take in friends' affairs, from which I never could refrain, and have been often chid in vain. From these I am recovered quite, at least in what regards the night. Preserve his health, his store increase, may nothing interrupt his peace. But now let all his tenants round, first milk his cows, and after pound. Let every cottager conspire to cut his hedges down for fire. The naughty boys about the village his crabs and slows may freely pillage. He still may keep a pack of knaves to spoil his work and work by haves. His meadows may be dug by swine, it shall be no concern of mine. For why should I continue still to serve a friend? against his will. End of section 35。section 36。of the poems of Jonathan Swift, volume 2。this is a LibriVox recording. all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. for more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. the revolution at Market Hill, 1730. From distant regions fortune sends an odd triumvirate of friends, where Phoebus pays a scanty stipend, where never yet a codling ripened. Hither the frantic goddess draws three sufferers in a ruined cause. By faction banished, here unite a dean, a Spaniard, and a knight. Unite, but on conditions cruel, the dean and Spaniard find it too well. Condemned to live in service hard, on either side his honour's guard. The dean, to guard his honour's back, must build a castle at Drumlack. The Spaniard, sore against his will, must raise a fort at Market Hill. And thus the pair of humble gentry, at north and south, are posted sentry. While in his lordly castle fixed, the knight triumphant reigns betwixt. And what the wretches most resent, to be his slaves, must pay him rent. Attend him daily as their chief, decant his wine and carve his beef. O oh, fortune, tis a scandal for thee, to smile on those who are least worthy. Weigh but the merits of the three, his slaves have ten times more than he. Proud baronet of Nova Scotia, the dean and Spaniard must reproach ye. Of their two fames the world enough rings, where are thy services and sufferings? What if for nothing once you kissed Against the grain a monarch's fist? What if among the courtly tribe You lost a place and saved a bribe? And then in surly mood came here To fifteen hundred pounds a year, And fierce against the Whigs harangued, You never ventured to be hanged. How dare you treat your betters thus? Are you to be compared with us? Come, Spaniard, let us from our farms Call forth our cottagers to arms. Our forces let us both unite, attack the foe at left and right. From Market Hill's exalted head, full northward let your troops be led, while I from Drapier's mount descend, and to the south my squadrons bend. New river walk with friendly shade shall keep my host in ambuscade, while you from where the basin stands shall scale the rampart with your bands. Nor need we doubt the fort to win, I hold intelligence within. True, Lady Anne, no danger fears, brave as the Upton fan she wears. Then, lest upon our first attack her valiant arm should force us back, and we of all our hopes deprived, I have a stratagem contrived. 
By these embroider'd high heel shoes, She shall be caught as in a noose; So well contrived her toes to pinch, She'll not have power to stir an inch. These gaudy shoes must Hannah place Direct before her lady's face. The shoes put on, our faithful portress Admits us in to storm the fortress; While tortured madam bound remains, Like Montezum in golden chains; Or, like a cat with walnuts shod, Stumbling at every step she trod. Sly hunters thus in Borneo's isle, To catch a monkey by a while, The mimic animal amuse, They place before him gloves and shoes; Which, when the brute puts awkward on, All his agility is gone. In vain to frisk or climb he tries, The huntsman sees the grinning prize. But let us on our first assault Secure the larder and the vault. The valiant Dennis you must fix on, And I'll engage with Peggy Dixon. Then if we once can seize the key And chest that keeps my lady's tea, They must surrender at discretion, And soon as we have gained possession, We'll act as other conquerors do, Divide the realm between us two. Then, let me see, we'll make the knight our clerk, for he can read and write. But must not think, I tell him that, like Lorimer to wear his hat, yet when we dine without a friend, we'll place him at the lower end. Madame, whose skill does all in dress lie, may serve to wait on Mrs. Leslie. But lest it might not be so proper that her own maid should overtop her, to mortify the creature more, will make her heels five inches lower. For Hannah, when we have no need of her, twill be our interest to get rid of her, and when we execute our plot, tis best to hang her on the spot, as all your politicians wise dispatch the rogues by whom they rise. End of section 36《》Section 37 of The Poems of Jonathan Swift, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Robin and Harry, 1730. Robin to beggars with a curse throws the last shilling in his purse, and when the coachman comes for pay, the rogue must call another day. Grave Harry, when the poor are pressing, gives them a penny and God's blessing, but always careful of the main, with tuppence left, walks home in rain. Robin from noon to night will prate, run out in tongue as in estate, and ere a twelve-month and a day, will not have one new thing to say. Much talking is not Harry's vice, he need not tell a story twice. And if he always be so thrifty, his fund may last to five and fifty. It so fell out that cautious Harry, as soldiers use, for love must marry, and with his dame the ocean crossed, all for love or the world well lost, repairs a cabin gone to ruin, just big enough to shelter two in, and in his house, if anybody come, will make them welcome to his modicum. Where goody Julia milks the cows and boils potatoes for her spouse, or darns his hose or mends his breeches while Harry's fencing up his ditches. Robin, who near his mind could fix to live without a coach and six, to patch his broken fortunes found a mistress worth five thousand pound, swears he could get her in an hour if Gaffer Harry would endow her and sell to pacify his wrath a birthright for a mess of broth. Young Harry, as all Europe knows, was long the quintessence of bows, but when espoused he ran the fate that must attend the married state. From gold brocade and shining armour was metamorphosed to a farmer. His grazier's coat with dirt besmeared, nor twice a week will shave his beard. Old Robin, all his youth a sloven, at fifty-two when he grew loving, Clad in a coat of Padua soy, a flaxen wig and waistcoat gay, powdered from shoulder down to flank, in courtly style addresses Frank. Twice ten years older than his wife, is doomed to be a beau for life, supplying those defects by dress which I must leave the world to guess. End of section thirty seven.
Section 38 of The Poems of Jonathan Swift, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Panegyric on the Dean In the Person of a Lady in the North, 1730. Resolved my gratitude to show, Thrice reverend Dean, for all I owe, Too long I have my thanks delayed, Your favours left too long unpaid. But now, in all our sex's name, My artless muse shall sing your fame. Indulgent you to female kind, To all their weaker sides are blind. Nine more such champions as the Dean Would soon restore our ancient reign, how well to win the ladies' hearts, you celebrate their wit and parts. How have I felt my spirits raised by you so oft, so highly praised, transformed by your convincing tongue to witty, beautiful, and young. I hope to quit that awkward shame affected by each vulgar dame, to modesty a weak pretense, and soon grow pert on men of sense. To show my face with scornful air, Let others match it if they dare. Impatient to be out of debt, O oh, may I never once forget, The bard who humbly deigns to choose Me for the subject of his muse. Behind my back, before my nose, He sounds my praise in verse and prose. My heart with emulation burns To make you suitable returns. My gratitude the world shall know, And see the printer's boy below. Ye hawkers, all your voices lift, A panegyric on Dean Swift. And then, to mend the matter still, By Lady Anne of Market Hill. I thus begin, my grateful muse, Salutes the Dean in different views. Dean, butler, usher, jester, tutor, Robert and Darby's coadjutor. And as you in commission sit, To rule the dairy next to Kit, In each capacity I mean To sing your praise, and first as Dean. And we must own you understand your Precedence and support your grandeur, Nor of your rank will bait an ace, Except to give Dean Daniel place. In you such dignity appears, So suited to your state and years. With ladies what a strict decorum, with what devotion you adore him. Treat me with so much complaisance as fits a princess in romance. By your examples and assistance, the fellows learn to know their distance. Sir Arthur, since you set the pattern, no longer calls me snipe and slattern, nor dares he, though he were a duke, offend me with the least rebuke. Proceed we to your preaching next. How nice you split the hardest text! How your superior learning shines Above our neighbouring dull divines. At beggar's opera, not so full pit, Is seen as when you mount our pulpit. Consider now your conversation, Regardful of your age and station. You ne'er were known by passion stirred To give the least offensive word. But still, whene'er you silence break, Watch every syllable you spake. Your style so clear and so concise, We never ask to hear you twice. But then a parson so genteel, So nicely clad from head to heel, So fine a gown, a band so clean, As well become St. Patrick's Dean. Such reverential awe express, That cowboys know you by your dress. Then, if our neighbouring friends come here, How proud are we when you appear! with such a dress and graceful port, as clearly shows you bred at court. Now raise your spirits, Mr. Dean, I lead you to a nobler scene. When to the vault you walk in state, in quality of butler's mate, you next to Dennis bear the sway, to you we often trust the key, nor can he judge with all his art so well what bottle holds a quart, what pints may best for bottles pass, just to give every man his glass, when proper to produce the best, and what may serve a common guest. With Dennis you did near combine, not you to steal your master's wine, except a bottle, now and then, to welcome brother serving men. 
But that is with a good design, To drink Sir Arthur's health and mine, Your master's honour to maintain, And get the like returns again. Your usher's post must next be handled. How blest am I by such a man led, Under whose wise and careful guardship I now despise fatigue and hardship. Familiar grown to dirt and wet, Though draggled round I scorn to fret. From you my chamber damsels learn My broken hose to patch and darn. Now as a jester I accost you, Which never yet one friend has lost you. You judge so nicely to a hair How far to go and when to spare, By long experience grown so wise Of every taste to know the size. There's none so ignorant or weak To take offence at what you speak. Whene'er you joke, tis all a case, Whether with Dermot or his grace. With Teague o' Murphy or an earl, A duchess or a kitchen girl, with such dexterity you fit their several talents with your wit. That maul the chambermaid can smoke, and Gahahan take every joke. I now become your humble suitor, to let me praise you as my tutor. Poor I, a savage bred and born, by you instructed every morn, already have improved so well, that I have almost learned to spell. The neighbours who come here to dine admire to hear me speak so fine. How enviously the ladies look when they surprise me at my book! And sure as they're alive at night, as soon as gone will show their spite. Good Lord, what can my lady mean conversing with that rusty dean? She's grown so nice and so penurious with Socrates and Epicurus. How could she sit the lifelong day, yet never ask us once to play? But I admire your patience most, that when I'm duller than a post, nor can the plainest word pronounce, you neither fume, nor fret, nor flounce, are so indulgent and so mild, as if I were a darling child. So gentle is your whole proceeding, that I could spend my life in reading. You merit new employments daily, our Thatcher, Ditcher, Gardner, Bailey. And to a genius so extensive, no work is grievous or offensive. Whether your fruitful fancy lies to make for pigs convenient styes, or ponder long with anxious thought to banish rats that haunt our vault. Nor have you grumbled, reverend Dean, to keep our poultry sweet and clean. To sweep the mansion house they dwell in, And cure the rank unsavory smelling. Now enter as the dairy handmaid, Such charming butter never man made. Let others with fanatic face Talk of their milk for babes of grace. From tubs their snuffling nonsense utter, Thy milk shall make us tubs of butter. The bishop with his foot may burn it, But with his hand the dean can churn it. How are the servants overjoyed to see thy deanship thus employed? Instead of poring on a book, providing butter for the cook. Three morning hours you toss and shake the bottle till your fingers ache. Hard is the toil, nor small the art, the butter from the way to part. Behold a frothy substance rise, be cautious or your bottle flies. The butter comes, our fears are ceased, And out you squeeze an ounce at least. Your reverence thus, with like success, Nor is your skill or labour less, When bent upon some smart lampoon, Will toss and turn your brain till noon, Which in its jumblings round the skull Dilates and makes the vessel full. While nothing comes but froth at first, You think your giddy head will burst, but squeezing out four lines in rhyme are largely paid for all your time. But you have raised your generous mind to works of more exalted kind. Palladio was not half so skilled in the grandeur or the art of building. Two temples of magnific size attract the curious traveller's eyes. That might be envied by the Greeks, raised up by you in twenty weeks. Here gentle goddess Cloacine receives all offerings at her shrine. 
In separate cells the he's and she's Here pay their vows on bended knees. For 'tis profane when sexes mingle, And every nymph must enter single. And when she feels an inward motion, Come filled with reverence and devotion. The bashful maid, to hide her blush, Shall creep no more behind a bush. Here unobserved she boldly goes, As who should say, to pluck a rose. Ye who frequent this hallowed scene, Be not ungrateful to the dean. But duly, ere you leave your station, Offer to him a pure libation, Or of his own, or Smedley's lay, Or billet doux, or lock of hay. And, oh, may all who hither come Return with unpolluted thumb. Yet, when your lofty domes I praise, I sigh to think of ancient days. Permit me then to raise my style, And sweetly moralize a while. The bounteous goddess Cloacine, To temples why do we confine? Forbid in open air to breathe, Why are thine altars fixed beneath? When Saturn ruled the skies alone, That golden age to gold unknown, This earthly globe to thee assigned, Received the gifts of all mankind. Ten thousand altars smoking round Were built to thee with offerings crowned, And here thy daily votaries placed Their sacrifice with zeal and haste. The margin of a purling stream Sent up to thee a grateful steam, Though sometimes thou wert pleased to wink, If naiads swept them from the brink, Or where appointing lovers rove The shelter of a shady grove, Or offered in some flowery vale were wafted by a gentle gale. There many a flower obstursive grew, Thy favourite flowers of yellow hue, The crocus and the daffodil, The cowslip soft and sweet jonquil. But when at last usurping Jove, Old Saturn from his empire drove, Then gluttony with greasy paws, Her napkin pinned up to her jaws, With watery chops and wagging chin, Braced like a drum her oily skin. Wedged in a spacious elbow chair, And on her plate a treble share, As if she ne'er could have enough, Taught harmless man to cram and stuff. She sent her priests in wooden shoes From haughty Gaul to make ragouts, Instead of wholesome bread and cheese To dress their soups and fricassees. And for our home-bred British cheer, Botargo, catsup, and caviar. This bloated harpy sprung from hell, Confined thee, goddess, to a cell. Sprung from her womb that impious line, Contemners of thy rites divine. First lolling sloth in woollen cap, Taking her after-dinner nap. Pale dropsy with a sallow face, Her belly burst and slow her pace. And lordly gout wrapped up in fur, And wheezing asthma loath to stir. Voluptuous ease, the child of wealth, Infecting thus our hearts by stealth. None seek thee now in open air, To thee no verdant altars rare, But in their cells and vaults obscene Present a sacrifice unclean, From whence unsavory vapours rose, Offensive to thy nicer nose. Ah, who in our degenerate days, As nature prompts his offering pays, here nature never difference made Between the sceptre and the spade. Ye great ones, why will ye disdain To pay your tribute on the plain? Why will you place in lazy pride Your altars near your couch's side, When from the homeliest earthenware Are sent up offerings more sincere Than where the haughty duchess locks Her silver vase and cedar box? Yet some devotion still remains Among our harmless northern swains, Whose offerings placed in golden ranks Adorn our crystal river's banks, Nor seldom grace the flowery downs With spiral tops and copple crowns, Or gilding in a sunny morn The humble branches of a thorn. So poets sing with golden bow The Trojan hero paid his vow, Hither by luckless error led, The crude consistence oft I tread. Here when my shoes are out of case, Unsweeting gild the tarnished lace. 
Here by the sacred bramble tinged, My petticoat is doubly fringed. Be witness for me, nymph divine, I never robbed thee with design. Nor will the zealous Hannah pout To wash thy injured offering out. But stop, ambitious muse, in time, Nor dwell on subjects too sublime. In vain on lofty heels I tread, Aspiring to exalt my head. With hoop expanded wide and light, In vain I tempt too high a flight. Me Phoebus in a midnight dream, Accosting, said, Go shake your cream, Be humbly minded, know your post, Sweeten your tea and watch your toast. The best befits a lowly style, Teach Dennis how to stir the guile. With Peggy Dixon thoughtful sit, Contriving for the pot and spit. Take down thy proudly swelling sails, And rub thy teeth and pare thy nails. At nicely carving show thy wit, But ne'er presume to eat a bit. Turn every way thy watchful eye, And every guest be sure to ply. Let never at your board be known An empty plate except your own. Be these thy arts, nor higher aim, Than what befits a rural dame. But Cloacina, goddess bright, Sleek blank blank claims her as his right, And Smedley, flower of all divines, Shall sing the dean in Smedley's lines. End of section 38《セクション39 of the Poems of Jonathan Swift, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Twelve Articles 1. Lest it may more quarrels breed, I will never hear you read. 2. By disputing, I will never, to convince you once endeavor. 3. When a paradox you stick to, I will never contradict you. 4. When I talk and you are heedless, I will show no anger needless. 5. When your speeches are absurd, I will ne'er object a word. 6. When you furious argue wrong, I will grieve and hold my tongue. 7. Not a jest or humorous story will I ever tell before ye, to be chidden for explaining when you quite mistake the meaning. 8. Never more will I suppose you can taste my verse or prose. 9. You no more at me shall fret while I teach and you forget. 10. You shall never hear me thunder when you blunder on and blunder. 11. Show your poverty of spirit, and in dress place all your merit. Give yourself ten thousand airs, that with me shall break no squares. 12. Never will I give advice, till you please to ask me thrice, which, if you in scorn reject, t'will be just as I expect. Thus we both shall have our ends, and continue special friends. End of section 39. Section 40 of The Poems of Jonathan Swift, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Mr. William Crow's Address to Her Majesty Turned into Meter. From a town that consists of a church and a steeple, with three or four houses and as many people, there went an address in great form and good order, composed, as tis said, by Will Crow, their recorder. And thus it began to an excellent tune, Forgive us, good madam, that we did not as soon, as the rest of the cities and towns of this nation, wish your majesty joy on this glorious occasion. Not that we're less hearty or loyal than others, but having a great many sisters and brothers, our borough in riches and years far exceeding, we let them speak first to show our good breeding. 
We have heard with much transport and great satisfaction Of the victory obtain'd in the late famous action, When the field was so warm'd that it soon grew too hot For the French and Bavarians, who had all gone to pot; But that they thought best in great haste to retire, And leap into the water for fear of the fire. But says the good river, ye fools, plague confound ye, Do ye think to swim through me, and that I'll not drown ye? Who have ravish'd and murder'd and play'd such damn pranks, And trod down the grass on my much injured banks? Then swelling with anger and rage to the brink, He gave the poor monsieur his last draught of drink. So it plainly appears they were very well bang'd, And that some may be drown'd who deserved to be hang'd. Great Marlborough well pushed, 'twas well pushed indeed. Oh, how we adore you, because you succeed! And now may I say it, I hope without blushing, That you have got twins by your violent pushing. Twin battles, I mean, that will ne'er be forgotten, But live and be talk'd of when we're dead and rotten. Let other nice lords skulk at home from the wars, Prank'd up and adorn'd with garters and stars, Which but twinkle like those in a cold frosty night, while to yours you are adding such lustre and light, that if you proceed, I'm sure, very soon, t'will be brighter and larger than the sun or the moon. A blazing star, I foretell, t'will prove to the Gaul that portends of his empire the ruin and fall. Now God bless your majesty and our Lord Morrow, and send him in safety and health to his borough. End of section 40《セクション41 of the Poems of Jonathan Swift, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Jack Frenchman's Lamentation Ye commons and peers, pray lend me your ears. I'll sing you a song, if I can. How Louis Le Grand was put to a stand by the arms of our gracious Queen Anne. How his army so great had a total defeat, and close by the River Dender, where his grandchildren twain, for fear of being slain, galloped off with the Popish pretender. To a steeple on high the battle to spy up mounted these clever young men, but when from the spire they saw so much fire, most cleverly came down again. Then on horseback they got, all on the same spot, by advice of their cousin Van Dosme. O Lord, cried out he, unto young Burgundy, would your brother and you were at home. While this he did say, without more delay, away the young gentry fled, whose heels for that work were much lighter than cork, though their hearts were as heavy as lead. Not so did behave young Hanover brave in this bloody field, I assure ye. When his war-horse was shot, he valued it not, but fought it on foot like a fury. Full firmly he stood, as become his high blood, which runs in his veins so blue. For this gallant young man, being akin to Queen Anne, did as were she a man she would do. What a racket was here, I think t'was last year, for a little misfortune in Spain. For by letting him win, we have drawn the puts in, to lose all their worth this campaign. Though Bruges and Ghent, to Monsieur we lent, with interest they shall repay him, while Paris may sing with her sorrowful king, Nunc Dimittis, instead of Te Deum. From this dream of success they'll awaken, we guess, at the sound of great Marlborough's drums. They may think, if they will, of Ananza still, but tis Blenheim wherever he comes. O Louis perplexed, what general next thou hast hitherto changed in vain? He has beat him all round, if no new one's found, he shall beat him over again. We'll let Tallard out, if he'll take t'other bout, and much he's improved, let me tell ye, with Nottingham ale at every mail, and good beef and pudding and belly. But as losers at play their dice throw away, while the winners do still win on, let who will command thou hadst better disband, for old bully thy doctors are gone. End of section 41. Section 42 of The Poems of Jonathan Swift, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. 
All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Garden Plot, 1709 When Naboth's vineyard looked so fine, the king cried out, Would this were mine! And yet no reason could prevail to bring the owner to a sale. Jezebel saw with haughty pride how Ahab grieved to be denied, and thus accosted him with scorn, Shall Naboth make a monarch mourn? A king and weep, the ground's your own, I'll vest the garden in the crown. With that she hatched a plot and med, poor Naboth answer with his head. And when his harmless blood was spilt, the ground became his forfeit guilt. Sid Hammett's Rod Poor Hall, renowned for comely hair, whose hands, perhaps, were not so fair, yet had a Jezebella's ne'er. Hall of small scripture conversation, yet howe'er hunger for its quotation, by some strange accident had got the story of this garden plot. Wisely foresaw he might have reason to dread a modern bill of treason, if Jezebel should please to want his small addition to her grant, therefore resolved in humble sort to begin first and make his court, and seeing nothing else would do, gave a third part to save the other two. The Virtues of Sid Hammett, The Magician's Rod, 1710 The rod was but a harmless wand, while Moses held it in his hand, but soon as ere he laid it down, t'was a devouring serpent grown. Our great magician, Hammett Sid, reverses what the prophet did. His rod was honest English wood, that senseless in a corner stood, till metamorphosed by his grasp, it grew an all-devouring asp, would hiss and sting and roll and twist, by the mere virtue of his fist. But when he laid it down as quick, resumed the figure of a stick. So to her midnight feasts the hag rides on a broomstick for a nag, that raised by magic of her britch or sea and land conveys the witch. But with the morning dawn resumes the peaceful state of common brooms. They tell us something strange and odd about a certain magic rod, that bending down its top divines, when e'er the soil has golden mines. Where there are none, it stands erect, scorning to show the least respect. As ready was the wand of Sid to bend where golden mines were hid. In Scottish hills found precious ore, where none e'er looked for it before, and by a gentle bow divine how well a cully's purse was lined. To a forlorn and broken rake stood without motion like a stake. The rod of Hermes was renowned for charms above and underground, to sleep could mortal eyelids fix, and drive departed souls to sticks. That rod was a just type of Sid's, which o'er a British senate's lids, could scatter opium full as well, and drive as many souls to hell. Sid's rod was slender, white, and tall, which oft he used to fish withal. A place was fastened to the hook, and many score of gudgeons took. Yet still, so happy was his fate, he caught his fish and saved his bait. Sid's brethren of the conjuring tribe a circle with their rod describe, which proves a magical redoubt to keep mischievous spirits out. Sid's rod was of a larger stride, and made a circle thrice as wide, where spirits thronged with hideous din, and he stood there to take them in. But when the enchanted rod was broke, they vanished in a stinking smoke. Achilles' sceptre was of wood, like Sid's, but nothing near so good. Though down from ancestors divine, transmitted to the hero's line, thence through a long descent of kings, came an heirloom as Homer sings. Though this description looks so big, that sceptre was a sapless twig, which, from the fatal day when first it left the forest when twas nursed, as Homer tells us, o'er and o'er, nor leaf, nor fruit, nor blossom bore. Sid's sceptre, full of juice, did shoot in golden boughs and golden fruit, and he, the dragon never sleeping, guarded each fair Hesperian pippin. No hobby horse with gorgeous top, the dearest in Charles Mather's shop, 
Or glittering tinsel of May Fair, Could with this rod of Sid compare. Dear Sid, then why wert thou so mad To break thy rod like naughty lad? You should have kissed it in your distress, And then returned it to your mistress, Or made it a new market switch, And not a rod for thine own britch. But since old Sid has broken this, His next may be a rod in piss. End of section 42《セクション43オブ・ The Poems of Jonathan Swift、Volume 2。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The famous speechmaker of England, or Baron, alias Baron, Lovell's Charge at the Assizes at Exon, April 5, 1710. From London to Exon, by special direction, came down the world's wonder, Sir Salathiel Blunder, with a coif on his head as heavy as lead, and thus opened and said, Gentlemen of the Grand Inquest, Her Majesty Market appointed this circuit for me and my brother before any other to execute laws, as you may suppose, upon such as offenders have been. So then not to scatter more words on the matter, we're beginning just now to begin. But hold first and foremost, I must enter a clause, as touching and concerning our excellent laws, which here I avar are better by far than them all put together abroad and beyond sea, for I ne'er read the like, nor e'er shall I fancy. The laws of our land don't abet but withstand, inquisition and thrall, and whatever may gall, and fire with all, and sword that devours wherever it scours. They preserve liberty and property for which men pull and haul so, and they are made for the support of good government also. Her Majesty, knowing the best way of going to work for the wheel of the nation, builds on that rock which all storms will mock, since religion has made the foundation. And I tell you, to boot she resolves resolutely no promotion to give to the best man alive, in church or in stat, I'm an instance of that, but only to such of a good reputation, for temper, morality, and moderation. Fire, fire, a wild fire, which greatly disturbs the queen's peace, lies running about, and if you don't put it out, that's positive, will increase. And any may spy with half of an eye that it comes from our priests and papistical fry. Ye have one of these fellows with fiery bellows come hither to blow and to puff here, who having been tossed from pillar to post, at last vents his rascally stuff here which to such as are honest must sound very oddly, when they ought to preach nothing but what's very godly. As here from this place we charge you to do, as ye'll answer to man, besides ye know who. Ye have a diocesan, but I don't know the man. The man's a good liver, they tell me, however, and fiery never. Now ye under pullers that wear such black colours, how well would it look if his measures ye took, thus for head and for rump together to jump. For there's none deserve places I spect to their faces, but men of such graces. And I hope he will never prefer any asses, especially when I'm so confident on't, for reasons of state that her majesty won't. No, I myself, I was present and by, at the great trial, where there was a great company, of a turbulent preacher who cursedly hot, turned the fifth of November even the gunpowder plot, into impudent railing and the devil knows what exclaiming like fury, it was at Paul's London, how church was in danger, and like to be undone. And so gave the lie to gracious Queen Anne, and which is far worse, to our Parliament men. And then printed a book, into which men did look. True, he made a good text, but what followed next? Was not but a dunghill of sordid abuses, instead of sound doctrine with proofs to it and uses. It was high time of day that such inflammation should be extinguished without more delay. But there was no engine could possibly doubt, till the commons played theirs, and so quite put it out. So the man was tried for it, before highest court. Now it's plain to be seen, it's his principles I mean, where they suffered this noisy and his lawyers to bellow. Which over the blad a poor punishment had, for that racket he made, by which ye may knew, they thought as I do, that he is but at best an inconsiderable fellow. Upon this I find here, and everywhere, that the country rides rusty and is all out of gear, 
And for what may I not in opinion vary, And think the contrary, but it must create Unfriendly debate, and disunion straight, When no reason in nature can be given of the matter, Any more than for shapes or for different stature? If you love your dear selves, your religion, or quin, Ye ought in good manners to be peaceable men, For nothing disgusts her like making a bluster, And your making this riot is what she could cry at since all her concerns for our welfare and quiet. I would ask any man of them all that maintain their passive obedience with such mighty vehemence, that damned doctrine I trow what he means by it ho, to trump it up now, or to tell me in short what need there is for it. Ye may say I am hot, I say I am not, only warm as the subject on which I am got. There are those alive yet, if they do not forget, may remember what mischiefs it did church and state or at least must have heard the deplorable calamities it drew upon families about sixty years ago and upward. And now do ye see, whoever they be, that make such an oration in our Protestant nation, as though church was all on fire, with whatever cloak they may cover their talk, and wheedle the folk that the oaths they have took, as our governors strictly require. I say they are men, and I'm judge ye all know, that would our most excellent laws overthrow, for the greater part of them to church never go, or what's much the same it by very great chances, if ere they partake of her wise ordinances. Their aim is no doubt, were they made to speak out, to pluck down the queen that they made all this rout, and to be set up moreover a bastardly brother, or at least to prevent the house of Hanover. Ye gentlemen of the jury, what means all this fury, of which I'm informed by the good hands I assure ye, this insulting of persons by blows and rude speeches, and breaking of windows which you know make of breaches? Ye ought to resent it, and in duty present it, for the law is against it. Not only the actors engaged in this job, but those that encourage and set on the mob, the mob, a paw word, in which I near mention, but must in this place, for the sake of distinction. I hear that some bailiffs and some justices have strove what they could all this rage to suppress, and I hope many more will exert like the power, since none will depend on to get a jot of preferment. But men of this kidney, as I told you before, I'll tell you a story, once upon a time, some hot-headed fellows must needs take a whim, and so were so weak, t'was a mighty mistake, to pull down and abuse body houses and stews, who tried by the laws of the realm for high treason, were hanged, drawn, and quartered for that very reason. When the time came about for us all to set out, we went to take leave of the queen, where were great men of worth, great heads, and so forth, the greatest that ever were seen. And she gave us a large and particular charge, Good part, aunt, and dead, is quite out of my head, But I remember she said, We should recommend peace and good neighbourhood, Wheresoever we came, and so I do here. For that every one, not only men and their wives, Should do all that they can to lead peaceable lives. And told us withal that she fully expected A special account how ye all stood affected. When we've been at St. James, you'll hear of the matter. Again then I charge ye, ye men of the clergy, that ye follow the trackall of your own bishop Blackall, and preach as ye should what's savoury and good, and together all cling as it were in a string. Not falling out quarrelling with one another, now we're treating with Monsieur that son of his mother. Then proceeded on the common the matters of the law, and concluded. Once more and no more, since few words are best, I charge you all present by way of request. If ye honour as I do our dear royal widow, or have any compassion for the church or the nation, and would live a long while in continual smile, and eat roast and boil, and not be forgotten when ye are dead and rotten, that ye would be quiet and peaceably dwell, and never fall out but piss all in a quill. End of section 43Section 44 of The Poems of Jonathan Swift, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Parody on the Recorder's Speech to His Grace the Duke of Ormond, 4th July, 1711. 
The Recorder's Speech Explained by the Tories an ancient metropolis, famous of late, for opposing the church and for nosing the state, for protecting sedition and rejecting order, made the following speech by their mouth the recorder. First, to tell you the name of this place of renown, some still call it Dublin, but most Forster's town. The Speech May it please your grace, we cannot omit this occasion to tell, that we love the Queen's person and government well. Then next to your grace we this compliment make, That our worships regard you, but tis for her sake. Though our mouth be a wig, and our head a dissenter, Yet salute you we must, cause you represent her. Nor can we forget, sir, that some of your line Did with mildness and peace in this government shine. But of all your exploits we'll allow but one fact, That your grace has procured us a popery act. By this you may see that the least of your actions does conduce still the most to our satisfactions. And lastly, because in the year 88 you did early appear in defence of our right. We give no other proof of your zeal to your prince, so we freely forget all your services since. It's then only we hope that whilst you rule o'er us, you'll tread in the steps of King William the Glorious, whom we're always adoring, though hand over head, for we owe him allegiance, although he be dead. Which shows that good zeal may be founded in spleen, since a dead prince we worship to lessen the queen. And as for her majesty, we will defend her, against our hobgoblin the popish pretender. Our valiant militia will stoutly stand by her, against the sly jack and the sturdy high flyer. She is safe when thus guarded, if providence bless her, and Hanover sure to be next her successor. Thus ended the speech, but what heart would not pity, his grace almost choked with the breath of the city. End of section 44。section 45 of the poems of Jonathan Swift, volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Ballad, to the tune of Commons and Peers. A wonderful age is now on the stage, I'll sing you a song if I can, How modern Whigs dance forty-one jigs, But God bless our gracious Queen Anne. The Kirk with applause is established by laws, As the Orthodox Church of the nation. The bishops do own, it's as good as their own, And this, sir, is called moderation. It's no riddle now, to let you see how, a church by oppression may speed. Nor is't banter or jest, that the Kirk faith is best, on the other side of the tweed. For no soil can suit, with every fruit, even so, sir, it is with religion. The best church by far, is what grows where you are, were it Mahomet's ass or his pigeon. Another strange story, that vexes the Tory, but sure there's no mystery in it that a pension and place give communicants grace who design to turn tail the next minute. For if it be not strange that religion should change as often as climates and fashions, then sure there's no harm that one should conform to serve their own private occasions. Another new dance which of late they advance is to cry up the birth of pretender, and those that dare own the queen heir to the crown are traitors not fit to defend her. The subjects most loyal that hates the blood royal, and they for employments have merit, who swear queen and steeple were made by the people, and neither have right to inherit. The monarchy's fixed by making aunt mixed, and by non-resistance o'erthrown, and preaching obedience destroys our allegiance, and thus the Whigs prop up the throne. That viceroy is best that would take off the test, and make a sham speech to attempt it but being true blue when he found twould not do, swore damn him if ever he meant it. Tis no news that Tom Double the nation should bubble, nor is't any wonder or riddle, that a parliament rump should play hop-step and jump, and dance any jig to his fiddle. But now, sir, they tell how Sasha Varel, by bringing old doctrines in fashion, hath like a damned rogue brought religion in vogue, and so opened the eyes of the nation. Then let's pray without spleen, and God bless the Queen, and her fellow monarchs, the people. 
May they prosper and thrive whilst I am alive, and so may the church with the steeple. End of section 45section 46 of the poems of jonathan swift volume 2 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org atlas or the minister of state to the lord treasurer oxford 1710 at last we read an ancient song was so exceeding tall and strong he bore the skies upon his back just as the peddler does his pack. But as the peddler, overpressed, unloads upon a stall to rest, or when he can no longer stand, desires a friend to lend a hand, so Atlas, lest the ponderous spheres should sink and fall about his ears, got Hercules to bear the pile, that he might sit and rest a while. Yet Hercules was not so strong, nor could have borne it half so long. Great statesmen are in this condition, and Atlas is a politician, a premier minister of state, Alcides one of second rate. Suppose then Atlas near so wise, yet when the weight of kingdom lies too long upon his single shoulders, sink down he must, or find upholders. Lines written extempore on Mr. Harley's being stabbed, and addressed to his physician. 1710 11. On Britain, Europe's safety lies. Britain is lost if Harley dies. Harley depends upon your skill. Think what you save or what you kill. End of section 46. Section 47 of The Poems of Jonathan Swift, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. An excellent new song, being the intended speech of the famous orator against peace. 1711. An orator dismal of Nottinghamshire, who has forty years let out his conscience to hire, out of zeal for his country and want of a place, is come up viet armis to break the queen's peace. He has vamped an old speech, and the court, to their sorrow, shall hear him harangue against prior to-morrow. When once he begins, he never will flinch, but repeats the same note a whole day like a finch. I have heard all the speech repeated by Hoppy, and, mistakes to prevent, I've obtained a copy. THE SPEECH Whereas notwithstanding I am in great pain, to hear we are making a peace without Spain, but most noble senators, tis a great shame, there should be a peace while I'm not in game. The duke showed me all his fine house and the duchess, from her closet brought out a full purse in her clutches. I talked of a peace, and they both gave a start, his grace swore by God, and her grace let a fart. My long old-fashioned pocket was presently crammed, and sooner than vote for a peace I'll be damned. But some will cry turncoat and rip up old stories, how I always pretended to be for the Tories. I answer the Tories were in my good graces, till all my relations were put into places. But still I'm in principle ever the same, and will quit my best friends while I'm not in game. When I and some others subscribed our names to a plot for expelling my master King James, I withdrew my subscription by help of a blot and so might discover or gain by the plot. I had my advantage and stood at defiance, for Daniel was got from the den of the lions. I came in without danger, and was I to blame? For rather than hang, I would be not in game. I swore to the queen that the prince of Hanover, during her sacred life, would never come over. I made use of a trope that an heir to invite was like keeping her monument always in sight. But when I thought proper, I altered my note, and in her own hearing I boldly did vote, that Her Majesty stood in great need of a tutor, and must have an old or a young coadjutor. For why, I would fain have put all in a flame, because, for some reasons, I was not in game. Now my new benefactors have brought me about, 
and I'll vote against peace with Spain or without, though the court gives my nephews and my brothers and cousins, and all my whole family places by dozens. Yet since I know where a full purse may be found, and hardly pay eighteen pence tax in the pound, since the Tories have thus disappointed my hopes, and will neither regard my figures nor tropes. I'll speech against peace while dismal's my name, and be a true Whig while I'm not in game. End of section 47。Section 48 of The Poems of Jonathan Swift, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Windsor Prophecy When a holy black Swede, the son of Bob, with a saint at his chin and a seal at his fob, shall not see one New Year's Day in that year, then let old England make good cheer. Windsor and Bristol then shall be joined together in the low country. Then shall the tall black Daventry bird speak against peace, write many a word, and some shall admire his cunning wit, for many good groats his tongue shall slit. But spite of the harpy that crawls on all four, there shall be peace, party, and war no more. But England must cry, alack, and well a day, if the stick be taken from the dead say, and, dear England, if aught I understand, beware of carrots from Northumberland. Carrots sown thinny a deep root may get, if so be they are in Somerset. Their cunnings mark thou, for I have been told, they asinine when young and poison when old. Root out these carrots, O thou whose name is backwards and forwards always the same and keep thee close to thee always that name, which backwards and forwards is almost the same. And England, wouldst thou be happy still, burn those carrots under a hill. End of section 48 Section 49 of The Poems of Jonathan Swift, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Corinna, a Ballad, 1711-12 This day the year I dare not tell, Apollo played the midwife's part. Into the world Corinna fell, and he endued her with his art. But Cupid with a satyr comes, both softly to the cradle creep, both stroke her hands and rub her gums, while the poor child lay fast asleep. Then Cupid thus, This little maid of love shall always speak and write, and I pronounce, the satyr said, the world shall feel her scratch and bite. Her talent she displayed betimes, for in a few revolving moons she seemed to laugh and squall in rhymes, and all her gestures were lampoons. At six years old the subtle jade stole to the pantry door and found the butler with my lady's maid, and you may swear the tale went round. She made a song how little miss was kissed and slobbered by a lad, and how when master went to piss miss came and peeped at all he had. At twelve a wit and a coquette marries for love half whore half wife, cuckolds elopes and runs in debt, turns authoress and is curls for life. Her commonplace book all gallant is, of scandal now a cornucopia, she pours it out in Atalantis, or memoirs of the new utopia. End of section 49 Section 50 of The Poems of Jonathan Swift, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Fable of Midas, 1711-12 My das we are in story told, turned everything he touched to gold. He chipped his bread, the pieces round, glittered like spangles on the ground. A coddling ear it went his lip in, would straight become a golden pippin. He called for drink, you saw him sup, 
Portable gold in golden cup. His empty paunch that he might fill, He suck'd his victuals through a quill. Untouch'd it pass'd between his grinders, Or it had been happy for gold finders. He cock'd his hat, you would have said, Mambrino's helm adorn'd his head. Whene'er he chanced his hands to lay On magazines of corn or hay, Gold ready coin'd appear'd instead Of paltry provender and bread. Hence we are by wise farmers told, Old hay is equal to old gold. And hence a critic deep maintains, We learn'd to weigh our gold by grains. This fool had got a lucky hit, And people fancied he had wit. Two gods their skill in music tried, And both chose Midas to decide. He against Phoebus's heart decreed, And gave it four pans oaten reed. The god of wit, to show his grudge, Clapped ass's ears upon the judge. A goodly pair, erect and wide, Which he could neither gild nor hide. And now the virtue of his hands Was lost among Pactolus's sands. Against whose torrent, while he swims, The golden scurf peels off his limbs. Fame spread the news and people travel From far to gather golden gravel. Midas, exposed to all their jeers, Had lost his art and kept his ears. This tale inclines the gentle reader To think upon a certain leader, To whom from Midas down descends That virtue in the fingers ends. What else by perquisites are meant By pensions, bribes, and three per cent? By places and commissions sold, And turning dung itself to gold? By starving in the midst of store, As t'other Midas did before? None ear did modern Midas choose, subject or patron of his muse, but found him thus their merit scan, that Phoebus must give place to Pan. He values not the poet's praise, nor will exchange his plums for bays. To Pan alone rich misers call, and there's the jest, for Pan is all. Here English wits will be to seek, howe'er tis all one in the Greek. Besides, it plainly now appears, our Midas too has ass's ears. Where every fool his mouth applies, and whispers in a thousand lies, such gross delusions could not pass through any ears but of an ass. But gold defiles with frequent touch, there's nothing fouls the hand so much, and scholars give it for the cause of British Midas's dirty paws which while the senate strove to scour, they washed away the chemic power, while he his utmost strength applied to swim against this popular tide. The golden spoils flew off apace, here fell a pension, there a place. The torrent merciless imbibes commissions, perquisites, and bribes. By their own weight sunk to the bottom, much good mate do him that have caught him. And Midas now neglected stands with ass's ears and dirty hands. End of section fifty. Section fifty one of the Poems of Jonathan Swift, Volume Two. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Toland's Invitation to Dismal to Dine with the Calves Head Club, 1712. If, dearest Dismal, you for once can dine, Upon a single dish and tavern wine, Toland to you this invitation sends, To eat the calves head with your trusty friends. Suspend a while your vain ambitious hopes, Leave hunting after bribes, forget your tropes, Tomorrow we our mystic feast prepare, Where thou, our latest, proselyte shall share. When we by proper signs and symbols tell, How by brave hands the royal traitor fell. Thee meat shall represent the tyrant's head, Thee wine his blood our predecessors shed. Whilst an alluding him some artist sings, We toast confusion, to the race of kings. At monarchy we nobly show our spite, And talk what fools call treason all the night. 
Who, by disgraces or ill fortune sunk, Feels not his soul enlivened when he's drunk. Wine can clear up Godolphin's cloudy face, And fill Jack Smith with hopes to keep his place. By force of wine, even Scarborough is brave. Hall grows more pert, and Summers not so grave. Wine can give Portland wit and Cleveland sense, Montague learning, Bolton eloquence. Cholmondeley, when drunk, can never lose his wand, And Lincoln then imagines he has land. My province is to see that all be right, Glasses and linen clean and pewter bright. From our mysterious club to keep out spies, And Tories dressed like waiters in disguise, You shall be coupled as you best approve, Seated at table next the man you love, Sunderland, Orford, Boyle, and Richmond's grace, Will come, and Hampton shall have Walpole's place. Wharton, unless prevented by a whore, Will hardly fail, and there is room for more. But I love elbow room whene'er I drink, And honest Harry is too apt to stink. Let no pretense of business make you stay, Yet take one word of counsel by the way. If Guernsey calls, send word you're gone abroad. He'll tease you with King Charles and Bishop Laud, Or make you fast and carry you to prayers. But if he will break in and walk upstairs, Steal by the back door out and leave him there, Then order Squash to call a hackney chair. End of section 51Section 52 of The Poems of Jonathan Swift, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Peace and Dunkirk Being an excellent new song upon the surrender of Dunkirk to General Hill, 1712. Spite of Dutch friends and English foes, Poor Britain shall have peace at last. Holland got towns, and we got blows, but Dunkirk's ours, we'll hold it fast. We have got it in a string, and the Whigs may all go swing. For among good friends I love to be plain. All their false deluded hopes will or ought to end in ropes, but the Queen shall enjoy her own again. Sunderland's run out of his wits, and dismal double dismal looks. Wharton can only swear by fits, and strutting Hal is off the hooks. Old Godolphin, full of spleen, made false moves and lost his queen. Harry looked fierce and shook his ragged mane, but a prince of high renown swore he'd rather lose a crown than the queen should enjoy her own again. Our merchant ships may cut the line and not be snapped by privateers, and commoners who love good wine will drink it now as well as peers. Landed men shall have their rent, yet our stocks rise cent per cent. The Dutch from hence shall no more millions drain, Will bring on us no more debts, Nor with bankrupts fill gazettes, And the queen shall enjoy her own again. The towns we took near did us good, What signified the French to beat? We spent our money and our blood To make the Dutchmen proud and great, But the lord of Oxford swears Dunkirk never shall be theirs. The Dutch-hearted Whigs may rail and complain, but true Englishmen may fill a good health to General Hill, for the Queen now enjoys her own again. End of section 52 Section 53 of The Poems of Jonathan Swift, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Horace, Epistle 1, 7. Imitation of Horace to Lord Oxford, A.D. 1713. Harley, the nation's great support, returning home one day from court, his mind with public cares possessed, all Europe's business in his breast, observed a parson near Whitehall, cheapening old authors on a stall, 
The priest was pretty well in case, And show'd some humour in his face; Look'd with an easy, careless mien, A perfect stranger to the spleen; Of size that might a pulpit fill, But more inclining to sit still. My lord, who, if a man may sate, Loves mischief better than his mate, Was now disposed to crack a jest, And bid friend Lewis go in quest. This Lewis was a cunning shaver, And very much in Harley's favour. In quest, who might this parson be? What was his name? Of what degree? If possible, to learn his story, And whether he were Whig or Tory. Lewis, his patron's humour knows, Away upon his errand goes, And quickly did the matter sift, Found out that it was Dr. Swift. A clergyman of special note, For shunning those of his own coat, Which made his brethren of the gown Take care betimes to run him down. No libertine, nor over nice, Addicted to no sort of vice, Went where he pleased, said what he thought, Not rich, but owed no man a grot. In state opinions, a la mode, He hated Wharton like a toad, Had given the faction many a wound, And libelled all the junto round. Kept company with men of wit, Who often farthered what he writ, His works were hawked in every street, But seldom rose above a sheet. Of late, indeed, the paper stamp Did very much his genius cramp, And since he could not spend his fire, He now intended to retire. Said Harley, I desire to know From his own mouth, if this be so, Step to the doctor straight and say, I'd have him dine with me to-day. Swift seemed to wonder what he meant, Nor could believe my lord had sent, So never offered once to stir, But coldly said, your servant, sir. Does he refuse me? Harley cried. He does with insolence and pride. Some few days after, Harley spies the doctor fastened by the eyes at Charing Cross among the rout, where painted monsters are hung out. He pulled the string and stopped his coach, beckoning the doctor to approach. Swift, who could neither fly nor hide, came sneaking to the chariot side and offered many a lame excuse he never meant the least abuse my lord the honour you designed extremely proud but i had dined i am sure i never should neglect no man alive has more respect well i shall think of that no more if you'll be sure to come at four the doctor now obeys the summons likes both his company and commons Displays his talent, sits till ten, Next day invited comes again. Soon grows domestic, seldom fails, Either at morning or at mails, Came early and departed late, In short the gudgeon took the bait. My lord would carry on the jest, And down to Windsor takes his guest. Swift much admires the place and air, And longs to be a canon there. In summer round the park to ride, In winter never to reside. A cannon, that's a place too mean. No, doctor, you shall be a dean. Two dozen cannons round your stall, And you the tyrant o'er them all. You need but cross the Irish seas To live in plenty, power, and ease. Poor Swift departed, and, what's worse, With borrowed money in his purse, Travels at least a hundred leagues, And suffers numberless fatigues. Suppose him now a dean complete, Demurely lolling in his seat, And silver verge with decent pride, Stuck underneath his cushioned side. Suppose him gone through all vexations, Patents, installments, abjurations, First fruits and tenths and chapter treats, Dues, payments, fees, demands, and cheats, The wicked laities contriving To hinder clergymen from thriving. Now all the doctor's money spent, His tenants wrong him in his rent. The farmers spitefully combine, force him to take his tithes in kine, and Parvasol discounts arrears by bills for taxes and repairs. Poor Swift, with all his losses vexed, not knowing where to turn him next, above a thousand pounds in debt, takes horse and in a mighty fret, rides day and night at such a rate, he soon arrives at Harley's gate. But was so dirty, pale and thin, old Reed would hardly let him in. Said Harley, Welcome, Reverend Dean, What makes your worship look so lean? Why, sure, you won't appear in town In that old wig and rusty gown. 
I doubt your heart is set on pelf So much that you neglect yourself. What, I suppose now stocks are high, You've some good purchase in your eye? Or is your money out at use? Truce, good my lord, I beg a truce. The doctor in a passion cried, Your raillery is misapplied. Experience I have dearly bought, You know I am not worth a grot. But you resolved to have your jest, And t'was a folly to contest. Then since you now have done your worst, Pray leave me where you found me first. End of section 53section 54 of the poems of jonathan swift volume 2 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org the author upon himself 1713 by an old blank blank pursued a crayly prelate in a royal prude by dull divines who look with envious eyes on every genius that attempts to rise, and, pausing o'er a pipe with doubtful nod, gives hints that poets ne'er believe in God. So clowns on scholars, as on wizards look, and take a folio for a conjuring book. Swift had the sin of wit no venial crime, nay, t'was affirmed he sometimes dealt in rhyme. Humour and mirth had place in all he writ, he reconciled divinity and wit. He moved and bowed and talked with too much grace, nor showed the parson in his gait or face. Despised luxurious wines and costly meat, yet was still at the tables of the great. Frequented lords saw those that saw the queen, at childs or trubies never once had been. Where town and country vicars flock in tribes, secured by numbers from the layman's jibes and deal in vices of the graver sort tobacco censure coffee pride and port but after sage monitions from his friends his talents to employ for nobler ends to better judgments willing to submit he turns to politics his dangerous wit and now the public interest to support by Harley Swift invited comes to court. In favor grows with ministers of state, admitted private when superiors wait, and Harley not ashamed his choice to own, takes him to Windsor in his coach alone. At Windsor Swift no sooner can appear, but St. John comes and whispers in his ear. The waiters stand in ranks the yeomen cry, make room as if a duke were passing by now finch alarms the lords he hears for certain this dangerous priest is got behind the curtain finch famed for tedious elocution proves that swift oils many a spring which harley moves walpole and isleby to clear the doubt informs the commons that the secret's out a certain doctor is observed of late to haunt a certain minister of state, from whence with half an eye we may discover, the peace is made, and Perkin must come over. York is from Lambeth sent to show the queen a dangerous treatise writ against the spleen, which, by the style, the matter, and the drift, tis thought could be the work of none but swift. Poor York, the harmless tool of others' hate, he sues for pardon and repents too late. Now angry Somerset her vengeance vows on Swift's reproaches for her blank blank spouse. From her red locks her mouth with venom fills and thence into the royal ear instills. The queen incensed, his services forgot, leaves him a victim to the vengeful Scot. Now through the realm a proclamation spread to fix a price on his devoted head. While innocent he scorns ignoble flight, his watchful friends preserve him by a slight. By Harley's favour once again he shines, is now caressed by candidate divines. 
who change opinions with the changing scene. Lord, how were they mistaken in the dean? Now Delaware again familiar grows, and in Swift's ear thrusts half his powdered nose. The Scottish nation, whom he durst offend, again apply that Swift would be their friend. By faction tired, with grief he waits a while, his great contending friends to reconcile, performs what friendship, justice, truth require, what could he more but decently retire? End of section 54section 55 of the poems of jonathan swift volume 2 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org the faggot 1713 observe the dying father speak try lads can you this bundle break then bids the youngest of the six take up a well-bound heap of sticks they thought it was an old man's maggot, and strove by turns to break the faggot. In vain the complicated wands were much too strong for all their hands. See, said the sire, how soon tis done, then took and broke them one by one. So strong you'll be in friendship tied, so quickly broke if you divide. Keep close then, boys, and never quarrel, here ends the fable and the moral. This tale may be applied in few words to treasurers, comptrollers, stewards, and others who, in solemn sort, appear with slender wands at court, not firmly joined to keep their ground, but lashing one another round. While wise men think they ought to fight with quarter staffs instead of white, or constable with staff of peace should come and make their clattering cease, which now disturbs the queen and court, and gives the Whigs and rabble sport. In history we never found the consul's fasces were unbound. Those Romans were too wise to think on't except to lash some grand delinquent. How would they blush to hear it said, the praetor broke the consul's head? Or consul, in his purple gown, came up and knocked the praetor down. Come courtiers, every man his stick, lord treasurer, for once be quick and that they may the closer cling, take your blue ribbon for a string. Come, trimming Harcourt, bring your mace, and squeeze it in, or quit your place. Dispatch, or else that rascal Northy will undertake to do it for thee. And be assured the court will find him prepared to leap or sticks or bind them. To make the bundle strong and safe, great Ormond, lend thy general's stave. And if the crozier could be crammed in, a fig for Leechmere, King, and Hamden, you'll then defy the strongest Whig, with both his hands to bend a twig. Though with united strength they all pull, from summers down to crags and walpole. End of section 55 Section 56 of The Poems of Jonathan Swift, Volume 2 this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Imitation of part of the sixth satire of the second book of Horace, 1714. I often wished that I had clear, for life, six hundred pounds a year. A handsome house to lodge a friend, a river at my garden's end, a terrace walk, and half a rood of land set out to plant a wood. Well, now I have all this and more. I ask not to increase my store, but should be perfectly content could I but live on this side, Trent, nor cross the channel twice a year to spend six months with statesmen here. I must by all means come to town, tis for the service of the crown. Lewis the dean will be of use, send for him up, take no excuse. The toil, the danger of the seas, great ministers ne'er think of these. Or let it cost a hundred pound, no matter where the money's found, it is but so much more in debt, and that they ne'er considered yet. Good Mr. Dean, go change your gown, let my lord know you're come to town. I hurry me in haste away, not thinking it is levy day, 
And find his honour in a pound, Hemm'd by a triple circle round. Chequer'd with ribbons blue and green, How should I thrust myself between? Some wag observes me thus perplex'd, And smiling whispers to the next, I thought the dean had been too proud To jostle here among a crowd. Another, in a surly fit, Tells me I have more zeal than wit. So eager to express your love, You ne'er consider whom you shove, But rudely press before a duke. I own I'm pleased with this rebuke, and take it kindly meant to show what I desire the world should know. I get a whisper and withdraw, when twenty fools I never saw, come with petitions fairly penned, desiring I would stand their friend. This humbly offers me his case, that begs my interest for a place. A hundred other men's affairs, like bees, are humming in my ears. Tomorrow my appeal comes on, without your help the cause is gone. The duke expects my lord and you about some great affair at two. Put my lord Bolingbroke in mind to get my warrant quickly signed. Consider, tis my first request. Be satisfied, I'll do my best. Then presently he falls to tease. You may for certain, if you please, I doubt not if his lordship knew, and Mr. Dean, one word from you. Tis, let me see, three years and more, October next it will be four, since Harley bid me first attend, and chose me for a humble friend, would take me in his coach to chat, and question me of this and that, as, what's a clock, and how's the wind, whose chariot's that we left behind, or gravely try to read the lines writ underneath the country signs, and mark at Brentford how they spell, here is good eel and bear to sell, or, have you nothing new to-day to shew from Parnell, Pope, and Gay? Such tattle often entertains my lord and me as far as Staines, as once a week we travel down to Windsor and again to town, where all that passes internos might be proclaimed at Charing Cross. Yet some I know with envy swell, because they see me used so well. How think you of our friend the Dean? I wonder what some people mean. My lord and he are grown so great, always together tate a tate. What, they admire him for his jokes? See but the fortune of some folks. There flies about a strange report of mighty news arrived at court. I'm stopped by all the fools I meet, and catechized in every street. You, Mr. Dean, frequent the great. Inform us, will the emperor trait? Or do the prints and papers lie? Faith, sir, you know as much as I. Ah, doctor, how you love to jest, tis now no secret, I protest. It's one to me. Then tell us, pray, when are the troops to have their pay? And though I solemnly declare, I know no more than my lord mayor, they stand amazed and think me grown the closest mortal ever known. Thus in a sea of folly tossed, my choicest hours of life are lost. Yet always wishing to retreat, Oh, could I see my country seat? There leaning near a gentle brook, Sleep or peruse some ancient book, And there in sweet oblivion drown Those cares that haunt the court and town. End of section 56of the poems of jonathan swift volume two this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. horace book two ode one paraphrased addressed to richard steele esq seventeen fourteen dick thou art resolved as i am told some strange arcana to unfold and with the help of Buckley's pen, to vamp the good old cause again, which thou, such Burnet's shrewd advice is, must furbish up and nickname Crisis. Thou pompously wilt let us know what all the world knew long ago, ere since Sir William Gore was mayor and Harley filled the commons chair, that we a German prince must own when Anne for heaven resigns her throne. But more than that, Thou'lt keep a rout with who is in and 
who is out. Thou'lt rail devoutly at the peace, and all its secret causes trace. The bucket play twixt Whigs and Tories, their ups and downs with fifty stories, of tricks the Lord of Oxford knows, and errors of our plenipos. Thou'lt tell of leagues among the great, portending ruin to our state, and of that dreadful coup de clat which has afforded thee much chat. The queen, forsooth, despotic, gave twelve coronets without thy lave, a breach of liberty tis owned, for which no heads have yet atoned. Believe me what thou'st undertaken may bring in jeopardy thy bacon. For madmen, children, wits, and fools should never meddle with edged tools. But since thou'st got into the fire, and canst not easily retire, thou must no longer deal in farce, nor pump to cobble wicked verse, until thou shalt have eased thy conscience of spleen of politics and nonsense. And when thou'st bid adieu to cares, and settled Europe's grand affairs, twill then, perhaps, be worth thy while, for Drury Lane to shape thy style. To make a pair of jolly fellows, the son and father join to tell us, how sons may safely disobey, and fathers never should say nay, by which wise conduct they grow friends, at last, and so the story ends. When first I knew thee, Dick, thou wert, renowned for skill in Faustus's art, which made thy closet much frequented by buxom lasses, some repented their luckless choice of husbands, others, impatient to be like their mothers, received from thee profound directions how best to settle their affections. Thus thou, a friend, to thee distressed, didst in thy calling do thy best. But now the Senate, if things hit, and thou at Stockbridge wert not bit, must feel thy eloquence and fire, approve thy schemes, thy wit admire, thee with immortal honours crown, while patriot-like thou'lt strut and frown. What though by enemies tis said, the laurel which adorns thy head, must one day come in competition, by virtue of some sly petition. Yet mum for that, hope still the best, nor let such cares disturb thy rest. Methinks I hear thee loud as trumpet, as bagpipe shrill, or oyster strumpet. Methinks I see thee spruce and fine, with coat embroidered richly shine, and dazzle all the idle faces, as though the hall thy worship paces. Though this I speak but at a venture, supposing thou hast tick with hunter, methinks I see a blackguard rout, attend thy coach, and hear them shout, in approbation of thy tongue, which in their style is purely hung. Now, now you carry all before ye, nor dares one Jacobite or Tory pretend to answer one syllable except the matchless hero Abel. What though her highness and her spouse in Antwerp keep a frugal house, yet not forgetful of a friend, they'll soon enable thee to spend, if to McCartney thou wilt toast, and to his pious patron's ghost. Now manfully thou'lt run a tilt on popes for all the blood they've spilt, for massacres and racks and flames, for lands enriched by crimson streams, for inquisitions taught by Spain, of which the Christian world complain. Dick, we agree, all's true thou'st said, as that my muse is yet a maid, but if I may with freedom talk, all this is foreign to thy walk. Thy genius has perhaps a knack at trudging in a beaten track, but is for state affairs as fit as mine for politics and wit. Then let us both in time grow wise, nor higher than our talents rise. To some snug cellar let's repair, from duns and debts and drown our care. Now quaff of honest ale a quart, now venture at a pint of port, with which inspired will club each night some tender sonnet to indite, and with Tom Durfey, Phillips, Dennis, immortalize our dolls and jennies. End of section 57of the poems of jonathan swift volume two this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org dennis's invitation to steal horace book one epistle five john dennis the sheltering poet's invitation to richard steel 
the secluded party writer and member, to come and live with him in the Mint, 1714. Fit to be bound up with the crisis. If thou canst lay aside a spendthrift's air, and condescend to feed on homely fare, such as we minters with ragouts unstored, will in defiance of the law afford. Quit thy patrols with Toby's Christmas box, and come to me at the two fighting cocks. Since printing by subscription now is grown, the stalest, idlest cheat about the town, and even Charles Gildon, who a papist bred, has an alarm against that worship spread, is practising those beaten paths of cruising, and for new levies on proposals musing. Tis true that Bloomsbury Square's a noble place, but what are lofty buildings in thy case? What's a fine house embellished to profusion, where shoulder-dabbers are in execution, or whence its timorous tenant seldom sallies, but apprehensive of insulting bailiffs? This once be mindful of a friend's advice, and cease to be improvidently nice. Exchange the prospects that delude thy sight, from Highgate's steep ascent and Hampstead's height, with verdant scenes that from St. George's field more durable and safe enjoyments yield. Here I, even I, that near till now could find, ease to my troubled and suspicious mind, but ever was with jealousies possessed, am in a state of indolence and rest. Fearful no more of Frenchmen in disguise, nor looking upon strangers as on spies, but quite divested of my former spleen, am unprovoked without and calm within. And here I'll wait thy coming till the sun shall its diurnal course completely run. Think not that thou of sturdy bub shalt fail, my landlord's cellar stocked with beer and ale, with every sort of malt that is in use, and every country's generous produce, the ready, for here Christian faith is sick, which makes us seldom trespass upon tick, instantly brings the choicest liquors out, whether we ask for home-brewed or for stout, for meat or cider or with dainties fed, ring for a flask or two of white or red, such as the drawer will not fail to swear, was drunk by Pilkington when third-time mayor. That name methinks so popularly known for opposition to the church and crown, might make the Lusitanian grape to pass and almost give a sanction to the glass especially with thee whose hasty zeal against the late rejected commerce bill may thee rise up like an audacious elf to do the speaker honour not thyself but if thou soarest above the common prices by virtue of subscription to thy crisis and nothing can go down with thee but wines pressed from burgundian and campanian vines Bid them be brought, for though I hate the French, I love their liquors as thou lovest a wench. Else thou must humble thy expensive taste, And with us hold contentment for a feast. The fire's already lighted, and the maid, Has a clean cloth upon the table laid, Who never on a Saturday had struck, But for thy entertainment up a buck. Think of this act of grace which, by your leave, Susan would not have done on Easter Eve, had she not been informed over and over, t'was for the ingenious author of the lover. Cease therefore to beguile thyself with hopes, which is no more than making sandy ropes, and quit the vain pursuit of loud applause that must bewilder thee in faction's cause. Prithee, what is't to thee? Who guides the state? Why Dunkirk's demolition is so late? Or why her majesty thinks fit to cease The din of war and hush the world to peace? The clergy too, without thy aid, can tell What text to choose and on which topics dwell. And uninstructed by thy babbling teach, Their flocks celestial happiness to reach. Rather let such poor souls as you and I Say that the holidays are drawing nigh, And that tomorrow's sun begins the week, Which will abound with store of ale and cake, With hams of bacon and with powdered beef, 
Stuff'd to give field itinerance relief. Then I, who have within these precincts kept, And near beyond the chimney sweepers stept, Will take a loose and venture to be seen, Since twill be Sunday upon Shanks's green, There with erected looks and phrase sublime, To talk of unity of place and time, And with much malice mixed with little satire, Explode the wits on t'other side of the water. Why has my lord Godolphin's special grace Invested me with a queen's waiter's place? If I, debarred of festival delights, Am not allowed to spend the perquisites, He's but a short remove from being mad, Who at a time of jubilee is sad, And like a griping usurer does spare His money to be squandered by his heir, Fluttered away in liveries and in coaches, and washy sorts of feminine debauches. As for my part, whate'er the world may think, I'll bid adieu to gravity and drink. And though I can't put off a woeful mien, Will be all mirth and cheerfulness within. As in despite of a censorious race, I most incontinently suck my face. What mighty projects does not he design, Whose stomach flows and brain turns round with wine? Wine, powerful wine, can thaw the frozen kit, And fashion him to humour and to wit, Makes even Somers to disclose his art, By racking every secret from his heart. As he flings off the statesman's sly disguise, To name the cuckold's wife with whom he lies, Even Saram, when he quaffs it, stead of tea, Fancies himself in Canterbury's sea, and S blank blank when he carousing reels, imagines that he has regained the seals. W by virtue of his juice can fight, and Stanhope of commissioners make light. Wine gives Lord Wingham aptitude of parts, and swells him with his family's deserts. Whom can it not make eloquent of speech, whom in extremest poverty not rich? Since by the means of the prevailing grape, the blank can Leechmer's warmth not only ape, but half seas o'er by its inspiring bounties, can qualify himself in several counties. What I have promised thou may rest assured, shall faithfully and gladly be procured. Nay, I'm already better than my word, new plates and knives adorn the jovial board. And lest you at their sight shouldst make wry faces, the girl has scoured the pots and washed the glasses. Tain care so excellently well to clean em, that thou mayst see thine own dear picture in em. Moreover, due provision has been made, that conversation may not be betrayed. I have no company but what is proper, to sit with the most flagrant wig at supper. There's not a man among them but must please, since they're as like each other as are peas. Tolend and Hare have jointly sent me word, They'll come, and can it thinks, to make a third, Provided he's no other invitation, From men of greater quality and station. Room will for old Mixon and Jays be left, But their discourses smell so much of theft. There would be no abiding in the room, Should two such ignorant pretenders come. However, by this trusty bearer right, if I should any other scabs invite. Though if I may my serious judgment give, I'm wholly for King Charles's number five. That was the stint in which that monarch fixed, who would not be with noisiness perplexed, and that if thou'lt agree to think it best, shall be our tale of heads without one other guest. I've nothing more now this is said to say, but to request thou'lt instantly away, and leave the duties of thy present post to some well-skilled retainer in a host. Doubtless he'll carefully thy place supply, and o'er his grace's horses have an eye, while thou, who slunk through postern more than once, dost by that means avoid a crowd of duns, and crossing o'er the Thames at temple stairs, leav'st Phillips with good words to cheat their heirs. End of section 58
Section 59 of The Poems of Jonathan Swift, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. In Sickness, written in October 1714. Tis true, then why should I repine to see my life so fast decline? But why obscurely here alone, where I am neither loved nor known? My state of health none care to learn, my life is here no soul's concern. And those with whom I now converse, without a tear will tend my hearse. Removed from kind Arbuthnot's aid, who knows his art but not his trade, preferring his regard for me before his credit or his fee. Some formal visits, looks, and words, what mere humanity affords. I meet perhaps from three or four, from whom I once expected more, which those who tend the sick for pay can act as decently as they. But no obliging tender friend to help at my approaching end. My life is now a burthen grown, to others ere it be my own. Ye formal weepers for the sick, in your last offices be quick, and spare my absent friends the grief to hear, yet give me no relief. Expired today, entombed tomorrow, when known will save a double sorrow. End of section 59. Section 60 of The Poems of Jonathan Swift, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Fable of the Bitches, written in the year 1715 on an attempt to repeal the Test Act. A bitch that was full pregnant grown by all the dogs and curs in town Finding her ripened time was come, her litter teeming from her womb, went here and there and everywhere to find an easy place to lay her. At length to music's house she came, and begged like one both blind and lame. My only friend, my dear, said she, you see, tis mere necessity, hath sent me to your house to whelp, I die if you refuse your help. With fawning whine and rueful tone, with artful sigh and feigned groan, with couchant cringe and flattering tail, smooth body did so far prevail, that music gave her leave to litter, but mark what followed faith, she bit her. Whole baskets full of bits and scraps, and broth enough to fill her paps, for well she knew her numerous brood, for want of milk would suck her blood. But when she thought her pains were done, and now t'was high time to be gone, in civil terms, my friend, said she, my house you've had on courtesy, and now I earnestly desire that you would with your cubs retire, for should you stay but one week longer, I shall be starved with cold and hunger. The guest replied, my friend, your lave, I must a little longer crave, stay till my tender cubs can find their way, for now you see they're blind. But when we've gathered strength, I swear, we'll to our barn again repair. The time passed on, and music came, her kennel once again to claim, but Botty, lost to shame and honour, set all her cubs at once upon her made her retire and quit her right, and loudly cried, A bite! A bite! The Moral Thus did the Grecian wooden horse conceal a fatal armed force, no sooner brought within the walls, but Ilium's lost, and Priam falls. End of section 60 Section 61 of The Poems of Jonathan Swift, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 
Horace, Book Three, Ode Two, to the Earl of Oxford, late Lord Treasurer, sent to him when in the Tower, 1716. How blessed is he who for his country dies, since death pursues the coward as he flies. The youth in vain would fly from fate's attack, with trembling knees and terror at his back. Though fear should lend him pinions like the wind, yet swifter fate will seize him from behind. Virtue repulsed, yet knows not to repine, but shall with unattainted honour shine, nor stoops to take the staff, nor lays it down, just as the rabble please to smile or frown. Virtue to crown her favourites loves to try some new unbeaten passage to the sky, where Jove a seat among the gods will give to those who die for meriting to live. Next, faithful silence hath a sure reward. Within our breast be every secret barred. He who betrays his friend shall never be under one roof or in one ship with me. For who with traitors would his safety trust, lest with the wicked heaven involve the just? And though the villains scape a while, he feels slow vengeance like a bloodhound at his heels. End of section 61. Section 62 of The Poems of Jonathan Swift, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. On the Church's Danger Good Halifax and pious Wharton cry, The Church has vapours, there's no danger nigh. In those we love, not we no danger see. And were they hanged, there would no danger be. But we must silent be amidst our fears, And not believe our senses but the peers. So ravishers, that know no sense of shame, First stop her mouth, and then debauch the dame. A Poem on High Church High Church is undone, as sure as a gun, For old Peter Patch is departed. And ears in Delon and the rest of that spawn are tacking about broken hearted. For strong Gill of Sarum, that Dakotum Amarum has prescribed a dose of Kant fail, which will make them resign their flasks of French wine and spice up their Nottingham ale. It purges the spleen of dislikes to the Queen and has one effect that is odder. When easement they use, they always will choose the conformity bill for bum fodder. End of section 62. Section 63 of The Poems of Jonathan Swift, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A poem occasioned by the hangings in the castle of Dublin, in which the story of Phaeton is expressed. Not asking or expecting aught, one day I went to view the court, unbent and free from care or thought, though thither fears and hopes resort. A piece of tapestry took my eye, the faded colours spoke it old, but wrought with curious imagery, the figures lively seemed and bold. Here you might see the youth prevail, in vain our eloquence and wit, the boy persists Apollo's frail, wisdom to nature does submit. There mounts the eager charioteer, soon from his seat he's downward hurled, here Jove in anger doth appear, there all beneath the flaming world. What does this idle fiction mean? Is truth at court in such disgrace? It may not on the walls be seen, nor e'en in picture show its face? No, no, tis not a senseless tale, by sweet-tongued Ovid dressed so fine, it does important truths conceal, and here was placed by wise design. A lesson deep with learning fraught, were thee the cabinet of kings, fit subject of their constant thought, in matchless verse the poet sings. 
Well should he weigh, who does aspire To empire, whether truly great, His head, his heart, his hand conspire To make him equal to that seat. If only fond desire of sway, By avarice or ambition fed, Make him affect to guide the day, Alas, what strange confusions bred! If either void of princely care, Remiss he holds the slackened rein, If rising heats or mad career, Unskilled he knows not to restrain, Or if perhaps he gives a loose, In wanton pride to show his skill, How easily he can reduce, And curb the people's rage at will. In wild uproar they hurry on, The great, the good, the just, the wise, Law and religion overthrown, Are first marked out for sacrifice. When to a height their fury grown, Finding too late he can't retire, He proves the real phiathon, And truly sets the world on fire. End of section 63《No degenerate weeds the rich ground did produce, But all things afforded both beauty and use. Till from dunghill transplanted, while yet but a sed, A nettle reared up his inglorious head. The gardener would wisely have rooted him up, To stop the increase of a barbarous crop. But the master forbid him, and after the fashion, Of foolish good nature and blind moderation, Forbore him through pity, and chose as much rather To ask him some questions first, how he came thither. Kind sir, quoth the nettle, a stranger I come, For conscience compelled to relinquish my home, Cause I wouldn't subscribe to a mystery dark, That the prince of all trees is the Jesuit's bark. An erroneous tenet I know, sir, that you, No more than myself, will allow to be true. To you I for refuge and sanctuary sue, There's none so renowned for compassion as you. And though in some things I may differ from these, The rest of your fruitful and beautiful trees, Though your digging and dunging my nature much harms, And I cannot comply with your garden in forms, Yet I and my family, after our fashion, Will peaceably stick to our own education. Be pleased to allow them a place for to rest him, For the rest of your trees we will never molest him. A kind shelter to us and protection afford, Will do you no harm, sir, I'll give you my word. The good man was soon won by this plausible tale, So fraud on good nature doth often prevail. He welcomes his guest, gives him free toleration, In the midst of his garden to take up his station, And into his breast doth his enemy bring, he little suspected the nettle could sting. Till flushed with success, and of strength to be feared, Around him a numerous offspring he reared. Then the master grew sensible what he had done, And fain he would have his new guest to be gone. But now was too late to bid him turn aught, A well-rooted possession already was got. The old trees decayed, and in their room grew A stubborn, pestilent, poisonous crew. The master who first the young brood had admitted, They stung like ingrates, and left him unpitted. No help from manuring or planting was found, The ill-weeds had eat out the heart of the ground. All weeds they let in, and none they refuse, That would join to oppose the good man of the house. Thus one nettle uncropped increased to such store, That t'was nothing but weeds that was garden before. End of section 64 Section 65 of The Poems of Jonathan Swift, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Satirical Elegy on the Death of a Late Famous General His grace impossible, what, dead? Of old age too, and in his bed? And could that mighty warrior fall, And so inglorious after all? 
Well, since he's gone, no matter how, The last loud trump must wake him now. And trust me, as the noise grows stronger, He'd wish to sleep a little longer. And could he be indeed so old, As by the newspapers were told? Three score, I think, is pretty high, T'was time in conscience he should die. This world he cumbered long enough, He burnt his candle to the snuff. And that's the reason, some folks think, He left behind so great a stink. Behold his funeral appears, nor widows' sighs, nor orphans' tears. Want at such times each heart to pierce, attend the progress of his hearse. But what of that, his friends may say, he had those honours in his day. True to his profit and his pride, he made them weep before he died. Come hither, all ye empty things, ye bubbles raised by breath of kings who float upon the tide of state, come hither and behold your fate. Let pride be taught by this rebuke, how very mean a thing's a duke. From all his ill-got honours flung, turned to that dirt from whence he sprung. End of section 65 Section 66 of The Poems of Jonathan Swift, Volume 2 this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Parody on the speech of Dr. Benjamin Pratt, Provost of Trinity College, to the Prince of Wales. Illustrious Prince, we're come before ye, who, more than in our founder's glory, to be by you protected. Deign to descend and give us laws, for we are converts to your cause, from this day well affected. The noble view of your high merits has charmed our thoughts and fixed our spirits with zeal so warm and hearty, that we resolved to be devoted, at least until we be promoted, by your just power and party. Urged by a passionate desire of being raised a little higher from lazy cloistered life, we cannot flatter you nor fawn, but fain would honoured be with lawn, and settled by a wife. For this we have before resorted, paid levies punctually and courted, our charge at home long quitting. But now we're come just in the nick, upon a vacant bishopric, this bait can't fail of hitting. Thus, sir, you see how much affection, not interest, sways in this election but sense of loyal duty. For you surpass all princes far, as glowworms do exceed a star, in goodness, wit, and beauty. To you our Irish commons owe that wisdom which their actions show, their principles from our springs. Taught ere the deal himself could dream on, that of their illustrious house a stem on, should rise the best of kings. The glad presages with our eyes behold a king chaste, vigilant, and wise, in foreign fields victorious, who in his youth the Turks attacks, and made them still to turn their backs. Was ever king so glorious? Since Ormond's like a traitor gone, we scorn to do what some have done, for learning much more famous. Fools may pursue their adverse fate, and stick to the unfortunate, we laugh while they condemn us. For being of that generous mind, to success we are still inclined, and quit the suffering tide. If on our friends cross planets frown, we join the cry and hunt them down, and sail with wind and tide. Hence twas this choice we long delayed, till our rash foes the rebels fled, whilst fortune held the scale. But since they're driven like mist before you, Our rising sun we now adore you, Because you now prevail. Descend then from your lofty seat, Behold the attending muses wait, With us to sing your praises. Calliope now strings up her lyre, And Clio Phoebus does inspire, The theme their fancy raises. If then our nursery you will nourish, We and our muses too will flourish, Encouraged by your favour. Will doctrines teach the times to serve, 
And more five thousand pounds deserve By future good behaviour. Now take our harp into your hand, The joyful strings at your command, In doleful sounds no more shall mourn. We with sincerity of heart To all your tunes shall bear a part, Unless we see the tables turn. If so, great sir, you will excuse us, For we and our attending muses May live to change our strain, And turn with merry hearts our tune Upon some happy tenth of June, To the king enjoys his own again. End of section 66《セクション67 of the Poems of Jonathan Swift, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. An Excellent New Song on a Seditious Pamphlet, 1720 to 21, to the tune of Packington's Pound. Brocades and damasks and tabbies and gauzes are by Robert Ballantyne lately brought over, with forty things more, now hear what the law says, whoe'er will not wear them is not the king's lover. Though a printer and a dean seditiously mean our true Irish hearts from old England to wean, will buy English silks for our wives and our daughters in spite of his deanship and journeyman waters. In England the dead in woollen are clad, the dean and his printer then let us cry fie on, to be clothed like a carcass would make a teague mad, since a living dog better is than a dead lion. Our wives they grow sullen at wearing of woollen, and all we poor shopkeepers must our horns pull in. Then we'll buy English silks for our wives and our daughters, in spite of his deanship and journeyman waters. Whoever our trading with England would hinder, to inflame both the nations do plainly conspire, because Irish linen will soon turn to tinder, and wool it is greasy and quickly takes fire. Therefore I assure ye, our noble grand jury, when they saw the dean's book they were in a great fury. They would buy English silks for their wives and their daughters, in spite of his deanship and journeyman waters. This wicked rogue waters, who always is sinning, and before Coram Nobis so oft has been called, henceforward shall print neither pamphlets nor linen, and if swearing can't dote, shall be swingingly mauled. And as for the dean, you know whom I mean, if the printer will peach him, he'll scarce come off clean. Then we'll buy English silks for our wives and our daughters, in spite of his deanship and journeyman waters. End of section 67 Section 68 of The Poems of Jonathan Swift, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Run Upon the Bankers The bold encroachers on the deep gain by degrees huge tracts of land, till Neptune, with one general sweep, turns all again to barren strand. The multitude's capricious pranks are said to represent the seas, breaking the bankers and the banks, resume their own whene'er they please. Money, the lifeblood of the nation, corrupts and stagnates in the veins, unless a proper circulation its motion and its heat maintains. Because tis lordly not to pay, Quakers and aldermen and state, like peers have levies every day of duns attending at their gate. We want our money on the nail, the banker's ruined if he pays. They seem to act an ancient tale, the birds are met to strip the jays. Riches, the wisest monarch sings, make pinions for themselves to fly. They fly like bats on parchment wings, and geese their silver plumes supply. No money left for squandering heirs, bills turn the lenders into debtors. The wish of Nero now is theirs, that they had never known their letters. Conceive the works of midnight hags, tormenting fools behind their backs. Thus bankers o'er their bills and bags sit squeezing images of wax. Conceive the whole enchantment broke, the witches left in open air, with power no more than other folk, 
Expose with all their magic wear. So powerful are a banker's bills, Where creditors demand their due, They break up counters, doors, and tills, And leave the empty chests in view. Thus when an earthquake lets in light Upon the god of gold and hell, Unable to endure the sight, He hides within his darkest cell. As when a conjurer takes a lease From Satan for a term of years, The tenant's in a dismal case When e'er the bloody bond appears. A baited banker thus desponds, From his own hand foresees his fall. They have his soul who have his bonds, Tis like the writing on the wall. How will the caitiff wretch be scared when first he finds himself awake, at the last trumpet unprepared, and all his grand account to make? For in that universal call few bankers will to heaven be mounters. They'll cry, Ye shops upon us fall, conceal and cover us, ye counters. When other hands the scales shall hold, and they in men's and angels' sight, produced with all their bills and gold, Weighed in the balance and found light. End of section sixty eight. Section sixty nine of the Poems of Jonathan Swift, Volume two. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Upon the horrid plot discovered by Harlequin, the Bishop of Rochester's French dog, in a dialogue between a Whig and a Tory. I asked a Whig the other night, how came this wicked plot to light? He answered that a dog of late informed a minister of state. Said I, from thence I nothing know, for are not all informers so? A villain who his friend betrays, we style him by no other phrase, and so a perjured dog denotes Porter and Pendergast and Oates, and forty others I could name, Whig, but you must know this dog was lame. Tory, a weighted argument indeed, your evidence was lame. Proceed. Come help your lame dog o'er the stile, Whig. Sir, you mistake me all this while. I mean a dog, without a joke, can howl and bark, but never spoke. Tory, I'm still to seek which dog you mean, whether Ker Plunkett or Whelp Skeen, an English or an Irish hound, or t'other puppy that was drowned, or Mason that abandoned bitch, then pray be free and tell me which, for every stander by was marking that all the noise they made was barking. You pay them well, the dogs have got their dog's head in a porridge pot. And twas but just, for wise men say, That every dog must have his day. Dog Walpole laid a quart of nog on He'd either make a hog or dog on And looked, since he has got his wish, As if he had thrown down a dish. Yet this I dare foretell you from it, He'll soon return to his own vomit. Whig. Besides this horrid plot was found By Naino after he was drowned. Tory. Why then the proverb is not right, since you can teach dead dogs to bite. Whig, I prove my proposition full, but Jacobites are strangely dull. Now let me tell you plainly, sir, our witness is a real cur. A dog of spirit for his years has twice two legs, two hanging ears. His name is Harlequin, I wot, and that's a name in every plot. Resolved to save the British nation, though French by birth and education, his correspondence plainly dated, was all deciphered and translated. His answers were exceeding pretty, before the secret wise committee. Confessed as plain as he could bark, then with his forefoot set his mark. Tory, then all this while I have been bubbled, I thought it was a dog in doublet. The matter now no longer sticks, for statesmen never want dog tricks. But since it was a real cur, and not a dog in metaphor, I give you joy of the report that he's to have a place at court. Whig. Yes, and a place he will grow rich in, a turnspit in the royal kitchen. Sir, to be plain, I tell you what, we had occasion for a plot, and when we found the dog begin it, we guessed the bishop's foot was in it. Tory, I own it was a dangerous project, and you have proved it by dog logic. Sure such intelligence between a dog and bishop ne'er was seen. 
Till you began to change the breed, Your bishops are all dogs indeed. End of section 69section 70 of the poems of jonathan swift volume 2 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org a quibbling elegy on judge boat 1723 two mournful ditties clio change thy note since cruel fate has sunk our justice boat why should he sink where nothing seemed to press, his lading little, his ballast less, tossed in the waves of this tempestuous world, at length his anchor fixed and canvas furled, to lazy hill, retiring from his court, at his ring's end he founders in the port. With water filled, he could no longer float, the common death of many a stronger boat a post so filled on nature's laws and trenches benches on boats are placed not boats on benches and yet our boat how shall i reconcile it was both a boat and in one sense a pilot with every wind he sailed and well could tack had many pendants but abhorred a jack he's gone although his friends began to hope that he might yet be lifted by a rope behold the awful bench on which he sat he was as hard and ponderous wood as that yet when his sand was out we find at last that death has overset him with a blast our boat is now sailed to the stygian ferry there to supply old charon's leaky wherry charon in him will ferry souls to hell a trade our boat has practised here so well and cerberus has ready in his paws both pitch and brimstone to fill up his flaws yet spite of death and fate i here maintain we may place boat in his old post again the way is thus and well deserves your thanks take the three strongest of his broken planks fix them on high conspicuous to be seen formed like the triple tree near stephen's green and when we view it thus with thief at endant we'll cry look here's our boat and there's the pendant the epitaph here lies judge boat within a coffin pray gentle folks forbear your scoffing a boat a judge yes where's the blunder a wooden judge is no such wonder and in his robes you must agree no boat was better decked than he tis needless to describe him fuller in short he was an able sculler end of section seventy section seventy one of the poems of jonathan swift volume two this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Verses occasioned by Whitshed's motto on his coach, 1724. Libertas et Natali solum, fine words, I wonder where you stole em. Could nothing but thy chief reproach serve for a motto on thy coach? But let me now the words translate, Natali solum, my estate my dear estate how well i love it my tenants if you doubt will prove it they swear i am so kind and good i hug them till i squeeze their blood libertas bears a large import first how to swagger in a court and secondly to show my fury against an uncomplying jury and thirdly tis a new invention to favour wood and keep my pension and fourthly tis to play an odd trick get the great seal and turn out broderick and fifthly you know whom i mean to humble that vexatious dean and sixthly for my soul to barter it for fifty times is worth to carter it now since your motto thus you construe i must confess you've spoken once true libertas et natali solum you had good reason when you stole em
End of section 71. Section 72 of The Poems of Jonathan Swift, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Prometheus on Wood, the Patentee's Irish Halfpence, 1724. When first the squire and Tinker Wood, gravely consulting Ireland's good, Together mingled in a mass, Smith's dust and copper, lead and brass, the mixture thus by chemic art, united close in every part, in fillets rolled or cut in pieces, appeared like one continued species, and by the forming engine struck, on all the same impression took. So to confound this hated coin, all parties and religions join. Whigs, Tories, Trimmers, Hanoverians, Quakers, Conformists, Presbyterians, Scotch, Irish, English, French, unite with equal interest, equal spite. Together mingled in a lump, do all in one opinion jump, and every one begins to find the same impression on his mind. A strange event, whom gold incites to blood and quarrels, brass unites. So goldsmiths say the coarsest stuff will serve for solder well enough. So by the kettle's loud alarms the bees are gathered into swarms. So by the brazen trumpet's bluster troops of all tongues and nations muster. And so the harp of Ireland brings whole crowds about its brazen strings. There is a chain let down from Jove, but fastened to his throne above, so strong that from the lower end they say all human things depend. This chain, as ancient poets hold, when Jove was young, was made of gold. Prometheus once this chain purloined, dissolved and into money coined. Then whips me on a chain of brass. Venus was bribed to let it pass. Now while this brazen chain prevailed, Jove saw that all devotion failed. No temple to his godship raised, no sacrifice on altars blazed. In short, such dire confusion followed, earth must have been in chaos swallowed. Jove stood amazed, but looking round, with much ado the cheat he found. T'was plain he could no longer hold the world in any chain but gold. And to the god of wealth his brother sent Mercury to get another. Prometheus on a rock is laid, tied with the chain himself had made, on icy Caucasus to shiver, while vultures eat his growing liver. Ye powers of Grub Street, make me able discreetly to apply this fable. Say who is to be understood by that old thief Prometheus would? For Jove, it is not hard to guess him, I mean his majesty, God bless him. This thief and blacksmith was so bold, he strove to steal that chain of gold, which links the subject to the king, and change it for a brazen string. But sure, if nothing else must pass betwixt the king and us but brass, although the chain will never crack, yet our devotion may grow slack. But Jove will soon convert, I hope, this brazen chain into a rope, with which Prometheus shall be tied, and high in air for ever ride, where, if we find his liver grows, for want of vultures, we have crows. End of section 72。section 73 of The Poems of Jonathan Swift, volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Verses on the Revival of the Order of the Bath, During Walpole's Administration, A.D. 1725. Quoth King Robin, our ribbons I see are too few, Of St. Andrew's the green, and St. George's the blue. I must find out another of colour more gay, That will teach all my subjects with pride to obey. Though the exchequer be drained by prodigal donors, yet the king near exhausted his fountain of honours. Men of more wit than money our pensions will fit, and this will fit men of more money than wit. Thus my subjects with pleasure will obey my commands, though as empty as young and as saucy as sands. 
And he who'll leap over a stick for the king Is qualified best for a dog in a string. Epigram on Wood's Brass Money Carteret was welcomed to the shore, first with the brazen cannon's roar. To meet him next the soldier comes, with brazen trumps and brazen drums. Approaching near the town, he hears, the brazen bells salute his ears. But when Wood's brass began to sound, guns, trumpets, drums, and bells were drowned. End of section 73of the poems of jonathan swift volume two this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. a simile on our want of silver and the only way to remedy it 1725 as when of old some sorceress threw o'er the moon's face a sable hue to drive unseen her magic chair at midnight through the darkened air wise people who believed with reason that this eclipse was out of season affirmed the moon was sick and fell to cure her by a counter spell ten thousand symbols now begin to rend the skies with brazen din the symbols rattling sounds dispel the cloud and drive the hag to hell the moon delivered from her pain displays her silver face again note here that in the chemic style the moon is silver all this while so if my simile you minded which i confess is too long-winded when late a feminine magician joined with the brazen politician exposed to blind the nation's eyes a parchment of prodigious size concealed behind that ample screen there was no silver to be seen but to this parchment let the drapier oppose his counter charm of paper and ring wood's copper in our ears so loud till all the nation hears that sound will make the parchment shrivel and drive the conjurers to the devil and when the sky is grown serene our silver will appear again end of section seventy four Section 75 of The Poems of Jonathan Swift, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Wood, an Insect, 1725. By long observation, I have understood that two little vermin are kin to Will Wood. The first is an insect they call a woodlouse, that folds up itself in itself for a house. As round as a ball without head without tail, enclosed cap a pea in a strong coat of mail. And thus William Wood to my fancy appears, in fillets of brass rolled up to his ears. And over these fillets he wisely has thrown, to keep out of danger a doublet of stone. The louse of the wood for a medicine is used, or swallowed alive, or skilfully bruised. And let but our mother Hibernia contrive to swallow Will Wood, either bruised or alive. She need be no more with the jaundice possessed, or sick of obstructions and pains in her chest. The next is an insect we call a wood worm, that lies in old wood like a hare in her form. With teeth or with claws it will bite or will scratch, and chambermaids christen this worm a death watch. Because like a watch it always cries click, then woe be to those in the house who are sick. For as sure as a gun they will give up the ghost, if the maggot cries click when it scratches the post. But a kettle of scalding hot water injected infallibly cures the timber affected. The omen is broken, the danger is over, the maggot will die, and the sick will recover. Such a worm was Will Wood, when he scratched at the door, of a governing statesman or favourite whore. The death of our nation he seemed to foretell, and the sound of his brass we took for our knell. But now, since the drapier has heartily mauled him, I think the best thing we can do is to scald him for which operation there's nothing more proper than the liquor he deals in his own melted copper. 
unless, like the Dutch, you rather would boil this coiner of wraps in a cauldron of oil. Then choose which you please, and let each bring a faggot, for our fear's at an end with the death of the maggot. End of section 75《セクション76of the Poems of Jonathan Swift, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. On Wood the Ironmonger, 1725. Salmoneus, as the Grecian tale is, was a mad coppersmith of Elis. Up at his forge by morning peep, no creature in the lane could sleep. Among a crew of roistering fellows would sit whole evenings at the alehouse. His wife and children wanted bread, while he went always drunk to bed. This vapouring scab must needs devise to ape the thunder of the skies. With brass two fiery steeds he shod, to make a clattering as they trod. Of polished brass his flaming car like lightning dazzled from afar. And up he mounts into the box, and he must thunder with a pox. Then furious he begins his march, drives rattling o'er a brazen arch, with squibs and crackers armed to throw among the trembling crowd below. All ran to prayers both priests and laity to pacify this angry deity, when Jove in pity to the town with real thunder knocked him down. Then what a huge delight were all in to see the wicked varlet sprawling, they searched his pockets on the place, and found his copper all was base. They laughed at such an Irish blunder, to take the noise of brass for thunder. The moral of this tale is proper, applied to Wood's adulterate copper, which, as he scattered, we, like dolts, mistook at first for thunderbolts. Before the drapier shot a letter, nor Jove himself could do it better, which lighting on the impostor's crown, like real thunder, knocked him down. End of section 76. Section 77 of The Poems of Jonathan Swift, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Will Wood's Petition to the People of Ireland Being an excellent new song supposed to be made and sung in the streets of Dublin by William Wood, Ironmonger and Halfpenny Monger, 1725 My dear Irish folks, come leave off your jokes and buy up my halfpence so fine, so fair and so bright, they'll give you delight, observe how they glisten and shine. They'll sell to my grief as cheap as neck beef for counters at cards to your wife. And every day your children may play, span farthing or toss on the knife. Come hither and try, I'll teach you to buy a pot of good ale for a farthing. Come threepence a score, I ask you no more, and a fig for the drapier and harding. When tradesmen have gold, the thief will be bold by day and by night for to rob him. My copper is such, no robber will touch, and so you may daintily bob him. The little black guard who gets very hard his halfpence for cleaning your shoes, when his pockets are crammed with mine and be damned, he may swear he has nothing to lose. Here's halfpence in plenty, for one you'll have twenty, though thousands are not worth a puddin'. Your neighbours will think when your pocket cries chink, you are grown plaguy rich on a sudden. You will be my thankers, I'll make you my bankers, as good as Ben Burton or Fade. For nothing shall pass but my pretty brass, and then you'll be all of a trade. I'm a son of a whore, if I have a word more to say in this wretched condition. If my coin will not pass, I must die like an ass, and so I conclude my petition. End of section 77 Section 78 of The Poems of Jonathan Swift, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A New Song on Wood's Halfpence 
Ye people of Ireland, both country and city, Come listen with patience, and hear out my ditty. At this time I'll choose to be wiser than witty, Which nobody can deny. The halfpence are coming, the nation's undoing, There's an end of your ploughing and baking and brewing. In short, you must all go to wreck and to ruin, Which nobody can deny. Both high men and low men and thick men and tall men and rich men and poor men and free men and thrall men will suffer and this man and that man and all men which nobody can deny. The soldier is ruined, poor man, by his pay. His five pence will prove but a farthing a day for meat or for drink or he must run away which nobody can deny. When he pulls out his tuppence, the tapster says not that ten times as much he must pay for his shot, and thus the poor soldier must soon go to pot, which nobody can deny. If he goes to the baker, the baker will huff, and twenty pence have for a tuppenny loaf, then dog rogue and rascal, and so kick and cuff, which nobody can deny. Again to the market, whenever he goes, the butcher and soldier must be mortal foes, one cuts off an ear and the other a nose, which nobody can deny. The butcher is stout and he values no swagger, a cleaver's a match any time for a dagger, and a blue sleeve may give such a cuff as may stagger, which nobody can deny. The beggars themselves will be broke in a trice, when thus their poor farthings are sunk in their price, when nothing is left they must live on their lice, which nobody can deny. The squire who has got him twelve thousand a year, O oh Lord, what a mountain his rents would appear! Should he take them he would not have house-room, I fear, which nobody can deny. Though at present he lives in a very large house, there would then not be room in it left for a mouse, but the squire is too wise, he will not take a souse, which nobody can deny. The farmer who comes with his rent in this cash, for taking these counters and being so rash, will be kicked out of doors both himself and his trash, which nobody can deny. For in all the leases that ever we hold, we must pay our rent in good silver and gold, and not in brass tokens of such a base mould, which nobody can deny. The wisest of lawyers all swear they will warrant, no money but silver and gold can be current, and since they will swear it, we all may be sure on't, which nobody can deny. And I think, after all, it would be very strange to give current money for base in exchange, like a fine lady swapping her moles for the mange, which nobody can deny. But read the king's patent, and there you will find that no man need take them but who has a mind, for which we must say that his majesty's kind, which nobody can deny. Now God bless the draper who opened our eyes, I'm sure by his book that the writer is wise, he shows us the cheat from the end to the rise, which nobody can deny. Nay, farther he shows it a very hard case, that this fellow would, of a very bad race, should of all the fine gentry of Ireland take place, which nobody can deny. That he and his halfpence should come to weigh down our subjects so loyal and true to the crown, but I hope after all that they will be his own, which nobody can deny. This book, I do tell you, is writ for your goods, and a very good book tis against Mr. Woods's. If you stand true together, he's left in the suds, which nobody can deny. Ye shopmen and tradesmen and farmers, go read it, for I think in my soul at this time that you need it or egad if you don't there's an end of your credit which nobody can deny end of section 78。section 79 of the poems of jonathan swift volume 2 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org a Serious Poem Upon William Wood, Brazier, Tinker, Hardware Man, Coiner, Founder, and Esquire. When foes are overcome, we preserve them from slaughter, to be hewers of wood and drawers of water. Now, although to draw water is not very good, yet we all should rejoice to be hewers of wood. I own it has often provoked me to mutter that a rogue so obscure should make such a clutter, but ancient philosophers wisely remark that old rotten wood will shine in the dark. 
The heathens, we read, had gods made of wood, Who could do them no harm if they did them no good. But this idle wood may do us great evil, Their gods were of wood, but our wood is the devil. To cut down fine wood is a very bad thing, And yet we all know much gold it will bring. Then if cutting down wood brings money good store, Our money to keep, let us cut down one more. Now hear an old tale, there anciently stood, I forget in what church, an image of wood. Concerning this image there went a prediction, It would burn a whole forest, nor was it a fiction. T'was cut into faggots and put to the flame, To burn an old friar, one forest, my name. My tale is a wise one, if well understood, Find you but the friar, and I'll find the wood. I hear among scholars there is a great doubt, from what kind of tree this wood was hewn out. Teague made a good pun by a brogue in his speech, and said, By my shoal, he's the son of a beech. Some call him a thorn, the curse of the nation, as thorns were designed to be from the creation. Some think him cut out from the poisonous yew, beneath whose ill shade no plant ever grew. Some say he's a birch, a thought very odd, for none but a dunce would come under his rod. But I'll tell the secret, and pray do not blab, he is an old stump, cut out of a crab. And England has put this crab to a hard use, to cudgel our bones, and for drink give us for juice. And therefore his witnesses justly may boast, that none are more properly knights of the post. But here Mr. Wood complains that we mock, though he may be a blockhead, he's no real block. He can eat, drink, and sleep, now and then, for a friend, He'll not be too proud an old kettle to mend. He can lie like a courtier and think it no scorn, When gold's to be got, to forswear and suborn. He can wrap his own wraps, and has the true sapience, To turn a good penny to twenty bad halfpence. Then in spite of your sophistry, honest Will Wood, Is a man of this world all true flesh and blood. So you are but in jest, and you will not, I hope, Unman the poor knave for the sake of a trope. "'Tis a metaphor known to every plain thinker, "'just as when we say the devil's a tinker, "'which cannot in literal sense be made good, "'unless by the devil we mean Mr. Wood. "'But some will object that the devil oft spoke "'in heathenish times from the trunk of an oak, "'and since we must grant there never were known "'more heathenish times than those of our own, Perhaps you will say, tis the devil that puts the words in Wood's mouth, or speaks from his guts. And then your old argument still will return, howe'er let us try him and see how he'll burn. You'll pardon me, sir, your cunning I smoke, but Wood, I assure you, is no heart of oak. And instead of the devil, this son of perdition hath joined with himself two hags in commission. I ne'er could endure my talent to smother. I told you one tale, and I'll tell you another. A joiner to fasten a saint in a niche, bored a large auger hole in the image's bridge, but finding the statue to make no complaint, he would ne'er be convinced it was a true saint. When the true wood arrives, as he soon will, no doubt, for that's but a sham wood they carry about, what stuff he is made of you quickly may find if you made the same trial and bore him behind. I'll hold you a groat when you wimble his bum, He'll bellow as loud as the dale in a drum. From me I declare you shall have no denial, And there can be no harm in making a trial. And when to the joy of your hearts he has roared, You may show him about for a new groaning board. Now ask me a question, how came it to pass? Wood got so much copper, he got it by brass. This brass was a dragon, Observe what I tell ye, this dragon had gotten two sows in his belly. I know you will say this is all heathen Greek. I own it, and therefore I leave you to seek. I often have seen two plays very good, called Love in a Tub and Love in a Wood. These comedies twain friend Wood will contrive on the scene of this land very soon to revive. First Love in a Tub, Squire Wood has in store, strong tubs for his wraps, two thousand and more. These wraps he will honestly dig out with shovels, And sell them for gold, or he can't show his love else. Wood swears he will do it for Ireland's good, Then can you deny it is love in a wood? However, if critics find fault with the phrase, I hope you will own it is love in a maze. For when to express a friend's love you are willing, 
We never say more than your love is a million. But with honest Wood's love there is no contending, Tis fifty round millions of love and amending. Then in his first love why should he be crossed? I hope he will find it that no love is lost. Hear one story more, and then I will stop. I dreamt Wood was told he should die by a drop. So methought he resolved no liquor to tast, for fear the first drop might as well be his last. But dreams are like oracles, tis hard to explain em, for it proved that he died of a drop at Kilmainham. I waked with delight, and not without hope, very soon to see Wood drop down from a rope. How he and how we at each other should grin, tis kindness to hold a friend up by the chin. But soft, says the herald, I cannot agree, for metal on metal is false heraldry. Why, that may be true, yet wood upon wood, I'll maintain with my life, is heraldry good. End of section 79. Section 80 of The Poems of Jonathan Swift, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. An excellent new song upon the declarations of the several corporations of the city of Dublin against Wood's halfpence. To the tune of London is a fine town, etc. Oh, Dublin is a fine town and a gallant city, for Wood's trash is tumbled down. Come listen to my ditty. O oh, Dublin is a fine town and a gallant city, for Wood's trash is tumbled down. Come listen to my ditty. In full assembly all did meet of every corporation, from every lane and every street to save the sinking nation. O oh, Dublin is a fine town and a gallant city, for Wood's trash is tumbled down. Come listen to my ditty. The bankers would not let it pass for to be Wood's tellers, instead of gold to count his brass and fill their small beer cellars. O oh, Dublin is a fine town and a gallant city, for Wood's trash is tumbled down. Come listen to my ditty. And next to them to take his coin, the guild would not submit. They all did go and all did join, and so their names they writ. O oh, Dublin is a fine town and a gallant city, for Wood's trash is tumbled down. Come listen to my ditty. The brewers met within their hall and spoke in lofty strains. These halfpence shall not pass at all. They want so many grains. O oh, Dublin is a fine town and a gallant city, For Wood's trash has tumbled down. Come listen to my ditty. The tailors came upon this pinch And wished the dog in hell. Should we give this same Wood an inch, We know he'd take an L. O oh, Dublin is a fine town and a gallant city, For Wood's trash is tumbled down. Come listen to my ditty. But now the noble clothiers of honour and renown, If they take Wood's halfpence, they will be all cast down. O oh, Dublin is a fine town and a gallant city, For Wood's trash is tumbled down, come listen to my ditty. The shoemakers came on the next and said they would much rather Than be by Wood's copper vexed, take money stamped on leather. O oh, Dublin is a fine town and a gallant city, For Wood's trash is tumbled down, come listen to my ditty. The chandlers next in order came, and what they said was right. They hoped the rogue that laid the scheme would soon be brought to light. O oh, Dublin is a fine town, and a gallant city, for Wood's trash is tumbled down, come listen to my ditty. And that if Wood were now withstood to his eternal scandal, that twenty of these halfpence should not buy a farthing candle. O oh, Dublin is a fine town, and a gallant city, for Wood's trash is tumbled down, come listen to my ditty. The butchers then, those men so brave, spoke thus and with a frown, Should Wood that cunning scoundrel knave, come here we'd knock him down. O oh, Dublin is a fine town, and a gallant city, For Wood's trash is tumbled down, come listen to my ditty. For any rogue that comes to truck and trick away our trade, Deserves not only to be stuck, but also to be flayed. O oh, Dublin is a fine town, and a gallant city, for Wood's trash is tumbled down, come listen to my ditty. The bakers in a ferment were, and wisely shook their head. Should these brass tokens once come here, we'd all have lost our bread. O oh, Dublin is a fine town, and a gallant city. For Wood's trash is tumbled down, come listen to my ditty. It set the very tinkers mad, the baseness of the metal. 
because they said it was so bad it would not mend a kettle. Oh, Dublin is a fine town and a gallant city, for wood's trash is tumbled down. Come listen to my ditty. The carpenters and joiners stood confounded in amaze. They seemed to be all in a wood, and so they went their ways. Oh, Dublin is a fine town and a gallant city, for wood's trash is tumbled down. Come listen to my ditty. This coin, how well could we employ it in raising of a statue to those brave men that would destroy it, and then old Wood have at you. Oh, Dublin is a fine town and a gallant city, for Wood's trash is tumbled down. Come listen to my ditty. God prosper long our tradesmen then, and so he will, I hope. May they be still such honest men when Wood has got a rope. Oh, Dublin is a fine town and a gallant city, for wood's trash is tumbled down. Come listen to my ditty. End of section 80. Section 81 of The Poems of Jonathan Swift, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Verses on the Upright Judge who condemned the drapier's printer. The church I hate, and have good reason, for there my grandsire cut his weasand. He cut his weasand at the altar. I keep my gullet for the halter. On the same. In church your grandsire cut his throat. To do the job too long he tarried. He should have had my hearty vote to cut his throat before he married. On the same. The judge speaks. I'm not the grandson of that ass, Quinn, nor can you prove it, Mr. Pasquin. My granddame had gallants by twenties, and bore my mother by apprentice. This when my grandsire knew, they tell us he, in Christ's church cut his throat for jealousy. And since the alderman was mad, you say, then I must be so too, ex trad, you say. Epigram In answer to the dean's verses on his own deafness. What though the dean hears not the knell Of the next church's passing bell, What though the thunder from a cloud, Or that from female tongue more loud, Alarm not at the drapier's ear, Chink but wood's halfpence, and he'll hear. End of section 81 Section 82 of The Poems of Jonathan Swift, Volume 2 this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Horace, Book One, Ode 14, Paraphrased and Inscribed to Ireland, 1726. The Inscription Poor floating isle, tossed on ill fortune's waves, ordained by fate, to be the land of slaves. Shall moving Delos now deep-rooted stand? Thou fixed of old, be now the moving land. Although the metaphor be worn and stale, be twixt estate and vessel under sail, let me suppose thee for a ship a while, and thus address thee in the sailor style. Unhappy ship! Thou art returned in vain. New waves shall drive thee to the deep again. Look to thyself, and be no more the sport Of giddy winds, but make some friendly port. Lost are thy oars that used thy course to guide, Like faithful counsellors on either side. Thy mast which like some aged patriot stood, the single pillar for his country's good, To lead thee as a staff directs the blind, Behold it cracks by yon rough eastern wind, Your cables burst, and you must quickly feel, The waves impetuous enter at your keel. Thus commonwealths receive a foreign yoke, when these strong cords of union once are broke. 
Tom, by a sudden tempest is thy sail, Expanded to invite a milder gale. As when some writer, in a public cause, His pen to save a sinking nation draws, While all is calm, his arguments prevail, The people's voice expands his paper sail, Till power discharging all her stormy bags, Flutters the feeble pamphlet into rags. The nation scared, the author doomed to death, Who fondly put his trust in poplar breath. A larger sacrifice in vain you vow, There's not a power above will help you now. A nation thus, who oft heaven's call neglects, In vain from injured heaven relief expects. Twill not avail when thy strong sides are broke, That thy descent is from the British oak, Or when your name and family you boast, From fleets triumphant o'er the Gallic coast. Such was Irene's claim, as just as thine, Her sons descended from the British line, Her matchless sons, whose valour still remains, on French records for twenty long campaigns. Yet from an empress, now a captive grown, She saved Britannia's rights and lost her own. In ships decayed, no mariner confides, Lured by the gilded stern and painted sides. Yet at a ball, unthinking fools delight In the gay trappings of a birthday night. They on the gold, brocades, and satins raved, And quite forgot their country was enslaved. Dear vessel, still be to thy steerage just, Nor change thy course with every sudden gust. Like supple patriots of the modern sort, Who turn with every gale that blows from court. Weary and seasick, when in thee confined, now for thy safety cares distract my mind. As those who long have stood the storms of state, retire yet still bemoan their country's fate. Beware, and when you hear the surges soar, avoid the rocks on Britain's angry shore. They lie, alas, too easy to be found. For thee alone they lie the island round. End of section 82of the poems of jonathan swift volume two this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org verses on the sudden drying up of saint patrick's well near trinity college dublin 1726 by holy zeal inspired and led by fame to thee once favorite isle with joy I came. What time the Goth, the Vandal, and the Hun had my own native Italy o'errun. Irony to the world's remotest parts, renowned for valor, policy, and arts. Hither from Colchis with the fleecy oar, Jason arrived two thousand years before. The happy island, Pallas called her own, when haughty Britain was a land unknown. From thee with pride the Caledonians trace, the glorious founder of their kingly race. Thy martial sons, whom now they dare despise, did once their land subdue and civilize. Their dress, their language, and the Scottish name, confess the soil from whence the victors came. Well may they boast that ancient blood which runs within their veins, who are thy younger sons. A conquest and a colony from thee, the mother kingdom left her children free. From thee no mark of slavery they felt, 
Not so with thee, thy base invaders dealt. Invited here to vengeful morrow's aid, Those whom they could not conquer, they betrayed. Britain, by thee we fell, ungrateful isle, Not by thy valour, but superior guile. Britain, with shame, confess this land of mine, First taught thee human knowledge and divine. My prelates and my students sent from hence, Made your sons converts, both to God and sense. Not like the pastors of thy ravenous breed, Who come to fleece the flocks and not to feed. Wretched irony, with what grief I see, The fatal changes time has made in thee. The Christian rites I introduced in vain, Lo, infidelity returned again. Freedom and virtue in thy sons I found, Who now in vice and slavery are drowned. By faith and prayer, this crozier in my hand, I drove the venomed serpent from thy land. The shepherd in his bower might sleep or sing, Nor dread the adder's tooth nor scorpion's sting. With omens oft I strove to warn thy swains, Omens the types of thy impending chains. I sent the magpie from the British soil, With restless beak thy blooming fruit to spoil, To din thine ears with unharmonious clack, And haunt thy holly walls in white and black. What else are those thou seest in bishop's gear, Who crop the nurseries of learning here? Aspiring, greedy, full of senseless prate, Devour the church and chatter to the state. As you grew more degenerate and base, I sent you millions of the croaking race, Emblems of insects vile who spread their spawn Through all thy land in armour, fur, and lawn. A nauseous brood that fills your senate walls and in the chambers of your viceroy crawls. See where that new devouring vermin runs, sent in my anger from the land of Huns. With harpy claws it undermines the ground, and sudden spreads a numerous offspring round. The amphibious tyrant, with his ravenous band, drains all thy lakes of fish of fruits thy land. Where is the holy well that bore my name? Fled to the fountain, back from whence it came. Fair freedom's emblem once which smoothly flows, And blessings equally on all bestows. Here, from the neighboring nursery of arts, These students drinking raised their wit and parts. Here, for an age, and more, improved their vein. Their Phoebus I, my spring, their hippocrane. Discouraged youths, now all their hopes must fail, Condemned to country, cottages, and ale. Two foreign prelates make a slavish court, And by their sweat procure a mean support. Or for the classics read the attorney's guide, Collect excise or wait upon the tide. Oh, had I been apostle to the Swiss, Or hardy Scot, or any land but this, Combined in arms, they had their foes defied, And kept their liberty, or bravely died. Thou, still with tyrants, in succession cursed, The last invaders trampling on the first, Nor fondly hope for some reverse of fate, Virtue herself would now return too late. Not half thy course of misery is run, Thy greatest evils yet are scarce begun. Soon shall thy sons, the time is just at hand, Be all made captives in their native land, When for the use of no Hibernian born, shall rise one blade of grass, one ear of corn. 
When shells and leather shall for money pass, Nor thy oppressing lords afford thee brass. But all turn leasers to that mongrel breed, Who from thee sprung, yet on thy vitals feed, Who to yon ravenous isle thy treasures bear, And waste in luxury thy harvest there. For pride and ignorance a proverb grown, The jest of wits, and to the court unknown. I scorn thy spurious and degenerate line, And from this hour my patronage resign. End of section 83《》84《of the Poems of Jonathan Swift, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. On reading Dr. Young's satire called The Universal Passion, 1726. If there be truth in what you sing, such godlike virtues in the king, a minister so filled with zeal and wisdom for the commonweal, if he who in the chair presides so steadily the senate guides, if others whom you make your theme are seconds in the glorious scheme, if every peer whom you commend to worth and learning be a friend, if this be truth as you attest, what land was ever half so blest? No falsehood now among the great, And tradesmen now no longer chait. Now on the bench fair justice shines, Her scale to neither side inclines. Now pride and cruelty are flown, And mercy here exalts her throne. For such is good example's power, It does its office every hour, Where governors are good and wise, Or else the truest maxim lies. For so we find all ancient sages decree that ad exemplum wretches, through all the realm his virtues run, ripening and kindling like the sun. If this be true, then how much more, when you have named at least a score of courtiers each in their degree, if possible as good as he? Or take it in a different view. I ask, if what you say be true, if you affirm the present age, Deserves your satire's keenest rage. If that same universal passion With every vice has filled the nation, If virtue dares not venture down A single step beneath the crown, If clergymen, to show their wit, Praise classics more than holy writ, If bankrupts, when they are undone, Into the Senate House can run, And sell their votes at such a rate As will retrieve a lost estate, if law be such a partial whore to spare the rich and plague the poor, if these be of all crimes the worst, what land was ever half so cursed? End of section 84. Section 85 of The Poems of Jonathan Swift, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Dog and the Thief, 1726 Quoth the thief to the dog, let me into your door, and I'll give you these delicate bits. Quoth the dog, I shall then be more villain than your, and besides must be out of my wits. Your delicate bits will not serve me a meal, but my master each day gives me bread. You'll fly when you get what you came here to steal, and I must be hanged in your stead. The stock jobber thus from Change Alley goes down, and tips you the freeman a wink. Let me have but your vote to serve for the town, and here is a guinea to drink. Says the freeman your guinea tonight would be spent, your offers of bribery cease. I'll vote for my landlord, to whom I pay rent, or else I may forfeit my lease. From London they come, silly people to chouse, their lands and their faces unknown. Who'd vote a rogue into the Parliament House, that would turn a man out of his own? End of section 85 
Section 86 of The Poems of Jonathan Swift, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Dialogue Between Mad Mullinix and Timothy, 1728. Mullinix. I own tis not my bread and butter, but prithee, Tim, why all this clutter? Why ever in these raging fits, damning to hell the Jacobits? When if you search the kingdom round, there's hardly twenty to be found. No, not among the priests and friars. Timothy, twixt you and me, God damn the liars. Mullinix, the Tories are gone every man over to our illustrious house of Hanover. From all their conduct this is plain, and then, Timothy, God damn the liars again. Did not an earl but lately vote to bring in, I could cut his throat, our whole accounts of public debts? Mullinix, Lord, how this frothy coxcomb frets. Aside, Timothy, did not an able statesman bishop this dangerous horrid motion dish up, as popish craft did not he rail on't show fire and faggot in the tail on't? Proving the earl a grand offender, and in a plot for the pretender, whose fleet, tis all our friend's opinion, was then embarking at Avignon. Mullinix. These wrangling jars of Whig and Tory are stale and worn as Troy Town story. The wrong, tis certain, you were both in, and now you find you fought for nothing. Your faction, when their game was new, might want such noisy fools as you. But you, when all the show is past, resolve to stand it out the last like Martin Marrell gaping on, not minding when the song is done. When all the bees are gone to settle, you clatter still your brazen kettle. The leaders whom you listed under have dropped their arms and seized the plunder. And when the war is past, you come to rattle in their ears your drum. And as that hateful hideous Grecian Thersites, he was your relation, was more abhorred and scorned by those with whom he served than by his foes, so thou art grown the detestation of all thy party through the nation. Thy peevish and perpetual teasing with plots and Jacobites and treason, thy busy never meaning face, thy screwed up front, thy state grimace, thy formal nods, important sneers, thy whisperings foisted in all ears, which are whatever you may think, but nonsense wrapped up in a stink, have made thy presence in a true sense to thy own side so damned a nuisance that when they have you in their eye, as if the devil drove, they fly. Timothy. My good friend Mullinix, forbear, I vow to God you're too severe. If it could ever yet be known, I took advice except my own, it should be yours, but damn my blood, I must pursue the public good. The faction, is it not notorious? Keck at the memory of glorious. Tis true, nor need I to be told, my quantum friends are grown so cold, that scarce a creature can be found to prance with me his statue round. The public safety, I foresee, henceforth depends alone on me, and while this vital breath I blow, or from above or from below, I'll sputter, swagger, curse, and rail, the Tories terror, scourge, and flail. Mullinix Tim, you mistake the matter quite. The Tories, you are their delight. And should you act a different part, be grave and wise, t'would break their heart. Why, Tim, you have a taste, you know, and often see a puppet show. Observe the audience is in pain, while Punch is hid behind the scene. But when they hear his rusty voice, with what impatience they rejoice. And then they value not two straws how Solomon decides the cause which the true mother, which pretender, nor listen to the witch of Endor. Should Faustus, with the devil behind him, enter the stage, they never mind him. If Punch, to stir their fancy, shows in at the door his monstrous nose, then sudden draws it back again, oh, what a pleasure mixed with pain! You every moment think an age till he appears upon the stage. And first his bum you see him clap upon the queen of Sheba's lap, the Duke of Lorraine drew his sword, Punch roaring ran and running roared, reviled all people in his jargon, and sold the King of Spain a bargain. St. George himself he plays the wagon, and mounts astride upon the dragon. He gets a thousand thumps and kicks, yet cannot leave his roguish tricks. In every action thrusts his nose, the reason why no mortal knows. 
In doleful scenes that break our heart, Punch comes like you, and lets a fart. There's not a puppet made of wood, But what would hang him if they could. While teasing all, by all he's teased, How well are these spectators pleased, Who in the motion have no share, But purely come to hear and stare. Have no concern for Sabra's sake, Which gets the better, saint or snake, Provided punch, for there's the jest, Be soundly mauled, and plague the rest. Thus Tim philosophers suppose the world consists of puppet shows, where petulant conceited fellows perform the part of punchinellos. So at this booth, which we call Dublin, Tim vowed the punch to stir up trouble in. You wriggle, fidge, and make a rout, put all your brother puppets out, run on in a perpetual round to tease, perplex, disturb, confound, intrude with monkey grin and clatter to interrupt all serious matter are grown the nuisance of your clan who hate and scorn you to a man but then the lookers-on the tories you still divert with merry stories they would consent that all the crew were hanged before they'd part with you but tell me tim upon the spot by all this toil what hast thou got if tories must have all the sport i fear you'll be disgraced at court timothy God damn my blood, I frank my letters, walk to my place before my betters, and simple as I now stand here, expect in time to be a peer. God damn me, why I got my will, near hold my peace and near stand still. I fart with twenty ladies by, they call me beast, and what care I? I bravely call the Tories jacks, and sons of whores behind their backs. But could you bring me once to think, that when I strut and stare and stink, Revile and slander, fume and storm, betray, make oath, impeach, inform, with such a constant loyal zeal, to serve myself and common weal, and fret the Tories' souls to death, I did but lose my precious breath. And when I damn my soul to plague him, am, as you tell me, but their may game. Consume my vitals, they shall know, I am not to be treated so. I'd rather hang myself by half, than give those rascals cause to laugh. But now, my friend, can I endure, once so renowned, to live obscure? No little boys and girls to cry, there's nimble Tim a-passing by. No more my dear delightful way-tread of keeping up a party hatred? Will none the Tory dogs pursue when through the streets I cry halloo? Must all my damnies, bloods, and wounds pass only now for empty stones? Shall Tory rascals be elected, although I swear them disaffected? And when I roar, a plot, a plot, will our own party mind me not? So qualified to swear and lie, will they not trust me for a spy? Dear Mullinix, your good advice, I beg, you see the case is nice. Oh, were I equal in renown, like thee, to please this thankless town, or blessed with such engaging parts to win the truant schoolboy's hearts. Thy virtues meet their just reward, attended by the sable guard. Charmed by thy voice, the prentice drops the snowball destined at thy chops. Thy graceful steps and colonel's air allure the cinder picking fair. Mullinix. No more, in mark of true affection, I take thee under my protection. Your parts are good, tis not denied. I wish they had been well applied. But now observe my counsel, viz. Adapt your habit to your fizz. You must no longer thus equip ye, as Horace says, optat ephipia. There's Latin, too, that you may see, how much improved by Dr. D. I have a coat at home that you may try, tis just like this which hangs by geometry. My hat has much the nicer air, your block will fit it to a hair. That wig I would not for the world have it so formal and so curled. Twill be so oily and so sleek when I've lain in it a week. You'll find it well prepared to take the figure of toupee and snake. Thus dressed alike from top to toe, that which is which tis hard to know. When first in public we appear, I'll lead the van, keep you the rear. Be careful as you walk behind, use all the talents of your mind. Be studious well to imitate my portly motion, mien, and gait. Mark my address and learn my style, when to look scornful, when to smile. Nor sputter out your oaths so fast, 
but keep your swearing to the last. Then at our leisure we'll be witty, and in the streets divert the city. The ladies from the windows gaping, the children all our motions aping. Your conversation to refine, I'll take you to some friends of mine. Choice spirits who employ their parts to mend the world by useful arts. Some cleansing hollow tubes to spy, direct the zenith of the sky. Some have the city in their care, from noxious steams to purge the air. Some teach us in these dangerous days, how to walk upright in our ways. Some whose reforming hands engage, to lash the lewdness of the age. Some for the public service go, perpetual envoys to and fro. Whose able heads support the weight of twenty ministers of state. We scorn for want of talk to jabber, of parties or our bonny clabber. Nor are we studious to inquire who votes for manners, who for hire. Our care is to improve the mind with what concerns all humankind. The various scenes of mortal life, who beats her husband, who his wife. Or how the bully at a stroke knocked down the boy the lantern broke. One tells the rise of cheese and oatmeal, another when he got a hot meal. One gives advice in proverbs old, instructs us how to tame a scold. One shows how bravely Aduin died, and at the gallows all denied. How by the almanac tis clear that herrings will be cheap this year. Timothy Dear Mullinix, I now lament my precious time so long misspent. By nature meant for nobler ends, oh, introduce me to your friends, for whom by birth I was designed, till politics debased my mind. I give myself entire to you, God damn the Whigs and Tories too. End of section 86section 87 of the poems of jonathan swift volume 2 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org tim and the fables my meaning will be best unravelled when i premise that tim has travelled in lucas's by chance there lay the fables writ by mr gay Tim set the volume on a table, read over here and there a fable, and found, as he the pages twirled, the monkey who had seen the world. For Tonson had, to help the sale, prefixed a cut to every tale. The monkey was completely dressed, the bow in all his airs expressed. Tim, with surprise and pleasure staring, ran to the glass and then comparing his own sweet figure with the print, distinguished every feature int. The twist, the squeeze, the rump, the fidge in all, just as they looked in the original. By, says Tim, and let a fart, this graver understood his art. Tis a true copy, I'll say that for it, I well remember when I sat for it. My very face, at first I knew it, just in this dress the painter drew it. Tim, with his likeness deeply smitten, would read what underneath was written, the merry tale with moral grave, he now began to storm and rave. The cursed villain, now I see, this was a libel meant at me. These scribblers grow so bold of late against us ministers of state. Such Jacobites as he deserve, damn me, I say they ought to starve. End of section 87 Section 88 of The Poems of Jonathan Swift, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Tom and Dick Tim and Dick had equal fame and both had equal knowledge. Tom could write and spell his name, but Dick had seen the college. Dick a coxcomb, Tom was mad, and both alike diverting. Tom was held the merrier lad, but Dick the best at farting. Dick would cock his nose in scorn, but Tom was kind and loving. Tom a footboy, bred and born, but Dick was from an oven. Dick could neatly dance a jig, but Tom was best at bores. Tom would pray for every wig, and Dick curse all the Tories. 
Dick would make a woeful noise and scold at an election. Tom huzzaed the blackguard boys and held them in subjection. Tom could move with lordly grace, Dick nimbly skipped the gutter. Tom could talk with solemn face, but Dick could better sputter. Dick was come to high renown since he commenced physician. Tom was held by all the town the deeper politician. Tom had the genteeler swing his hat could nicely put on. Dick knew better how to swing his cane upon a button. Dick for repartee was fit, and Tom for deep discerning. Dick was thought the brighter wit, but Tom had better learning. Dick with zealous nose and eyes could roar as loud as stentor. In the house tis all he says, but Tom is eloquenter. End of section 88section 89 of the poems of jonathan swift volume 2 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org dick a maggot as when from rooting in a bin all powdered o'er from tail to chin a lively maggot sallies out you know him by his hazel snout so when the grandson of his grandsire forth issues wriggling dick drawn cansire with powdered rump and back and side you cannot blanch his tawny hide for tis beyond the power of meal the gypsy visage to conceal for as he shakes his wainscot chops down every mealy atom drops and leaves the tartar fizz in show like a fresh turd just dropped on snow end of section eighty nine Section 90 of The Poems of Jonathan Swift, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Clad All in Brown To Dick Foulest brute that stinks below, why in this brown dost thou appear? For wouldst thou make a fouler show, thou must go naked all the year. Fresh from the mud a wallowing sow would then be not so brown as thou. Tis not the coat that looks so done, his hide emits a foulness out. Not one jot better looks the sun, seen from behind a dirty clout. So turds within a glass enclose, the glass will seem as brown as those. Though now one heap of foulness art, all outward and within is foul, condensed filth in every part, thy body's clothed like thy soul. Thy soul, which through thy hide of buff, scarce glimmers like a dying snuff. Old carted bods such garments wear, when pelted all with dirt they shine, such their exalted bodies are, as shrivelled and as black as thine. If thou wert in a cart, I fear, thou wouldst be pelted worse than there. Yet when we see thee thus arrayed, the neighbours think it is but just, that thou shouldst take an honest trade, and weakly carry out the dust. Of cleanly houses, who will doubt, when Dick cries, Dust to carry out! End of section 90 Section 91 of The Poems of Jonathan Swift, Volume 2 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Dick's Variety Dull uniformity in fools, I hate who gape and sneer by rules. You mullinix and slobbering carhar, who every day and hour the same are, that vulgar talent I despise of pissing in the rabble's eyes. And when I listen to the noise of idiots roaring to the boys, to better judgment still submitting, I own I see but little wit in. Such pastimes, when our taste is nice, can please at most but once or twice. But then consider Dick, you'll find, his genius of superior kind. He never muddles in the dirt, nor scours the streets without a shirt, though Dick, I dare presume to say, could do such feats as well as they. Dick, I could venture everywhere, let thee boys pelt him if they dare, He'd have them tried at the assizes for priests and Jesuits in disguises. 
Swear they were with the Swedes at Bender, Enlisting troops for the pretender. But Dick can fart and dance and frisk, No other monkey half so brisk. Now has the speaker by the ears, Next moment in the house of peers. Now scolding at my lady Eustace, Or thrashing baby in her new stays. Presto be gone with t'other hop, He's powdering in a barber's shop. Now at the antechamber thrusting His nose to get the circle just in, And damns his blood that in the rare He sees a single Tory there. Then woe be to my lord lieutenant, Again he'll tell him, and again unt. End of section 91. Section 92 of The Poems of Jonathan Swift, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Trollis, Part 1. A Dialogue Between Tom and Robin, 1730. Tom. Say, Robin, what can Trollis mean by bellowing thus against the dean? Why does he call him paltry scribbler, papist and jacobite and libeller, yet cannot prove a single fact? Robin, forgive him, Tom, his head is cracked. Tom, what mischief can the dean have done him that Trollis calls for vengeance on him? Why must he sputter, spall, and slaver it in vain against the people's favourite? Revile that nation's saving paper which gave the dean the name of Drapier. Robin, why, Tom, I think the case is plain, Party and spleen have turned his brain. Tom, such friendship never man professed, The dean was never so caressed, For Trollis long his rancor nursed, Till God knows why at last it burst. That clumsy outside of a porter, How could it thus conceal a courtier? Robin, I own appearances are bad, Yet still insist the man is mad. Tom, Yet many a wretch in bedlam knows how to distinguish friends from foes, and though perhaps among the rout he wildly flings his filth about, he still has gratitude in sapence to spare the folks that gave him happence, nor in their eyes at random pisses, but turns aside like mad Ulysses, while Trollis all his ordure scatters to foul the man he chiefly flatters. Whence come these inconsistent fits, Robin? Why, Tom, the man has lost his wits. Tom, agreed, and yet when Towser snaps at people's heels with frothy chaps, hangs down his head and drops his tail to say he's mad, will not avail. The neighbours all cry, shoot him dead, hang, drown, or knock him on the head. So Trollis, when he first harangued, I wonder why he was not hanged. For of the two, without dispute, Towser's the less offensive brute. Robin. Tom, you mistake the matter quite, your barking curs will seldom bite, and though you hear him stut tut tutter, he barks as fast as he can utter. He prates in spite of all impediment, while none believes that what he said he meant, puts in his finger and his thumb to grope for words, and out they come. He calls you rogue, there's nothing in it, he fawns upon you in a minute. Begs leave to rail, but damn his blood, he only meant it for your good. His friendship was exactly timed, he shot before your foes were primed. By this contrivance, Mr. Dean, by God I'll bring you off as clean. Then let him use you or so rough, t'was all for love, and that's enough. But though he sputter through a session, it never makes the least impression. What ere he speaks for madness goes, with no effect on friends or foes. Tom, the scrubbiest cur in all the pack can set the mastiff on your back. I own his madness is a jest, if that were all, but he's possessed, incarnate with a thousand imps, to work whose ends his madness pimps, who o'er each string and wire preside, fill every pipe each motion guide, directing every vice we find in scripture to the devil assigned, sent from the dark infernal region, in him they lodge and make him legion. Of brethren he's a false accuser, a slanderer, traitor, and seducer, a fawning, base, trepanning liar, the marks peculiar of his sire. Or grant him but a drone at best, a drone can raise a hornet's nest. The dean had felt their stings before, and must their malice near give o'er? Still swarm and buzz about his nose, but Ireland's friends near wanted foes. A patriot is a dangerous post, when wanted by his country most. Perversely comes in evil times, where virtues are imputed crimes. 
His guilt is clear, the proofs are pregnant, A traitor to the vices regnant. What spirit, since the world began, Could always bear to strive with man? Which God pronounced he never would, And soon convinced them by a flood. Yet still the Dean on freedom raves, His spirit always strives with slaves. Tis time at last to spare his ink, And let them rot, or hang, or sink. End of section 92of the poems of jonathan swift volume two this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. trollus part two trollus of amphibious breed motley fruit of mongrel seed by the dam from lordlings sprung by the sire exhaled from dung think on every vice in both look on him and see their growth View him on the mother's side, filled with falsehood, spleen, and pride, positive and overbearing, changing still and still adhering, spiteful, peevish, rude, untoward, fierce in tongue, in heart a coward, when his friends he most is hard on, cringing comes to beg their pardon. Reputation ever tearing, ever dearest friendship swearing, judgment weak and passion strong, always various, always wrong. Provocation never waits, where he loves or where he hates talks what ear comes in his head, wishes it were all unsaid. Let me now the vices trace from the father's scoundrel race. Who could give the luby such airs? Were they masons? Were they butchers? Harold, lend the muse an answer from his atavas and grandsire. This was dexterous at his trowel, that was bred to kill a cow well. Hence the greasy, clumsy mean in his dress and figure seen. Hence the mean and sordid soul, like his body rank and foul. Hence that wild suspicious peep, like a rogue that steals a sheep. Hence he learnt the butcher's guile, how to cut your throat and smile. Like a butcher doomed for life, in his mouth to wear a knife. Hence he draws his daily food from his tenant's vital blood. Lastly, let his gifts be tried, borrowed from the mason's side. Some perhaps may think him able, in the state to build a babel, could we place him in a station to destroy the old foundation. True indeed, I should be gladder, could he learn to mount a ladder. May he at his latter end, mount alive and dead descend. In him tell me which prevail, female vices most or male. What produced him, can you tell, human race or imps of hell? End of section 93. Section 94 of The Poems of Jonathan Swift, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Fable of the Lion and Other Beasts One time a mighty plague did pester all beasts domestic and sylvester. The doctors all in concert joined to see if they the cause could find and tried a world of remedies, but none could conquer the disease. The lion, in his consternation, sends out his royal proclamation, to all his loving subjects greeting, appointing them a solemn meeting. And when they are gathered round his den, he spoke, My lords and gentlemen, I hope you are met full of the sense of this devouring pestilence, for sure such heavy punishment on common crimes is rarely sent. It must be some important cause, some great infraction of the laws. Then let us search our consciences, and every one his faults confess. Let's judge from biggest to the least, that he that is the foulest beast may for a sacrifice be given to stop the wrath of angry heaven. And since no one is free from sin, I with myself will first begin. I have done many a thing that's ill, from a propensity to kill, slain many an ox, and what is worse, have murdered many a gallant horse, robbed woods and fens, and like a glutton, devoured whole flocks of lamb and mutton. Nay, sometimes, for I dare not lie, the shepherd went for company. He had gone on, but Chancellor Fox stands up. What signifies an ox? What signifies a horse? Such things are honoured when made sport for kings. 
Then for the sheep, those foolish cattle, Not fit for courage or for battle; And being tolerable meat, They're good for nothing but to eat. The shepherd too, young enemy, Deserves no better destiny. Sir, sir, your conscience is too nice; Hunting's a princely exercise; And those, being all your subjects born, Just when you please, are to be torn. And, sir, if this will not content ye, We'll vote it _nemine contra dicenti_. Thus after him they all confess, They had been rogues, some more, some less; And yet by little slight excuses, They all get clear of great abuses. The bear, the tiger, beasts of flight, And all that could but scratch and bite; Nay, e'en the cat of wicked nature, That kills in sport her fellow creature, When Scot free but his gravity, An ass of stupid memory, Confess'd as he went to a fair, His back half broke with wooden ware, Chancing unluckily to pass By a church yard full of good grass, Finding they'd open left the gate, He ventured in, stooped down, and ate. Hold, says Judge Wolf, such are the crimes That brought upon us these sad times. T'was sacrilege, and this vile ass shall die For eating holy grass. End of section 94section 95 of the poems of jonathan swift volume 2 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org on the irish bishops 1731 old latimer preaching did fairly describe a bishop who ruled all the rest of his tribe and who is this bishop and where does he dwell why, truly, tis Satan, Archbishop of Hell. And he was a primate, and he wore a mitre, Surrounded with jewels of sulphur and nitre. How nearly this bishop our bishops resembles, But he has the odds who believes and who trembles. Could you see his grim face for a pound to a penny, You'd swear it must be the baboon of Kilkenny. Poor Satan will think the comparison odious, I wish I could find him out one more commodious. But this I am sure, the most reverend old dragon, Has got on the bench many bishops of Fragon, And all men believe he resides there in cog, To give them by turns an invisible jog. Our bishops puffed up with wealth and with pride, To hell on the backs of the clergy would ride. They mounted and laboured with whip and with spur, In vain for the devil a parson would stir. So the commons unhorsed them, and this was their doom, On their croziers to ride like a witch on a broom. Though they galloped so fast on the road you may find em, And have left us but three out of twenty behind em. Lord Bolton's good grace, Lord Carr and Lord Howard, In spite of the devil, would still be untoward. They came of good kindred, and could not endure, Their former companions should beg at their door. When Christ was betrayed to Pilate the praetor, Of a dozen apostles but one proved a traitor. One traitor alone, and faithful eleven, But we can afford you six traitors in seven. What a clutter with clippings, dividings, and cleavings, And the clergy forsooth must take up with their leavings. If making divisions was all their intent, They've done it, we thank them, but not as they meant. And so may such bishops for ever divide, That no honest heathen would be on their side. How should we rejoice if, like Judas the first, Those splitters of parsons in sunder should burst? Now here an illusion, a mitre, you know, Is divided above, but united below. If this you consider, our emblem is right. The bishops divide, but the clergy unite. Should the bottom be split, our bishops would dread That the mitre would never stick fast on their head. And yet they have learnt the chief art of a sovereign, As Machiavel taught them, divide and ye govern. But courage, my lords, though it cannot be said That one cloven tongue ever sat on your head. I'll hold you a groat, and I wish I could seat. If your stockings were off, you could show cloven feet. But hold, cry the bishops, and give us fair play, Before you condemn us, hear what we can say. What truer affections could ever be shown Than saving your souls by damning our own? And have we not practised all methods to gain you, With the tithe of the tithe of the tithe to maintain you? Provided a fund for building you spittles, You are only to live four years without victuals. Content, my good lords, but let us change hands. First take you our tithes, and give us your lands. 
So God bless the church and three of our mitres, and God bless the commons for biting the biters. End of section 95. Section 96 of The Poems of Jonathan Swift, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Horace, Book 4, Ode 9. Addressed to Humphrey French, Esquire, late Lord Mayor of Dublin. Patron of the tuneful throng, oh, too nice and too severe, Think not that my country song shall displease thy honest ear. Chosen strains I proudly bring, which the muses' sacred choir, when they gods and heroes sing, dictate to th' harmonious lyre. Ancient Homer, princely bard, just precedence still maintains, with sacred rapture still are heard Theban Pindar's lofty strains. Still the old triumphant song which when hated tyrants fell, great Alcaeus boldly sung, warns, instructs, and pleases well. Nor has time's all-darkening shade in obscure oblivion praised what Anacreon laughed and played, gay Anacreon, drunken priest. Gentle Sappho, lovesick muse, warms the heart with amorous fire. Still her tenderest notes infuse, melting rapture, soft desire. Beauteous Helen, young and gay, by a painted fopling one, went not first fair nymph astray, fondly pleased to be undone. Nor young Teucer's slaughtering bow, nor bold Hector's dreadful sword, alone the terrors of the foe sowed the field with hostile blood. Many valiant chiefs of old greatly lived and died before, Agamemnon, Grecian bold, waged the ten years' famous war. But their names unsung, unwept, unrecorded, lost and gone, Long and endless night have slept, and shall now no more be known. Virtue, which the poet's care has not well consigned to fame, Lies as in the sepulchre, some old king without a name. But, O oh, Humphrey, great and free, while my tuneful songs are read, Old forgetful time on thee, dark oblivion near shall spread. When the deep-cut notes shall fade on the mouldering parian stone, on the brass no more be read the perishing inscription. Forgotten all the enemies, envious Gian's cursed spite, and Paul's derogating lies, lost and sunk in Stygian night. Still thy labour and thy care, what for Dublin thou hast done, in full lustre shall appear, and outshine the unclouded sun. Large thy mind, and not untried, for Hibernia now doth stand, through the calm or raging tide, safe conducts the ship to land. Falsely we call the rich man great, he is only so that knows, his plentiful or small estate, wisely to enjoy and use. He in wealth or poverty, fortune's power alike defies, and falsehood and dishonesty more than death abhors and flies. Flies from death, no meets it brave, when the suffering so severe may from dreadful bondage save clients, friends, or country dear. This the sovereign man complete, hero, patriot, glorious, free, rich and wise and good and great, generous Humphrey, thou art he. End of section 96. Section 97 of The Poems of Jonathan Swift, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. On Mr. Pulteney's being put out of the council, 1731. Sir Robert, wearied by Will Pulteney's teasings, who interrupted him in all his leasings, resolved that Will and he should meet no more. Full in his face, Bob shuts the council door. 
nor lets him sit as justice on the bench to punish thieves or lash a suburb wench yet still st stephen's chapel open lies for will to enter what shall i advise even quit the house for thou too long hast sat in't produce at last thy dormant ducal patent there near thy master's throne in shelter placed let will unheard by thee his thunder waste yet still i fear your work is done but half for while he keeps his pen you are not safe hear an old fable and a dull one too it bears a moral when applied to you a hare had long escaped pursuing hounds by often shifting into distant grounds till finding all his artifices vain to save his life he leaped into the main but there alas he could no safety find a pack of dogfish had him in the wind he scours away and to avoid the foe descends for shelter to the shades below there cerberus lay watching in his den he had not seen a hare the lord knows when out bounced the mastiff of the triple head away the hare with double swiftness fled hunted from earth and sea and hell he flies fear lent him wings for safety to the skies how was the fearful animal distressed behold a foe more fierce than all the rest sirius the swiftest of the heavenly pack failed but an inch to seize him by the back he fled to earth but first it cost him dear he left his scut behind and half an ear thus was the hare pursued though free from guilt thus bob shall thou be mauled fly where thou wilt then honest robin of thy corpse beware thou art not half so nimble as a hare too ponderous is thy bulk to mount the sky nor can you go to hell before you die so keen thy hunters and thy scent so strong thy turns and doublings cannot save thee long end of section 97section 98 of the poems of jonathan swift volume 2 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org on the words brother protestants and fellow christians so familiarly used by the advocates for the repeal of the test act in ireland 1733 an inundation says the fable overflowed a farmer's barn and stable whole ricks of hay and stacks of corn were down the sudden current borne while things of heterogeneous kind together float with tide and wind the generous wheat forgot its pride and sailed with litter side by side uniting all to show their amity as in a general calamity a ball of new-dropped horses' dung, mingling with apples in the throng, said to the pippin plump and prim, See, brother, how we apples swim. Thus Lamb, renowned for cutting corns, and offered fee from Radcliffe scorns. Not for the world we doctors, brother, must take no fees of one another. Thus to a dean some curate sloven describes, Dear sir, your brother loving. Thus all the footmen, shoeboys, porters, about St. James's cry, We courtiers thus horace in the house will prate sir we the ministers of state thus at the bar the booby bettsworth though half a crown or pays his sweatsworth who knows in law nor text nor margent calls singleton his brother sergeant and thus fanatic saints though nether in doctrine nor discipline our brethren are brother protestants and christians as much as hebrews and philistines but in no other sense than nature has made a rat our fellow creature lice from your body suck their food but is a louse your flesh and blood though born of human filth and sweat it as well may say man did beget it and maggots in your nose and chin as well may claim you for their kin yet critics may object why not since lice are brethren to a scot which made our swarm of sex determine employments for their brother vermin but be they English, Irish, Scottish, what Protestant can be so sottish, while o'er the church these clouds are gathering to call a swarm of lice his brethren? As Moses, by divine advice, in Egypt turned the dust to lice, 
and as our sects by all descriptions have hearts more hardened than egyptians as from the trodden dust they spring and turned to lice infest the king for pity's sake it would be just a rod should turn them back to dust let folks in high or holy stations be proud of owning such relations let courtiers hug them in their bosom as if they were afraid to lose em while i with humble job had rather say to corruption thou'rt my father for he that has so little wit to nourish vermin may be bit end of section ninety eight section ninety nine of the poems of jonathan swift volume two this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Betsworth's Exaltation, upon hearing that his name would be transmitted to posterity in Dr. Swift's works, by William Duncan. Well, now, since the heat of my passions abated, that the dean hath lampooned me, my mind is elated. Lampooned, did I call it? No, what was it then? What was it? T'was fain to be lashed by his pen for had he not pointed me out i had slept till in doomsday a poor insignificant reptile half lawyer half actor perched dull and inglorious obscure and unheard of but now i'm notorious fame has but two gates a white and a black one the worst they can say is i got in at the back one if the end be obtained tis equal what portal i enter since i'm to be rendered immortal so clysters applied to the anus tis said by skilful physicians give ease to the head Though my title be spurious, why should I be dastard? A man is a man, though he should be a bastard. Why, sure, tis some comfort that heroes should slay us. If I fall, I would fall by the hand of Aeneas. And who by the drapier would not rather damned be than demigod eyes by madrigal Namby? A man is no more who has once lost his breath, but poets convince us there's life after death. They call from their graves the king or the peasant, react our old deeds, and make what's past present. And when they would study to set forth alike, so the lines be well drawn and the colours but strike, whatever the subject be coward or hero, a tyrant or patriot, a Titus or Nero, to a judge tis all one which he fixes his eye on, and a well-painted monkey's as good as a lion. An Epigram the scriptures affirm, as I heard in my youth, for indeed I ne'er read them to speak for one's truth, that death is the wages of sin, but the just shall die not although they be laid in the dust. They say so, so be it, I care not a straw, although I be dead both in gospel and law. In verse I shall live, and be read in each climate, what more can be said of prime sergeant or primate? while carter and prendergast both may be rotten and damned to the bargain and yet be forgotten an epigram inscribed to the honourable sergeant kite in your indignation what mercy appears while jonathan's threatened with loss of his ears for who would not think it a much better choice by your knife to be mangled than racked with your voice if truly you would be revenged on the parson command his attendance while you act your farce on instead of your maiming your shooting or banging bid povey secure him while you are haranguing had this been your method to torture him long since he had cut his own ears to be deaf to your nonsense end of section ninety nine